Greetings and welcome everyone to day two of DelphiCon 2023. Hopefully things go a little better today. Um, I want to just review so the schedule real quick. We are celebrating 28 years of Delphi and here are all the links. I guess I should hide my... No, that didn't work. That kind of works. <laughs> uh, we are uh, here's all the links for joining us. If you are if you're watching right now, you're obviously on one of those links. But um, and there is a list picture of all of our fantastic speakers and presenters that are joining us today and tomorrow and yesterday. So here's our schedule. We do have one change. Uh, Olaf wasn't able to join us for his session at one. PM CST, an unexpected event happened. Um, we will have something else in that slot though to be determined. So um, yeah. <clears throat> and then there's our schedule for tomorrow. So today's sessions, we have we're starting off with Ray's session here in five minutes on spice up your apps with animations. After that, creating LibreOffice documents in Delphi, which the great thing about LibreOffice is that also you can use it to create formats like Doc, DocX, which Doc is really old. I know it feels like, at least for me, it feels like DocX is that new format, but it's really old. <laughs> I found out like a lot of things wouldn't even accept that anymore, but creating the formats that you would use in other tools as well as LibreOffice. Then Ian Barker's with how we use Delphi in a real fight and one as a weapon in a real fight one. This one should be great. A lot of great stuff in there. I was, uh, if you haven't seen that paper yet, uh, hopefully we'll include a link to it or we'll post it then. A lot of great information there. I was really, really pleased with that one. The evolution of fast report VCL, cool feature highlight. The uh, Olaf sessions have been postponed. We'll get that one later. Demystifying domain driven design with Gustavo, which we heard referred to yesterday. Should be a great one there. Um, I love that it's Delphi, demystifying domain driven design in Delphi. So it's all the Ds. <laughs> Integrating apps with Alexa devices with Kivian and QR code case study with Zyad. And that's it for today. We do a couple minutes here before our next session starts. So I'm going to bring the schedule back up again while we wait for that to go. Um, and we'll, Ray will be on with you in three minutes here. Wrong button.
Creating a simple web server with web broker. For fun or real projects, it's used. Hi, welcome to another session of DelphiCon 2023. My name is Ray Kanopka, and in this session, we're going to be talking about how to spice up your applications with animations. So let's get started. Now, specifically, I'm talking about FMX applications. Um, unfortunately, you can do a little bit of animation, certain techniques, uh, but the standard VCL classes really don't lend themselves to the advanced animation techniques that the FireMonkey framework gives us. So that's what we're going to be focused on uh, in this session is the FMX classes. And so we're going to start off going through some of the basics, the, the core features and properties of animations that we need to understand in order to incorporate them properly into our applications. So we'll look at the classes, the properties, things like triggers, animation types, even interpolation. Have lots of examples that illustrate all of these different features so we can understand which animation feature do we want to use when we're building them, incorporating them into our apps. We're going to talk about topics like synchronized animations. When I have multiple things going on that I want to animate, how do I ensure that that's a smooth transition from one to the other? Uh, things like animating over a nonlinear path uh, is valuable to, if that's something that you need. And I have had needs for each of these different examples. Uh, so that's where they're coming from. Uh, a concept called animation time codes uh, is very valuable when you have multiple things that you need to keep in sync and you don't want one to kind of get in front of the other. Um, and so that's important to have some way to, uh, to have a time code uh, to synchronize um, multiple objects that are being animated to make it a smooth transition. And then we'll have an example at the end about tab transitions, which is very common in our mobile devices, uh, being able to switch from one view to another. Tab control works well. How do we get animations for that? It's actually quite simple. So let's dig into some of the animation core concepts. The key piece to remember with animation is that you are changing a property value over time. That, that's it when you think about it. Uh, and if we fully understand that, then what we're going to cover next and, and the, all the examples will make a lot more sense because that's all we're doing is we're animating, we're changing some value of a property over time. That could be the position, uh, it could be a color, it could be the opacity, anything that can be changed, we can change it over time. And by doing so, that gives us animations. So what are some of the common things? I already hit on some of these, the position, the opacity, uh, rotation angle. Uh, actually, that's the first example I'm going to be showing. So anything that can be changed, can be changed, can be animated over time. Uh, one of the things to note, this is one of the reasons why uh, various properties in FMX are singles, are floating point values as opposed to straight integers, because a floating point value is allows you to have a smoother animation between one point and another, because in order to do the animation, you divide up the starting point to the ending point, the start value and value of the property change and divide it up into sections and how far you're going to do that through the animation duration. Um, floating point numbers give us a much smoother animation approach for that. So to do all of the work, fortunately FMX gives us uh, some classes that are built in that we can leverage. And um, most are basic uh, start value, end value animation types. And they're based on what you're animating. So if we're animating an integer or a floating point number, or even a color and so forth, that's I have some start value zero, I have an end value of 10, I wanna animate that over 0.7 seconds. Well, well, we'll get to how the animation is done in a little bit, but a straight linear animation would be divide that start to end value in even chunks across 0.7 seconds and there's my intermediate values. The integer is a kind of interesting one because what you know 
if that works out to a fractional you're still going to round it so you might have it go to one then the three then the four then the seven you know or six and it jumps around that way floating point numbers are much smoother because the division works better uh, gradients and rectangles you can think of like oh i want to change the the a start rectangle which is a bounds for a control for example so if i wanted to animate a button from one part of my screen and make it go to a bigger part or a, an image or a frame of some kind the rectangle animation will allow us to do that now there's also the ability to animate things over a series of values not necessarily a start end date uh, or a start and end value uh, these are typically driven by a key animation so you have float key color keys um, i have an example of this this is really if you think about i have a dictionary of key values of time po points in my animation and what do i want the value of this property because again i'm animating the values of a property so what do i want that property value to be at various points key points in the animation cycle so that's where these animation series values of these types are, are important uh, path animation is another again i have an example of that where i want to animate something over a path well that's going to determine where the position of something is when you're dealing with a path animation and then uh, there's also uh, a really nice one. It's a fun one. Uh, it's a bitmap list animation. It's very much like a manual way of doing an animated GIF. Uh, so if you have a series of images that you want to animate through, you can do that quite easily. So supporting the animation classes themselves, uh, inside of those basic types there's some shared common properties amongst all of them uh, you'll have a start value stop value of course the duration is one of the most common ones how long does that animation sequence last um, adding on to that you know whether the animation is enabled or not you might want to control that you don't want to necessarily remove it but you don't want it to occur under certain circumstances likewise we have the the loop does the animation just loop when it's done uh, does it go in reverse so when it's finished does it unwind itself um, you can also have it automatically just do the opposite of it from the get-go so there's lots of capabilities uh, start and stop methods are very important if we want to manually start the process um, likewise we can stop an animation in sequence if we so choose uh, i really don't have a, a not run into a need to do that uh, but it's available should you need to uh, some need events are in place when it comes to animation so there's an on-process event which does allow you to hook into that process so if you wanted to do something and respond to know like okay where in the process of the animation it is you could do that it's unlikely that you would do that because you don't really want to interrupt or do anything extra while the animation is going on that you don't need to um, typically if you are starting some other process and things you're going to have some other mechanism that you're going to monitor for the process of that where the animation itself is really just you want to let that run and finished and that's the key piece this event is very important uh, because this gets fired when the animation is finished and when that happens then we can do something in response to it maybe it's changing the underlying state of our ui maybe it's fire up a secondary animation so i want to chain one animation animation to another you could work with it with delays like start animation one and then after delay start animation two but if you really want them to be in sequence you want to wait until animation one is finished before you kick off animation two and the unfinished event gives us that ability so let's take a look at a number of examples 
So I have Delphi 11.2 uh, running up here, and uh, this project with all of the sample projects, uh, the groups all included in the source code uh, link that will be shown at the end. Um, but this first one, we're gonna start out really simple. Uh, I have a couple radiant shapes. Radiant shapes you can download from uh, Get It within uh, Rad Studio. Uh, they're FMX shape controls. I've just got a couple on the screen here to uh, give us a little bit fancier visualization of what we're doing. and what these two buttons can do or what the, this demo is doing as you probably gathered from the buttons there is that they're going to rotate these two arrows and how do we rotate them what do we want to do well fortunately fmx gives us a rotation angle and so whenever we go and we find a property like rotation angle if any property has a little film strip next to it that means that it is something that can be animated over um, that's what the, the film strip is indicating. Now, because mine is enabled on the rotation angle, that means I've already done this. I've already established a rota uh, an animation class to this pri property. And I can see that by looking at the structure pane. So on my radiant arrow, which is the first one, the chevron arrow is the second one. And you can see that I have a float animation here. Now, let me go ahead and click that. And what that does is these are the properties that I was showing in the previous slide. So I have a start value and an end value. And in this rotation, I'm going to animate the rotational angle of zero, which is straight vertical in this point, and rotate it all the way to 360, which means I'm expecting it to do a, a, a full loop revolution for the animation. How long is it gonna take? It's gonna take two seconds. So this, the duration is in seconds and you can have floating point values here. So you can have 1.2, 1.8, whatever you'd like. Um, I'm not having a delay, so I wanna get it started and just once I hit start animation, I want it to start animating the value of the rotation angle property from zero to 360 over two seconds. And, and that's pretty much all I have. So um, let me go ahead and run this. Okay, so I have my two buttons. I'm just going to cover the first one. So when I go ahead and click OK, we can see that it is indeed rotating from 0 to 360 in order to get around. Um, you will probably realize that 0 to 360, I couldn't do 0 to 0 because there'd be no change in it. So because I wanted to go in that direction, that's how I make that um, go completely around is even though they're the same equivalent value, they need to be different. So it's ever increasing between each one. The secondary uh, example here is on this Chevron and it's using a float key animation. It's still doing it on the rotation angle, but what does this do? Well, this is driven by a set of keys, basically, portions through the process of when we want certain changes of the value to take place. And so I'm going to, uh, it's a collection. So if we bring up the collection and well, before I do that, let's look at the duration is still two seconds. And um, there, there no, note that there's no starting or end value in there. It's driven by these keys. And so typically you're gonna have at least two. You're gonna have a starting key and an ending key and possibly whatever else is in the middle of it. So we're gonna start with the key of zero, which is in the process that we're going. So at the start of zero, if you will, um, we're having the zero angle. Value is gonna represent whatever property value we're animating over. Then if we go to the second point, this is saying 0.4 into the process. So not 0.4 seconds, but 0.4 of the duration that I have. Now my duration is two seconds, so this is going to be 0.8. I want the value to be 180 degrees. So in that first 40% of the duration, I want the angle to get all the way down to be half of my uh, rotation. Then I'm going to uh, the next key is I'm saying, well, at 0.6 through the process, so 20% further along, I want the value to go back to 120 degrees. So the direction doesn't always need to be going in the same place. 
I'm having the time key, so 60% through the process. I want the value to back up a little bit. And then the final key is at the end when I'm 100%, if you will, one through the whole process, I want to be at that 360. So what does that look like? Let me run that one real quick. And when I go ahead and click this, we'll see that it rotates down, rotates back, and then rotates up a little quicker. And the speed of each of those may vary because it's keeping it within the two, two seconds duration, but doing a little bit more work for those keys. So depending on what you need to animate, how you wanted to do it, you have a lot of flexibility. Uh, one thing before we go to uh, the, the next example is um, how do we add an animation? I've already had those added in. Um, one thing that we can do with that uh, quite easily is you find a property that you can animate, for example, the opacity. And if I drop this down, you'll see that I can create a new float animation or a new float key animation. If I just select create new float animation, it will add a new one. And that's really kind of cool because you don't have to have just one animation for a given object. So I'm having another one that's animating the opacity property. Float animation one is the, the rotation angle. This one is doing the opacity. I'm going to start from one and I want it by the time I'm done to be point uh, two. Um, so 20% visibility is what I'm looking to do over. Well, that's kind of quick. Let's make this 2.5 seconds. And then over in my rotation button, instead of starting float animation one, let me start up float animation two. And so now if I run this, what we're going to see is I'm not going to rotate anymore because I'm not performing that one. But we can slowly see that over two and a half seconds, the opacity of my property, again, I'm changing properties over time. That's all animations they're doing. And that's what I get from here. OK. So next up, I want to spend a little time talking about triggers, uh, another helpful feature of animations, the animation classes that allow us to do some things uh, to fire off an animation based on some external event. Um, we did it on a button click and in those previous examples. So something was done, we performed an action and we started up the animation. But certain things we would want to have animate automatically for us. Um, some of the most common ones are when you move the mouse over something, uh, we want to be able to respond to a trigger for that. Or if we've clicked on something, uh, if it's been pressed. So these triggers all have an is prefix to it, like is mouse over, is drag over, etc. Um, and based on those, we can put an expression inside of a condition in these properties to determine whether the trigger fires up the animation or not. So let's take a look at a trigger definition. So let me switch back over to here. That's my second example. I'm going to make sure I activate that right now. So I have another shape. Uh, it's a radiant shield. And you can see that I've added a color animation. So different type. Um, that is off on the fill color. Uh, so the fill color property has an animation. And if we look at it, it's animating from red to medium blue. Um, and so over the course of a half second, it's going to change the color, which means it's going to show some purplish blends of the two and then eventually land on the medium blue color. Kind of fun. Well, when do I do it? I don't have any other buttons around here that triggers it uh, to start. Um, there's nothing in the code that does it to start. Um, it's all driven by the animation class with these triggers. So I have a trigger and a trigger inverse. The trigger basically says, OK, do the animation as designed from start to stop. The trigger inverse says, OK, if this condition is met, do the animation from the stop value to the start value backwards. And so all we're doing is we're saying, OK, we're going to start this if the mouse over condition for this control is true. And likewise, we switch it when it's not. So pretty straightforward. Let me go ahead and run it, and you can see the effect. So as I move the mouse over, the triggers are, are invoked, and it reverses the animations 
uh, as needed. So very clever. You can do the same things you can animate. So you can do, you can make something uh, grow a little bit. Very common in some, you know, uh, mirror type desk interfaces where you highlight something, it gets a little bit larger. So you could do a rectangle animation that's done through a trigger uh, to do the same thing. You could add glow effects on a hover. So it looks like it glows behind it. All those things are, are, are available. Next up, we have to start talking about interpolation. This is how does the animation values change? Um, it's simple to think of it done linearly. We take a time duration and we take the two start and stop values. And then if we know how long it is and we periodically chunk that up into sections, what are those intermediate values? Well, it's just math. It's a math equation that we can figure that out. Well, if you start applying other math equations, that's what interpolation gives us. So the default, again, I've said this a couple times now, it's, it's a linear, linear interpolation. We take a constant rate, so we divide it evenly, you know, n number of times every, you know, for whatever duration or uh, frequency we want the change to occur, that is what causes our property value changes. But there's other values um, and you can sense once you realize it's all math, that's where you see there's a quadratic. It's, the, you know, there's a quadratic, a cubic, a quartic. You know, but these are various powers of exponents, sinusoidal, exponential, even circular. Um, and then there's some fun ones that come along. You have a bounce, even an elastic uh, and so forth. But it's very hard to visualize what these are without some sort of visual representation. And... Um, but you can look at the help, which is great, but I have a better way. Um, we're going to look at an example that illustrates all of these at the same time so that we can really see and understand why they're different. Uh, the animation type is kind of interesting, uh, mostly because I think it is the wrong default. <laughs> um, it's defaults to in because it's an enum and it's the first value in happens to be the default value of it. But in my experience, you will most often change this to out or possibly in and out. And what this does is it basically describes when the, 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 the math is applied to the distribution of the values. Um, and so was, is it done up front or is it done at the end, in, out, or is it done on both? And so uh, to illustrate that, let's take a look at our next example. So we're going to go to our interpolation form, switch my project. And what I have here is a, a number of radiant rings um, to demonstrate the various pieces. And they're all tied. They all have uh, on their um, uh, positions. Their position wise is what we're animating. So they're, they're going to drop down in this view, um, but they're going to do so differently. Uh, each one has a different animation type that's assigned, which is labeled inside of the, the middle of each one. Um, we control whether we can loop it, if we auto reverse it, how, which way it applies uh, the distribution, and then of course, how fast we go. Um, so nothing real interesting. There's nothing in the code to show. It's just the effect of what these animation types do. So let's go ahead and run this. So to start, uh, we're going to keep it in as the default. And then if I animate this, we can see how each one changed. Now, they all started at the same time and they all ended at the same time, um, which is important because it's the that's a fixed amount based on what you set the duration property to. I mean, you can change it, but it's again, it's all set. I have them all set to be the same. The linear one goes straight up and down. It doesn't change. It doesn't look like it accelerates. The, the cubic, circular, and quadratic all seem to do the same kind of thing, uh, but they, they accelerate a little bit differently in the middle. And that is driven by, if you would think of on a graph paper, uh, in the Y changes for a circle that's around. So you'll see it kind of go up a little bit, then it goes up faster, slows down, then it goes down and accelerates. A quadratic curve is obviously has a much more steeper angle or curvature, so you'll see more of an impact. Uh, the back bounce and other ones tend to be uh, more interesting. So if I animate this again, um, and we can see that this activity, this bouncing is happening at the, at the front, and then it goes at the end. I'm going to turn that off and change it to out, 
and this is more like what you would think a bounce would be for example so everything starts out and then ends down at the bottom the elastic even goes beyond the bounce and then gets pulled back um, into place uh, what's really kind of fun is we can we can hit the auto loop and uh, we can start these up and then it'll uh, get down to the bottom and then it reverses it so it does it back and forth and here's where you can really see the difference between the two um, and, and how linear is just going straight up and down and these all bounce and affect differently. If you really wanted to have some fun, make it the in out and then you get activity on both sides of the animation. So how it starts up and then how it finishes. All right, so depending on what your needs, you just pick the right interpolation value. So next up, I want to talk about synchronizing animations. And so um, I've mentioned this before, but just to re-illustrate, you know, I have multiple, uh, in order to animate multiple properties on an object, each property needs its own animation object. Um, which you can certainly do. Like in the previous that example I had where I was changing the rotation angle and the opacity, I could start them both up. But if I'm doing that, I do need to make sure that I'm starting them both up at the same time, that their durations are both set to the same time. Um, you, you also have this issue to where if I've got more than two or if there's multiple things I need to do, you, you don't want them to be out of sync where you know the opacity kind of gets a little bit darker and then it kind of fades up because of the processing we, we want it, that to be evened out as much as possible so one of the things that uh we certainly as i said here we don't want to have that get out of sync but a technique that i've used many times to to handle these situations is to actually create a new property that is is used to actually control the the accumulation of the other animations so remember animating a is is simply a property change over time now what that properties change does is up to you and so that's the technique that that really kind of makes things uh as we get more complicated uh pretty cool so i'm gonna have an example it's called digit drop and let's take a look at that so digit drop uh, is, I mean, I'm going to run it and then we'll see what it does because then it'll become more uh, important in, in how this happens. So um, it's a display. Basically, I'm showing some number of, of wait time minutes for a certain place and I will uh, go ahead and drop a number down and we can see that these digits drop down from the top out of view and fall into place and you can tell that I'm using those interpolation techniques to make this happen. I'm using the bounce. Now what's interesting is when I change the value notice how the six and zero fall off the screen while the new value uh, the, the 15 comes into view and while that's happening you actually get to see both all four of the digits will be on the screen at one point so in order for that animation to fall and there's separate sections because the ones the, t the tens and the ones and even the hundreds they don't fall at the same rate um, so because you want it to kind of have this they don't all just come in at the same time that wouldn't be any fun uh, so in order to coordinate all of this, we, we can't rely on just saying, oh, animation one for the top cell, animation two for the bottom, start them both off and expect them to be completely in sync. What happens is, is you get little gaps. Uh, they get a little bit closer. They get a little bit farther away as the animation goes on because of rounding and positioning and timing. I didn't want any of that. I want this to be rock solid, drop them down. This is what we get. So let's take a look at the code of what this, uh, how did we, we do this? So to represent each of those digits, there's some, uh, some text fields that are in place. And if you open up the, the, the clip window, cause I'm clipping everything that's above it and below it. So that's what that's serving. But we have the, the set of next values. So the ones, hundreds digits, the tens and the ones for the next values, these are the ones that are positioned kind of up. Um, they're gonna get repositioned 
in code so I'm just having there so I can click on them and then the 100s 10s and 1s are inside of here and each one of them simply has uh, a rectangle if we need it um, uh, but that's uh, really just as a guide for testing and things but for now it's just a text control that we're using nothing fancy there's no properties on this that are being animated because again, I don't want to be animating the Y position of each of these controls separately. I need to animate them together. Well, the way I did that, so if we go into our form here, and it's not that complicated. There's all the controls up at the top. I've created a special enum to wrap around the interpolation values. Um, but inside of here, I've got, uh, I'm manually going to create some animations. So I've got my ones, tens, and hundreds animation so each of those columns are going to be an animation that I need to create well the question then is what do I animate well that's where if I remember that an animation is a property that's changed over time it doesn't matter where that property is it doesn't have to be on an actual control that's on the form I'm creating three new properties on the form that I'm going to animate over and in what we'll see is as we set the the positions setting the positions for the ones column is going to do something it's actually going to move the next digit and the current digit in the right place and that's what I'm animating so let's let's continue on looking at the rest um, when I create the form I'm setting some default properties my clip window size and I'm creating the animation objects here's where the work is and what this is doing is I'm creating my first animation, which is just a straight float animation. My starting value is zero, which is the position that I want the cell to be at. Um, and I want it to go to the digit height because that's essentially what I'm animating. I'm animating the, the height of the digit cell. And so that's what's going down. Now, how it does that is through the interpolation, which is set here. And I have them all set to out because I want the bounce to actually be a bounce at the end when it comes into play. Now, the key thing here is what am I animating? I am animating, well, I'm animating the property name, which is digits one position for the object that is referenced in the parent. Now we don't see the parent get set when we do the animation over in the structure pane and where we take a property and we animate and drop that. That is set. That's why it shows up as a child of the control that we're animating. When we create our own animations, we need to set the parent appropriately. So we are setting the digits one position of the form that we're in. So great. We still don't know what is being animated yet. We just know we're going to have that. And then I'm having an unfinished handler. So when that's done, then I can, can you know, do something. And we're going to see what that is in a little bit. The tens and the hundreds are exactly the same, just animating a different position. Um, with one variation is that the duration is a little bit longer for the other two. And that gives it a little bit of an offset um, so of how they finish. Going down, uh, setting the value, this is the, the actual value. So when I set the property up the title bar and I say, okay, 45 minutes or 120, it figures out what the values based on the digit are. And then it kicks off the start the digit drop, which is the starting of the animation process whenever the value changes. So I'm going to skip over that, the, the value change of this is if it's just a change. So um, this is doing when we change the drop style, all that's doing is changing the interpolation type. No big deal. Um, setting the clip window size. None of that's real fun. So start digit drop. What happens here? Well, I simply kick off all three of those animations. Now, it's fine that those are all separate because I actually want them to be separate. But I'm, when we look at what happens when we change digits one position, we're actually changing two controls on the form through a single property value change. And based on what the value comes in, that single value affects the height of both of those controls. And so this is how I can synchronize multiple properties across multiple objects 
through a single property change at the component a form level to ensure that everything is rock solid as I go through. Um, we're almost at the end here. So all three of those are the same except modifying the different positions. When the animation is finished, we simply reset uh, our various controls so that they're now at the, basically the, the next becomes the current and the, the old next value, the cell that represents that is positioned above out of view, hence negative digit height. So it's ready for the next time the value changes. And each one does that when each of those are finished because it's moving a different set of cells to take care of that. And so that's how you can use the on finish to reset for the next animation sequence, which I highly recommend doing at the end rather than at the start of the animation because if you have to reset it then that may get into the visual cue of how the change is made and we don't want that to happen so that was digit drop let's move on to uh the next fun one is path animations so path animations as it suggests is we can do um non-linear uh positional changes and so we can actually have something move over a path object. And a path is just a vector-based uh, you know, set of coordinates or points connected through a path, through a curvature, and we can really coolly animate over that. Um, and here is an example where the on process event uh, is very valuable. I know it's like not often used, but this was one where it really was important to use because I was needing to make an extra adjustment in this example. You'll see just a moment uh, of where while I'm in this animation, I need to alter the appearance of the object that's being animated. So what does all that mean? Well, let's let's take a look. Um, before we get to the code, though, one of the things that in order to make this work, um, as you'll see, um, I, w I needed to create an animation that had multiple objects all coming into view at different times, but it needed to be a loop. And I couldn't just create them all um, to be with necessarily the same duration because the paths have different lengths. And so if I want them to all be traveling at the same speed, they're going to end at different times. And so you have to kind of have some way to synchronize across multiple animations, not multiple properties, but multiple animations. That's the difference of where the time code concept comes into play. So we'll show uh, how I've implemented that. So let's switch over and talk about driving paths. So driving paths, we really kind of, I'll show this really quick, uh, but what we've got is you can see there's a whole bunch of paths in there. Not all of them are used. They're really there to show examples of different things I was trying out. And I've got some vehicles here. So before we get started, let me just go ahead and run this very quickly. And what we will see is that these cars are being animated across the path and the, each one is a different path but the loop is maintained some are coming into view out of view and it's it keeps that order so it was important to synchronize these multiple animations and the key thing is is you want the cars to actually change their rotation angle as it's going along the path because I couldn't just keep it flat and being looking to the left and then going around the path it would look crazy uh, so how do we how did I do that so let's take a look at the code here so surprisingly not a terrible amount of code but there there's some work in here um, so the, the key things that we have um, are the uh, let me just drive into the middle here we're going to use some um, path animations so that's the new piece here we need to know some starting points and some last car points to keep track of things uh, this uh, last drive times and process times uh, will come into play uh, I mentioned this time code that's actually being managed by a timer so we're, we're using one timer uh, this time code timer to manage all of that and then as we get to the implementation we'll see how all these things play out 
So in our startup, we are uh, creating our starting point. That's our, our the, the layout for the car. So each car is inside of a layout um, just to make it easier. They're separate. Uh, if you click on one, you have an image of a car, but the car is inside of a layout. And, uh, and then each car has its image or layout has its image. Um, that makes it easier to rotate. I can have a fixed size for the layout and the image could be different if necessary for what I needed. Um, to initialize the content, um, really all this is doing is I'm, I'm hiding all of the strokes that I had added in uh, for the paths. So the lines that were showing up at design time, I wanted to see where they were. They're not available at runtime. And I'm hiding each of the, con the cars themselves from their layout. So nothing is visible at startup except the background road. Then to create the animation objects, quite simple. I'm just creating a new path animation. The parent of that is the layout. And I'm just these are setting some things for the animation. The animation, because it's a path animation, needs a path. And that's what it's animating. So I don't have uh, a property per se like we did before. The object of, that's being animated is a path. Um, and it really means it's, it's starting from a path to the end over a period of time. So the interpolation is the same things. I'm running it linearly. I don't need it to be anything else, constant speed limit, if you will. Um, but I'm fitting it to the bounds rectangle. If you don't do this, then by default, because they're basically like an SVG file, the path, it will be really small. I need it to fit the size of my bounding rectangle for the control that's there. So that's why you have path data going into the path. And then the rectangle that it fits into is the bounding rect. Duration is duration, how long it takes. The various animation objects, I'm creating one animation object for each of the cars that I'm running. And the key piece here is this on process. So while the animation is occurring periodically, it like on a value change, it's going to call this event handler and we're going to respond to that. The starting of all three is pretty much the same. All we're doing is we're, we're making sure we have the layout for it. Um, once we do, we set up its starting position for each one. We set the opacity to one so it's now visible. And then we start driving. Pretty straightforward. The time code is really coordinating all three of those things. So as it says here, we want to ensure multiple sequences don't get out of sync and start to overlap one another. Um, that can happen if the system gets too busy. It can happen if you've got one animation that's taking a longer time than the other. And if it just does a straight loop, then it will kick off earlier. And so you might have cars colliding with each other. So in this case, the time code gives us that ability to say, nope, we're going to sequence this up and start up anew. And so it, this is just doing some calculations based on some frequencies. You can change these to see what the impact is. And then we just simply start driving for each of those. So the key piece is the, the remaining part is in these on process event handlers for each of these. And this is what happens when the car is moved along the path. Well, the key piece is that the rotation angle needs to change to be perpendicular to the angle of the line of the path that I'm on. Basically, we start getting into trig. So we need the arc tangent of the delta between our two positions. So this is why we have the, the, the last position and the current position. So we know from the last slice to this one, what angle was the, that was the car in its direction. We figure out the arc tangent for that, the perpendicular angle. We then set our uh, the angle of the, the, the arc tangent to uh, our rotational angle of our image, and that allows the car to be driving along and turning along the path. And the same has happened for driving path one, two, and three. And yes, you probably could um, share this in some way, looking at the sender. Uh, in this case, as I was building it, I was just kind of making it clear each of these three things were being handled by separate. So if you did want them to be different or do something odd, you could do that. And that is uh, some path animation with some time codes.
a lot of fun stuff in there. Okay, moving on, uh, just a couple more examples. The first up is uh, tab transitions with FMX tab controls. Uh, normally, when you switch to a different page, a different tab and a tab control, it just switches it immediately. It doesn't do any transitions. Um, but with mobile apps, it's really common to have a slide transition between views in our apps. And that's where the standard actions of next tab action and next uh, previous action can become really valuable because it has built in slide transitions. Uh, so let's take a look at that as well as another uh, wizard example I have. Um, but first we'll, we'll look at this tab. I have a, a simple application with a, a list box of items. Um, when I go and click on them, I want uh, to switch it. But by default, um, I tap on an item and it goes to a new view and it just immediately goes to the view. When I hit back, it immediately changes. I can add a nice transition by adding in some standard actions to the uh, my action list so drop an action list on your fmx form um, you can add them by doing new standard action finding the tab section and then picking which tab you want uh, the change tab allows you to jump to previous uh, to further tabs in the chain or back uh, and it figures out which direction the slide needs to be based on the index order so a lower index means go left Lower, larger index or goes right, light, lighter, larger index goes left. You're moving forward and backwards. The one piece to remember is you have to set the tab control property of each of the actions so that it knows which tab control it is being applied to. Once you do that, um, we can look at the code and whenever I click an item, instead of just changing the tab index, I'm invoking the next tab action. Likewise, when I hit the back button on the other screen, I'm going to navigate back. Now, when I go ahead and run this, what we will see is some nice slide animations. So I click on a list item. It slides into view. I can slip back. Again, there's no data transfer, anything that's really fancy happening here, but the mechanics of doing the tab transition is what was important there. The other example I wanted to show, another uh, kind of feature of combining the tab transitions with some of the other animation techniques that we had in there is in creating a wizard. So in this wizard, we have a basic wizard application. You hit the next button and there's a list of tasks that come up uh, for us to see. Not really, you know, let, can we make this fancy? Well, what, let me go ahead and run it and we can see what the impact is. Again, I have to run the right application here. So when I run the wizard, what we can see happen is both the tab transition is going to start. So I'm on tab one, I go to tab two, but then the tasks animate up from the bottom. So a nice kind of visual cue, hey, look at these, we have these tasks and we can fire that. And of course the back animation goes into play. And the way that's done is pretty straightforward. If we go look at the code, um, there's really not a lot of code in here. This is it. Um, the capsules, those represent the task buttons that were created. Um, I set my tab control to be the first page. Um, when I hit the next button, uh, I'm simply changing, I'm animating the individual capsules, but note that I'm doing this manually because I'm, I'm not doing it on the capsules themselves because I want all three to kind of animate a little bit differently. Um, in the sense of where I'm getting the start is based off of each individual capsule's height in the stack of where I want that to be because I could have varying sizes. So the, the starting position is adjusted for what the display would be. So the end value, you have the start value, then the end value that you set it to, and then go ahead and animate. And I'm using the Quartic to give it kind of a quicker acceleration. This is the duration, here's the start delay. So the I set up the animation and essentially tell it to fire, but wait four tenths of a second before doing so. Immediately following, because this is non-blocking, it executes the next tab, which causes the page to slide. As the page is sliding over, this animation kicks up and we get the task buttons that show up on the screen. 
So those are all the examples I have. You can download uh, all these sample materials from my Delphi by Design site in the download sections. You'll find links to all of those. Um, I thank you very much for tuning in and listening to my session. Uh, as I'm sure you can, uh, can tell from my voice, I do really enjoy the animation capabilities that are in FMX. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a really a cool way to add a, a nice spark uh, to your application when used appropriately. Don't overdo it. Um, but please uh, join me uh, after this session. I'll be joining live to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Thank you very much. And again, uh, enjoy the rest of DelphiCon 2023. All right, great. Thanks, Ray. If you want to come on here, we have some questions here. Oops, I clicked the wrong button. There you go. There we go. Um, all right, so... I actually, I have a question, and I tried to pay attention, but I may have missed it if you did. If you did cover this already, if you have so in the, I love the digit drop. That's a fun one. But so I had done one, yeah, things that I wanted to animate, but I wanted to keep them in sync, and I found that if I had, if the animations were took a little bit of time, they sometimes got out of sync. Did you address how to keep two things animated in sync in there? In there. Yeah, that was one of the things to, if you animate the individual objects uh, separately, then right. that becomes a real challenge of trying to keep them in sync. So in the digit drop example, the key was you want the, the, the two cells, basically the two text objects that represent the digits, the ones, tens, or hundreds, to animate in sequence. So rather than animate each individual cell over a different range, because what'll happen is based on where you're going and how the math works out, you might get little variances mm -hmm. as it goes over. There might be overlap, it might have a gap. And you know, if it's all a solid background, you probably won't necessarily detect it, but it, it won't look like they're in lockstep. So the, the trick to that, and it's, it's, it's really kind of, uh, a powerful solution to it is that instead of animating the individual objects, you animate a new property that you add to the form or some other class that gives you the basically the events to to hook into to where, OK, this overarching property is going to be animated. And every time that property value changes, we want to update one or two or n number of objects based on that intermediate step. So all of the objects get updated at the same way, same time through the animation process. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I thought that's what you're doing, but I wasn't sure. So all right, cool. That that's that was that was great. Uh, this question here from uh, Steve. Any way to animate a list view item element? Like you click one of the list items and it pops up or moves a bit, et cetera. Uh, that was an interesting question. I saw that come in through the chat. Um, the, the the interesting thing with that is, is anything that has a property, you can pretty much animate it. Now, the, the, the issue really is, well, what is the property that you would want to animate? Mm -hmm. And does the control itself lend itself to be doing that kind of animation. So from what it sounded in this particular case, it was like, oh, I wanna highlight the item a little bit differently positionally, you know, moving up or making it bigger or things like that, you know, shake it or something. Well, mm -hmm. the list view doesn't really support that. Um, but now you could do something with like animating the background color so that if you clicked it, you could show that, yes, this was selected. Uh, but if you did want to do something positional in an area that really doesn't support that, you could always take a, a screen capture of that control surface and, you know, as an image and then animate the image and then, you know, get rid of it. Uh, might be a way to accomplish what you want. But that was yeah, I, you'd probably have to do like owner draw or something like that too. Yeah. Um, so there is a question about whether you can apply this to bitmap images, like you just suggested, raster images, like a screenshot, as opposed to vector shapes. Yeah, the, the, uh, for, a, well, it depends on what it is that you're looking to animate, uh, right. on that. I mean, typically the, 
you know, if you're doing a bitmap image that was in a T image component uh, or the, you know, the various FMX versions of that, because there's one that's the styled shape control, then there's the basic primitive image component. Um, but as a control, if you're going to resize it, because I think that was one of the things at the time that that was, was shown, uh, you could certainly animate that and but if you're looking at things to do like zoom levels and other things like that that you're trying to animate mm -hmm. um you, you'd end up most likely wanting to put that into a, a viewport a scroll box of some kind uh and then animating the the zoom factor for each of those to get what you would want uh, again it's finding the property that you want to animate and then as that property changes, instead of being, you know, going from one to 10 immediately, you know, when the 10 gets applied, that's what you end up wanting initially. All an animation does is it takes and gives you intermediate values between that one and 10 start stop value and call the property right access method for each of those intermediate values. And that's mm -hmm. how you end up seeing the change over time. Okay. What happens if you move the mouse out of the shield before mouse over animation is finished? Does the mouse over animation finish or does the mouse out animation start immediately? Which color uses it in that case? Yeah, that's a good, it's a really good question because it's, you want to kind of, when you're setting up those uh, trigger based animations, which is where this uh, question is coming from, is I had the shield and you move the mouse over the shield, the color changed. If, if that animation took longer um, and you were to move it out before the duration finished, uh, the new trigger gets fired and it essentially replaces the active animation. So moving the mouse over kicks off the trigger in the, the on mouse over animation, uh, changing the color. Once you move it out, even if that is still going, that initial animation is stopped and the, the mouse out or the, you know, not mouse over is, is played in immediately. So it, it doesn't, like chain them, it, it interrupts the animation because you're now saying, no, stop that. I want to move out. Mm -hmm. uh, as that's a really good point to those. You want to make sure that those kinds of animations, especially if you're doing like mouse over hovering types of things, that they're not long. Because what happens is, is if it's gradually changing the color and you can do that in the example, uh, I, and I did it while I was doing the, the video was playing is I changed it to two seconds. And so you move the mouse over and then it's taking two seconds to change the color to blue. Well, you know, at, at half a second, I moved the mouse out. Uh, and what happened is, is it goes from red glows, gets to like a purple. And then as I moved it out, it changed immediately to blue and then fades back to the red. You want those types of animations to be very quick. Yeah. 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 I, I, when I've used animations in the past, and actually, I appreciate your comment at the end about uh, animations being useful to add, but add them appropriately and not overdoing it because <laughs> it, well, it's one of those things you have to test it and see because you do get those weird behaviors like that. Yeah. Uh, you have to test it. You know, you also, uh, I mean, think about for, for all of the old timers out there that were around back in uh, the, the, the mid nineties, late nineties, when, you know, the web was still coming to its uh, uh, heyday and uh, everybody wanted to start putting animations on their websites. And, you know, one little thing Linking was kind of little, you know, little uh, <laughs> attention grabber, but there was some, there was some abuse back in the day yes yes there was <laughs> uh, question here from patrick do you use the enable property of animations or only start and stop oh that's a, a, another good question um they're, they're both available i didn't really show the enabled much um but uh it's it is a way to turn on and off an animation you know if you if it's disabled then it's not running no matter how it's set up um the the key thing for me, what I typically do is if it's a one-off animation where I'm, I'm, I'm having it start up and start again, I will, um, I just use the start method. You know, it's just like, okay, I, I want to run this off at the end of it. 
it's not doing anything more. It's not looping or something. Uh, if it is something to where, like I might create an animation for an activity indicator, something that's showing that something going on. And so while something's happening, it's a little bit more convenient coding wise to say, okay, enable the, the animation. So I know that's running. And then when I'm done, I may end up just toggling the, the enabled property off, but either way will work. I know that I, I like the start and stop on them because then I, I for some reason for it, it uh, makes more sense to me. It's like, I want to start this animation dot start. Right. But then there are times when you want to like toggle it or whatever, like you're saying too. So I like, I, I appreciate that it has both. <laughs> uh, Patrick I, shared I mean, that the uh, key frame stand project has some animation uh, uh, controls available there. So if people take a look at that. Um, uh, yeah, indeed. He's got more more options that are not just a simple slide, you know, to do that. So that's great. Yeah. Um, let's see. And then a lot of people commenting that it was a great session. I agree. I always love your sessions. You do such a good job, and you make you make the really cool demos. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, thank you. I appreciate that. That that is something that's uh, that, that anybody that's that's seen me do presentations in the past. That's to me, I think, is the most valuable. I always like doing something that has some sort of realness to it. Like that, wow, I could probably use this somewhere. And you know, I want them to be as realistic as possible, but not overly complicated. Where there's a lot of noise that you can't yeah. really see what it is you're trying to convey. That's that's the real art of demos, honestly, is that you want to make it um, meaty enough that it's substantial, but not so meaty that you're just like, if someone looks at the code, they're like, I have no idea what's going on here. Well, it's another, <laughs> I, I'm very, very particular about names of things. It's I want, if I'm going to reference something, if I'm conveying an idea, I want something that makes sense. You know, I don't like using just general T widgets or foobar or any of the, you know, just dummy data that's there because you end up you don't make a good mental connection when you're trying to explain that yeah. every time you do a session i'm waiting for the uh chicago cubs reference uh i didn't have <laughs> any for this one. Oh, oh so okay so now uh challenge accepted that will be <laughs> in my next update I will have to animate the Cubs logo. Maybe instead of the arrows, I will do something to to uh, to, to to rotate those things. Actually, as soon as I as soon as I said that, I was thinking you could have done like the uh, baseball diamond and have the players running around instead of the. There's all kinds of fun stuff you could do. All right, um, I, I think this was what first one you addressed about using an event on the forum that sets all the different things together. Yeah, when you're doing multiple animations and things like that, and you want them to, um, whether it's, this, this is slightly different because it's talking about, you know, multiple different kinds of animations. Now, you would oh. still want them driven by one overarching property that you're animating. And then on each change, you would have to uh, adjust what it is that you're trying to 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 modify but yeah there's a, a great way to to synchronize that where where that whole technique of animating creating a property at the form level and using that to animate was one of the early things i was challenged with was to mimic the uh, the physical mechanical 3d signs that would flip like the old train stations on the yep. Solari flip clocks. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to to simulate that on the screen using the 3D techniques in Fire Monkey. And um, I you end up having multiple images because you have the front and the back of the top and the bottom of the, each card, if you will. And so right. you're animating those in 3D space. Well, keeping all of those coordinated because you have an angle of the flap well, both of those images need to go in the same way. I don't want one to, to you know, they, they have to be done in lockstep. And that right. was where that uh, that technique came from. I was watching a, an animation of an actual clock, and I was like, oh, man, I'd love to do that in Fire Monkey. So 
now now I'm like, oh, Ray's giving me the <laughs> the tools I need. Uh, well, and you know, your comment about making your demos useful that was like your first your book on component development years ago was that Absolutely. it was the demos were so good that became your Ray's components your examples in your book. Indeed, it did. Uh, do, 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 do. All right, so there's a comment here about, um, oh, okay, actually, first one, where's your demo code available? Is it on your website? Or I, I'll uh, get this it, all collected up later as well. But Sure, on the last slide of it, it's it's uh, my Delphi by design.com website. If you go to okay. the blog there, there's a download section and all of my uh, source code for all the different presentations there, it's categorized. Uh, so if you look under the FMX section, you'll find the animations. Uh, okay. code there all right and then the other question was and this was uh so i'd like to see a quick demo of a real root application with some of these use some of these in anger, <laughs> in anger. <laughs> um well so the i can share that a lot of these animation techniques like the digit drop for example was uh was originally designed for a uh, standby wait sign at uh, for toy story mania at disneyland and so um being able to have something fun that fits with you know the theme the design of the application is where that came from uh the the vehicle um animation that was showing how to do path animation and you know responding to the, the 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 tangent of the path to get the arc tangent to give you the you know the have the car drive along um if you now you can think that kind of sounds and looks a little like autopia where a car is driving around a path that that's exactly where that was originated from was for a um a tip board to show uh standby weights and times that uh, uh, that was used for uh, Tomorrowland. Um, there's some fun stuff. Almost all of these animations, you know, I've, I've simplified them down to show highlight the animation piece of it. But uh, they're they're all leveraged in a real technique. Same thing with the the wizard page that was used uh, in, in an actual kiosk application. So um, yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's very cool. Very yep. effective. It is. It honestly, I think sometimes the best use of animation is when you don't think when you, when the animation happens, you're not thinking about the fact the animation is happening. Correct. When it's the little subtle things, especially in like um, material design where you see things move in over each other or stuff like that, where it gives that um, sense of interactivity, affordability to the user interface. Yeah, some of the best animation is when you don't notice that there's animation. One of the one of the is an early presentation years and years ago when Microsoft was first establishing WPF, and one of the architects uh, was sharing some thoughts on why they were spending so much effort on incorporating animation into the Windows Presentation Foundation, and you know the example that still resonated with me was, you know. If I have you know a cup on a table and I need to move the cup to the other side of the table, you see the transition. It's natural. We expect that to happen. Right. We don't see the cup disappear and immediately show up over here. Well, we do when it's magic. You know, right. it, it's like if there's a special effect or something, but in our everyday lives, things transition from one area to or position to another. And I thought that was really telling and also explained to where it, it needs to make sense. You know, when I'm animating my cup, for example, I'm not making the cup bigger while I'm animating it. You know, it's it needs to fit where it doesn't cause right. me to go, oh, what happened there? Right. Yep. And, you know, as opposed to the animation where like it, it gets bigger or spins around or something like that, it's like that's that's ostentatious and not necessary it just needs to be like you said move so you can see and the other thing is that you see where it went and where it came from and stuff like that and shows the interactivity exactly um 
Uh, somebody just threw into the chat. Teleportation could be nice too. That's very funny. That would be. Yes. Oh, there we go. That is kind of what could... that is. Boom. Yep. Uh, Gary said you talked about some themes that were coming a while back. I don't recall that. I don't know if you're. Oh, that was from the last session when I was talking about uh, creating custom VCL styles. Okay. Uh, so uh, the news is that it's close. I'm putting together the the details about releasing that. I've finally finished those to where I'm I'm happy with all of the different variations. So um, we'll make an announcement on the Ray Software website. Uh, probably in the next couple of weeks um once that's all in place to to set that up all right and last question here um does animation or how does animation affect system performance in general so generally uh, again it's kind of it, it all comes down to is what you're animating and and doing it you know judiciously uh, can you abuse the system and have the animation affect performance yeah you could uh, depending on what you're trying to do and how much you're changing and how quickly um, you run that fine risk of like, okay, if it's too much and it's too big, you get choppiness in it. So you end up having to extend it out, delay it. Um, if what you're, if the property you're animating over and the way it's changing is causing a lot of calculations and work to be done in recalculating the intermediate states, that will have an impact. But generally, um, I, you, I, I've, it's not going to bring your whole system down unless you really kind of push the limits of what it is you're trying to move. But general things like I've been showing in all of this has not been um, uh, super taxing on the systems. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much, Ray. Again, fantastic session. Learned a lot um, and uh, appreciate all you do in the community. Looking forward to your uh, VCL styles themes coming out. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, everyone enjoy the rest of the conference. I will stick around on the chat for a few more minutes to answer any outstanding questions that we didn't get to. Um, but thank you all for joining in on the session. All right. Great. Uh, coming up next, we have creating LibreOffice documents with in Delphi with Daniel Fernandez. And uh, so, and that will we'll be coming up shortly here. So, we just ran over a little bit here, but we'll catch up quickly. Hello, everyone. Welcome to DelphiCon 2023. This month, we're celebrating 28 years of Delphi. Well, my name is Daniel, and today I speak about to how to create LibreOffice documents in Delphi. About this presentation, today we learn what is the component, what is the necessity, what is open source and why, the code pattern. I will show the use case Use the component, the example. At the end, I open Q&A section, okay? But who I am? Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm from Brazil. I was born in the states of Minas Gerais, and I live in the states of Sao Paulo. I have degree in information technology management from FATEC, Studio postgraduate degree in software engineer. I've been working as Delphi developer for seven years. I currently work at Aquasoft as a Delphi developer. Well, let's start. What is the component? It's an open source software which uses the MIT license. It focuses to manipulate the LibreOffice API interacting directly behind the scene with the application the component currently integrates with the calc and writer calc is a kind of excel and writer is a kind of the microsoft word what is the open source it is computer software with its source code made available and licensed in which copywriter provides to the right to study, modify, and distribute. Of course, there are variations in permission according to the type of license chose. License types. What are the license? 1. MIT license. Your name is because MIT College. 
permit add, modify, merge, publish, distribute the original MIT license and freely sell copies of the software. This license is very easy, simple and straightforward, which is why it is a search and I adopt rate among software developers. 2. Apache License 2.0 the Apache Software License is a permissive open source software license scam. It allows development users to use the software for any purpose, distribute, modify, and distribute modified versions of the software under the terms of Apache License product. 3. GNU General Public License, or GPL. The GNU General Public License is a series of most commonly used open source licenses as written by Richard Stellman in 1989. Any software application written based on any GPL component must be released as an open source product. It is mandatory for any GPL open source component to distribute the full source code of the software based on previous copyleft work upon release to the public. Four. Berkeley Software Distribution License, BSD. This license permits add, modify, merge, publish, distribute, but you retain a copy of the copyright notes, list of the condition and disclaimer. 5. Internet System Consortium License, ISC. This license is kind of MIT license, but in the other language. And users must include the original copyright notice and a copy of the license itself when copying or modifying license code. Well, these are the main licenses. But why open source? Contribute to the Delphi community and encourage open source code create. We don't have many open source codes within the Delphi community compared to the other language. I believe that encouraging open source code can afford the strength of our community. Open source project example. Within community Delphi, we have horse, rest tower, ACBR, or ACBR, as we call it in Brazil. ACBR is a more popular Brazilian component we use for a commercial automation. Outside the community, we have Postgres SQL, MariaDB, and Ubuntu, and others, Linux, and among others, project. What is the necessity, the need for an open source company capable of generating spreadsheets as born out of a project that Cloud not depend on a cost of Excel for the client nor on the cost of having a paid company to generate this application spreadsheet. I needed an open source company to transform JSON from API into a spreadsheet. That's how I start to study about LibreOffice API and start to create the component. For the forward in the use case section, I show this project. What is LibreOffice or OpenOffice? I believe everyone knows LibreOffice or OpenOffice, but it is a suite of free and open source Office application available for Windows, Unix, Solaris, Linux, and macOS. Yes, we can use it on our platform. Why use the LibreOffice? The Coast is a free software community. Have a large community where you can clear your questions. Usability. Its usability is very similar to Excel. Compatibility. You can create formulas in the LibreOffice that will be able to pass to Excel extension without lose compatibility. Here's the link with the formulas compatible between Calc and Excel. Now, I start the technical part of this presentation. 
the patterns I use as the flow interface. But what is the flow interface? In software engineer, a flow interface is an object-oriented API whose design release heavily on a method chain. Its purpose is to increase code readability by creating a domain-specific language. The term has coined in 2005 by Eric Evans and Marty Fowler. The Eric Evans is also to create of DDD, a topic addressed by Gustavo Mena. Look this for as no beginning and as five chain methods. This is one line of code where you set value, set bold, set border, change font, set color. In this example, flow interface always returns self, the current state of the object. In example, change font. The method will change the font name and size and returns the current state of itself. Now, I will show the code, but I won't go into code details, just show it. Open Office class. This is the main class. Here we have the common functions between calc and write classes, which write from it. Well, I will show the class. The OpenOffice Calc class, responsible only for methods relevant to Calc. Here are the methods of this class. OpenOffice Writer, responsible only for methods relevant to Writer. The OpenOffice Set Printer. This class is responsible only for methods relevant to print. Stall LibreOffice class. If the client does not have LibreOffice installed, this class will find the last version and suggest the installation to client. If he clicks yes, the download will be performed and installation will be request. This is the structure of the component about the use of the component. There is a demo where you can see the example available together on my GitHub. Here, the front end request to spreadsheet to backend. The backend makes the API call return a JSON. This JSON is populated in the dataset and this dataset is transformed into one or more spreadsheet. These spreadsheets are compressed in .zip and the zip .zip is transformed in base64. Now we can see the spreadsheet being generated. We can see the cells being formatted and return it to the front end, which makes the download available, passing to the base 1642.zip with all the spreadsheet. The component does not depend on the visual part to work with the spreadsheet, being able to completely disable the visual part and gain performance and work with threads. Demo Calc. I will be demonstrating the demo of the component. This demo is on my GitHub. Just go there to get the code and compilable executable. See the example of how to use it. It's simple and easy to use. I will start demonstrating. A method called dataset to see where you pass your dataset and the component make a mirror of your grid. Turning your dataset into a spreadsheet. The grid values, click on export to spreadsheet. He start create for you. It is, it is a possible to do the opposite where you pass the spreadsheet and it transforms into a dataset. Now you have the component pointed to the spreadsheet. 
Now you can start working with values. Column value B2, I found the value Peter Park. I want to change the value that is in the column. I will put your secret identity, the Spider-Man. And add value, I will put in the bold now, underline with the line breaks. I will add more text to the show the line breaks without the line break and add value, change font color, select white, background color, I will choose green and add value, it is also possible to align, center, right, Lefty, the font type, I will put the library of the full. And add value, the font size, 5 here. And add value, to show the vertical alignment. Select top, select center, select bottom, add value. Here the size for 12. I changed the font size to 10. Here we also have the option to strength for numeric for implement the graphics. The value for the graph has to be numeric because otherwise it will be understand as a string. I went to the value of C2, I will force it as numeric to C3, C4, add value and C5, add value, here I will say I went from column B to column C, the edge or age column from line 0 to line 5, I can leave the other lines already mapped, for example, up to line 10. While I go include the values, the chart would be updated. I put the name at graph. We have the default, which is the, the bar graph. We have the pie chart, the vertical bar chart, and the line graph. I will present it just one more here. And here we have the other graphic. It is possible to add a new tab too. It does not change the tab in the visual part, only in the source code. I put the name and add. I changed the tab. Tab only changed in the code and not in the visual part. Click on the get value. There is no more value filling. I will write test and add value. Here the added value. We have the formatting too. And see the program wrote the test in the correct tab without interference from the visual part. I'm go back here to tab zero. Let's get the value now. We get the value 28. This value is in the tab zero. We can to save. Load the document. No, I'm going to save it as XLSX. The component understand any extension of the spreadsheet can be XLS or ODS or CSV. It's a, it is a compatible with the Excel or with any other offices. Select path in the format. I will save. We have the events in the component. We have the before and after the get value, add, save, print. I have the options to the count columns and the rows. I save it. I select where I save it to see the file. I'm going to the open the folder. The test planilla file is here. 
everything started by the component must be terminated by the component because he stays with a pointer memory pointer for a current spreadsheet. So if I close here at X, it will get lost at that pointer. That it must be closed in this way. Then I will close by the component. I close it. I don't have any spreadsheet open anymore. So I'm going to the open the spreadsheet that I saved. Ready? We have printing options. Here the event of after printing. I will save it as a PDF on the desktop. I select the path, define the name as testplanilla.pdf and save it. I go to where I save it to see how the PDF turned out. Here is the generated PDF. The print settings can be configured by Open office set printer class. Inside the company, there is a class to work with the printing options. Inside the company, in the demo code, is with the example and how to use. There is a lot of function already implemented in it and is always receive updates. All the document is inside the source code. Now let's go to the part or writer, the text files. Now I will be demonstrating LibreOffice Writer. It's the component that works with .docx and text documents in general. It's like calc. Everything that starts with the component must be closed by the component because there is a pointer pointed to a document. We can add the text and we can change the text property. Here we have the name of the font. See component editing in LibreOffice Writer. I will select the font Times New Roman. Here the font size, I change to 12. Here the font color, change to red. Gray. Go back to black. We have the bold option. We have the option underline. Now, I am going to put together a text example. It's done by a routine inside the code available on them. Here you can see the generated document. Here, I can move the cursor to the end of the document. Now I can continue editing the code. I add a new text to the generated document. You can save, print, load, and already create document and start work in him. It is also possible to get the text value, the component it has some function that are not yet available at the time of this demo, but that are already uploaded to GitHub. The library's writer option is the latest implementation and it is still under development and gaining new features. But it is now fully functional. This was the demonstration of how the component works. Here is the component GitRub where you can contribute with the code or just download and use it. In this initial part, we have the code and the readme right below. where you have all the instruction for installation, supported version of the file. If you install the component and do not have LibreOffice installed, the component will ask to installation of the latest version of the LibreOffice.
as it is in the orientation. If you are going to use just reading and write the spreadsheet in a simple way, only the component is enough. If you are going to use styling and work with print and cell and font colors, use the extra units described. The week has the demo video in Portuguese, so I will update to English too. Here, in pull request, we have the component update. The most recent and important feature is the possibility of working with threads and the doc visible property to the disable visualization of the components creating with interaction talking place with libraries just by API. This increases the component's performance and enables the use of threads. To build the document with the options doc visible equals false, at the end of the spreadsheet manipulation, it must be closed using the close file options. And in the sequence, save file with the path where you want to save. I recommend use the option doc visible equals true only for development. This option is valid for the LibreOS writer as well. If you find a bug or want to suggest or include some improvement, you can use the issue tab. Feel free to participate in the project and help. After all, it is open source. Someone from the Delphi community for the Delphi community. To report something, go to the issue tab, click on new issue and choose a category. Is a bug or a feature? and get the templates in Get Start, and fill in the fields, title, description, how to reproduce, if it's a bug. If you want to submit a solution, you can also write and if possible, attach the file and click Submit. Good. Now I have work to do. <laughs> Here follow my contact, my email, my LinkedIn, my GitHub, where you can find the component, and my Instagram, where you can follow component updates and other development issues. You can send me message there too. Well, if we reached the end, I want to thank Embarcadero for the opportunity to be here, give my first international lecture, Aquasoft for supporting me and make this moment in my career possible, and to all of you listeners who have been following me today, thank you very much and see you soon. Now let's go to the Q&A, as the picture says, enjoy now or use Google later. <laughs> Just kidding, you can call me through any channel in the contact. All right, great. Thank you, Daniel, for that session. I appreciated the uh, use Google <laughs> or use the source since it's all open source, right? All right, so joining me, I have Daniel. Uh, Fernandez here to answer questions, and Dion is also here as well to help out. Very cool. I, I was actually I was really impressed with this. That um, I do a lot of work with spreadsheets, <laughs> and <laughs> there is, is there's a lot of power in Calc or Excel or whatever you're using, but there's oftentimes a lot of times where. I have like the data is coming from somewhere else, right? And I'm always like copying and pasting and moving things around. And so I'm watching this and I'm like, oh, I got some ideas. Because <laughs> there's so much you could do to automate putting the data into the spreadsheet and doing the, the charts and stuff like that from Delphi. So, wow, that's, that's awesome. Thanks. <laughs> Even more with the configuration of the files, right? Then, mm -hmm. uh, with the 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 Daniel example, we can choose the the font color, the font size. Uh, you can put out all the configured spreadsheets, so it's 
make our life very easy in this way. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, I put the link in the chat for your GitHub so people can go out and take a look at this and give it a star. That's always a, it's giving it a star on GitHub is doesn't cost you anything, but it's a great way to just uh, give somebody a thumbs up, a vote of approval, and uh, help other people find it. So, oh, it looks like. Um, Alexander is already giving you a star on GitHub. <laughs> <laughs> Collecting stars. Uh, Raphael says, congratulations. Keep up the great work. You're very important in the Delphi community. Yeah, I would agree. This is great. Thanks. And then um, I appreciated Craig's comment. Open source is great. non copy left is greater. <laughs> uh, OK, uh, let's see. Other questions here. A lot of people just are like, wow, this is great. I'm excited for you. Um, all right. Well, if anybody has any questions for Daniel, go ahead and put them in the question panel here, and I'll get them asked for, asked for you. Otherwise, like you said, you can use Google later um, or use the source code. see a lot of things yeah it's like everybody's just excited for you here <laughs> <laughs> um there's dr bond get dr kevin bond he wrote the uh the new delphi programming book that just came out i guess it was last year it says thanks so Awesome. Well, I, I for sure will be using this. I'm a, I'm a fan of LibreOffice already. And, um, and like I said, I do a lot of work with spreadsheets and stuff as well. So I, I definitely, <laughs> I will definitely be putting this to use because this is, this is very useful stuff here. Uh, okay. Here's a question that came in. Have you tested it with large volume of records? What's the performance like? Yes, I generate the 15 spreadsheets, the uh, balance sheets, con, uh, contabilidad. Financial assets uh, reports, the Yes, it's very a lot of information. And two days of work resume to five, five minutes. Okay. Does the integration mainly control LibreOffice from Delphi, or can LibreOffice call back into Delphi? If, if someone does something in LibreOffice, can you get a notification in Delphi? I use the LibreOffice API. LibreOffice have a Uno API, and my calls is a Uno API. But uh, uh, I think you cannot uh, generate events by library office to call back Delphi, right? Right. Okay. All right. So there's a question here if you're planning to support the Microsoft Office suite as well, or if it's gonna you're gonna stick it with or stay with LibreOffice. So you understand. Uh, do you wanna implement for Microsoft? Uh, uh, Excel as well. Oh, I think okay. maybe not the, because uh, the main idea of Daniel was create an open source project and uh, Microsoft open <laughs> source. So yeah, maybe he <laughs> <laughs> will stick with LibreOffice. Yeah, it would be a completely different API as well. So yeah, it makes sense. Yes. This is a good question. Is it possible to build a server service running like in an SAPI DSL? Or um, it, so it, it sounds like LibreOffice has to be installed, but can it be done without um, like in a headless environment where the uh, user is not interacting with it? Yes. Uh, in the use case, this presentation, I use the LibreOffice in the server. 
and have an API call API, API call the library office, generate spreadsheet and return the spreadsheet for the front end. And okay. yes, uh, you running is is up. Uh, so a, this is an interesting question. Um, can you create user-defined functions in Delphi? So an Excel in your or a spreadsheet, or, uh, in your spreadsheet, you could have the formula calling into code that's in Delphi. I don't think, yes. I think we just said you can't go that way. Yes, have a function for, for I forgot the name. <laughs> For formula <laughs> in, in library of C. You can you can put Delphi formula inside a spreadsheet, but you cannot call the spreadsheet from any data in Delphi, right? You have to put all the uh, data in the spreadsheet and create the formula to put there, right, Daniel? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. So it was pointed out that there are office automation components already in Delphi that use COM. Um, that's true. Uh, I have not used those in a while, but it's good to see that there are these here for LibreOffice too. And so Patrick's just asking for clarification. Um, so you could have LibreOffice on a server and use that um, from other computers on the network. You don't have to have it or yeah. Like you said, in the SAPI DSL, DLL. All right. <clears throat> Is it requiring GDI DLL or does it have to be a full version of Windows Server running? I think mm -hmm. you you don't have to be all the, the library of C uh, pet installed, right, Daniel? Yes, it yes. work only with uh, the DLLs, but the DLL must be on the server side or in the application path to work well, right? Yes. The the use of, of the yeah. Daniel uh, implementation does not suppress using LibreOffice, right? It, it only call LibreOffice API. So LibreOffice must be present, even not installed, the DLL must be present, right? Yes. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Um, okay, I think that's it for the questions. Um, Fabio is asking more about Microsoft Office. Just, you know, take a look at the other components. It doesn't that's a would be a different API. But here's another question. Uh, does okay, does it work on other platforms or is it Windows specific? Um, right now it, it only works uh, in Windows Server, but maybe in the future, the new issues, right, Daniel, <laughs> will be available for Linux too, but by now only for Windows. Only for Windows, yes. And you have another stargazer now, Samuel, as well as uh, give you a star on GitHub, so we'll see where your stars are here shortly. You should have a whole, quite a few. <laughs> Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your presentation and for all the code that you put together here. This is a, looks a very useful tool and happy to have you on a international presentation here for the full audience. Thanks, Jen. Thanks for Bertinich. Absolutely, absolutely. Great, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Yep. All right, uh, let's see, we have, let me look at the schedule here. Ah, so up next we have, I'll just share my screen. We have, oops, that's the wrong button. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, Ian Barker's How We Use Delphi as a Weapon in a Real Fight in One, and that's in 12 minutes here. So 
we will, um, I'm going to run a couple of our lightning sessions here to fill time between now and then. So if you need to take a break, stretch your legs or whatever, that now is the time to do it. And we will see you all here in about 12 minutes. We are excited to announce to you that now the Deleaker supports the Rad Studio 10.4 Sydney. The new release of Rad Studio adds significant new and enhanced Windows capabilities throughout the product in addition to the major productivity and performance enhancements across supported platforms. The Deleaker works as a plugin in Rad Studio in order to help find leaks and optimize usage resources efficiently. In this video, you'll see how the Deleaker integrates with the new Rad Studio 10.4 Sydney and assists developers to find and fix leaks. Launch the Deleaker installer. The installer shows available Rad Studio versions. Rad Studio 10.4 Sydney is supported. Let the installer add the leaker to the Rad Studio. Ready. Start the Rad Studio. A developer can open the Deleaker window at any moment by clicking to the Deleaker menu. Let's create a new Windows VCL application. Build and run the project. Return to the Rad Studio, open the Deleaker window, and take a snapshot. Let's look at the live objects. They are grouped by the class name. Here is the main form and a lot of other objects. For each object, you can view its size, a source file, and explore its call stack. OK, let's close the application. The process quits, and the deleaker starts taking a snapshot. No leaks found, and that's expected. Mm -hmm. 
let's introduce a leak. Add a button to the form. Name it. Double click the button to add a handler. Let's allocate some memory and instantiate one object of tstring list. You will see the way the deleaker finds these leaks. Build and run. Click the button several times. Close the application. The deleaker is preparing a snapshot. The deleaker has found some leaks. For each leak, you can view its hit count, size, source file name, and call stack. To explore leaked objects, switch to Delphi objects. The deleaker has found the tstring list object. Here is the call stack. To navigate to the source code, right click the call stack and choose Show Source Code. The leaker opens the source file and moves the cursor to the line where the object was allocated. Let's return to the allocations. Navigate to the line where the memory allocated by the getMem function. The final snapshot contains all information about leaked memory and objects, size, hit count, value, and module. It's easy to proceed to the source code to find the location of the allocated resources. Let's close the deleaker, the project, and create a new, similar application in C++ Builder. The project is ready. Build it and run. Without closing the application, switch to the IDE and open the deleaker window. Take a snapshot. Here you see a lot of allocations and some live objects as well. Objects are grouped by the class name. For each object, you can explore the call stack. Close the deleaker and the application. The deleaker has found two global objects. Good job! Well, let's add some leaks. Drop a button to the form. Name it.
Double click to open the handler. Let's introduce two leaks. Start the debugging. Click the button a few times. Close the form. The deleker is taking a snapshot. The snapshot is ready. The deleker has found the leaked object. Here it's call stack. Right click to the call stack and choose show source code to navigate to the source of the leak. The deleker opens the editor in the correct line. Great! Switch to the allocations and you'll see that the leak made by the operator new has been detected as well. Right click to the allocation, choose show source code to go to the source code. Great, here is the correct line. The deleaker is a memory profile for both Delphi and C++ Builder that helps fix memory loss as well as leaks of handles and other resources. It is tightly integrated with Rad Studio to allow developers to locate the source of leaks without leaving the IDE. Happy coding! All right, we have in session next, um, how we use Delphi as a weapon in a real fight and won. And Ian will be joining us for Q&A after that session. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on wherever you are in. again to DelphiCon 2023 celebrating 28 years of Delphi. Is it really that long? It's pretty amazing. My name is Ian Barker. And I'm an Embarcadero Delphi MVP. Today's session is called How We Used Delphi as a Weapon in a Real Fight and Won. Uh, you can read all about this session on the blog post on the main uh, Embarcadero blog if you go to the time. com forward slash Delphi versus competition or VS competition. Uh, you can see that on the bottom. Slide there. If you need to get in touch with me, feel free to email me. Uh, ian.barker at gmail.com or go to one of my all right we're having some technical issues with that video um let me see if i can um Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on wherever you are in the world. Welcome again to DelphiCon 2023, 
celebrating 28 years of Delphi. Is it really that long? It's pretty amazing. My name is Ian Barker and I'm an Embarcadero Delphi MVP. Today's session is called How We Used Delphi as a Weapon in a Real Fight and Won. Uh, you can read all about this session on the blog post on the main uh, Embarcadero blog if you go to tinyurl.com forward slash Delphi versus competition or VS competition. Uh, you can see that on the bottom slide there. If you need to get in touch with me, feel free to email me, uh, ian.barker at gmail.com or go to one of my websites or follow me on Twitter. It's up to you. Uh, it's all entirely optional. So how we use Delphi as a weapon in a real fight and one. The thing about Delphi is uh, it's it, it's not got the massive marketing budgets. It's not that kind of super sexy new technology, fluffy, backed by um, you know the likes of Google with unlimited bazillions of budgets. Um, it's it's there and it's chugging away in the background. And it reminds me a lot of really um, the phrase that Winston Churchill used when he was talking about Bletchley Park, where they built the um, the first computers, really, the, the, the bomb with an E on the end, as it was called, to uh, decode the Enigma ciphers. And Winston Churchill described the staff at the ultra top secret Bletchley Park as the goose that laid the golden eggs but never cackled. And that's the trouble with uh, Delphi, really. It's silently successful. It's chugging away in the background of all sorts of enterprise applications, doing some important work. Uh, you name it, it's their banking and uh, hospital uh, apps. And if you look at some of our enterprise stories on the blog at the moment, you'll see it, it really is absolutely everywhere. And in fact, in I believe, in almost any given situation, it's the best choice. It's the fastest to market. It's almost always the lowest amount of code. It's always been about low code right from day one. Using components to develop apps, drop that uh, functionality on and off you go. It's, it's very, very straightforward and very easy to do. Um, I, I don't understand why anybody would work harder and write dozens and dozens of lines of code for, a, you know, instead of just dropping a component on them. But there you go. It's also rock solid. Delphi programs just keep going and going and going and going. Uh, it doesn't matter if you, you know, upgrade your operating system. You started on XP and you upgraded to Windows um, ME, I think it was, and then Windows uh, 95 and Windows Vista and, uh, and then up to Windows 7. Windows 8, 8.1, Windows 10, Windows 11, it doesn't matter. Those same apps will keep running, weirdly enough, and that's why, you know, Delphi 7 is still used by a lot of people, and Delphi 5, you know, people still like those apps. Um, but you're missing out on some of the modern uh, features that you get in, in things like um, Rad Studio 11. But because of its, its almost self-contained uh, nature, it doesn't crash, it doesn't die just because someone didn't install a particular .NET framework. There are some dependencies, of course, you know, databases change, technologies change, but really your Delphi program is just going to keep going on and on and on. And so really Delphi is the software equivalent of Churchill's Silent Goose that lays those golden eggs. It, it just keeps going and uh, keeps working without any problems whatsoever. Once you write that Delphi app and you've got it working, you've got it debugged, you can guarantee it's solid. That's what's great about Delphi. And there are bigger marketing budgets out there from the likes of Microsoft, who could buy you know most of, of uh, France, I'm sure, with a, a small check. And uh, they make a lot of noise in other directions. They're very, very sex successful at marketing. There's nothing wrong with their offerings as such. But, um, you know, there's a big splash made for um, React, for example, from Facebook originally. Um, and so really what happened was people were saying, well, you know, you say Delphi is good. You say it's useful. But if we were to compare it with X or Y um, framework in a fair fight, how would Rad Studio with Delphi really do? How would it actually do? So Embarcadero thought, well, do you know what? Let's sponsor some comparison research. And by that, we meant real genuine, a friendly contest like those two judokas there who are about to get to grips and grapple. Is Rad Studio with Delphi really any good compared to popular alternatives? And that's a good question. The methodology and results are described in a freely available white paper. And it's a real thing. It's a proper scientific white paper. All of the thinking that goes on to the competition, the, the kind of... Uh, 
uh, methodologies that we use to compare the frameworks. It's all explained in there. It's open. Anybody can go and read on it and, and check that, you know, there wasn't any sleight of hand when something did well and there wasn't any sleight of hand making something look worse than it actually did. If something performed badly, there was a good reason for it. Either the framework wasn't really built for the job to do that or um, all that, you know, it just wasn't up to the job compared to the comp competition. Um, Delphi didn't slash absolutely everything. Let's, let's not be uh, ridiculous here. We can't, um, um, in all honesty, say, hey, you know, it's always going to be the best option ever. We think it's the best option for 99.9% .9 of things. But, you know, there's going to be a time when, um, obviously, uh, Rad Studio is, is not the best choice. But there's few and far between. And that's what this uh, methodology and results in this white paper were designed to do, to show you that there, there wasn't any um, trickery to try and... Um, um, make things look better than they really were. It's all open. Who fought? Who competed in this in this competitive analysis? Well, Rad Studio with Delphi and uh, some Microsoft.net using WPF, which is probably one of the most popular frameworks out there, and still very popular and very credible. Credible. We, you know, there wasn't. Uh, um, we didn't choose a horrible, <laughs> useless uh, type of technology for creating apps. And Electron, which uh, I, I'm not a big fan of myself. And these were the three technologies that were, were chosen. Okay, The people that we got to do it were not slackers either. The programmers there for the Red Studio with Delphi, we chose um, MVPs. I was one of them. And I never claimed to be the world's best programmer. I'm just a programmer. I get up every day and I write code for a living. That's what I do. But um, there are... There are other people out there who are MVPs who I think are very, very smart, and some of those were involved as well. Um, and the same with the .NET people. We hired some contractors, or Embarcadero hired some contractors, who, again, were not slackers. They were not um, useless people. We deliberately chose weak um, developers to make things look good. No, these were people that were earning a living writing code. And the same with Electron as well. They were, they were proper developers. It was a, it was a fair contest. Um, and let's be clear, the, the frameworks were chosen not, be chosen not because they were lame or obscure or um, something weird like Haskell, <coughs> which is a, um, you know, it's kind of obscure language. No, quite the opposite. They were chosen because they are popular and widely used, broadly used by lots of people. And they're current. They weren't, we didn't pick on something that was out of date. WPF is... is um, largely deprecated I think um, to some extent by Microsoft but actually it's still actively available and actively used by thousands and thousands hundreds of thousands of people same with Electron there are lots of apps out there you're probably using one uh, on your machine and not even knowing it it's a great framework for achieving what it wants to achieve but we believe there are better options um, it's got some deficiencies it used to have some real problems with memory for example so um, you know they're not they're not terrible obscure frameworks they are the top ones that you can get around to produce apps and you know we could choose experienced developers we didn't pick one that um, only six or seven people in the world can use no the we, we, we chose a framework where your average good developer would be someone who was well experienced to use that and uh, there were a choice of challenges. I was only in, involved in one of them, and that's the one I'm going to talk about. I forget what the other two were, to be honest, but I think there was like a, a file manager type app and an XML parser. I, I honestly can't remember, but the, the, the white paper um, explains them. And then the third one that I was involved in was um, to recreate the Windows Calculator app. Now, uh, recreating the Windows Calculator app, we all know what it looks like. We've seen it everywhere. It's on every version of Windows there is. It sounded easy to me. It's not a difficult app. And because I'm very lazy, I mean very busy, um, it sounded ideal. I had plenty of time. And the requirement was to pick a framework of our choice, VCL or FireMonkey FMX, if you're a developer using Delphi, and encode the app in that framework as quickly and as accurately as you possibly can. So I had to think about this. Then I had a really dumb app. Uh, Smart idea. If I planned the app out correctly, I could create multiple versions from the same code base. And that's what Delphi is really good at. That's what it's all about. Have one project and you can produce uh, apps that go to different targets. And if I could write one app, then why, why not write eight? You know, iOS, Android and all the rest of it. And in fact, why write one app when I could actually write nine? 
So I decided to really take advantage of Delphi. I decided I would write a plain VCL app, just what you can do with the VCL straight out of the box without any extra trickery, any components or anything like that. I would produce a Fluent UI app, also using the VCL. Again, no trickery, a set of components, but nevertheless, um, just some straightforward uh, code to produce it. And uh, a FireMonkey app, again, for Windows and 32, 64-bit. I didn't count those separately. I suppose there's an extra you know, four or five apps there as well. Um, Mac OS, iOS, and Android, because really there isn't doing anything particularly difficult. It's showing some buttons on the screen uh, in whatever your chosen um, UI framework is and making some clicky stuff happen. And whilst I was doing that, well, if I took advantage of some of the components that are available to Delphi, then I could produce a conventional web app, just a normal web page that would act just like the calculator, look like the calculator, except it would be a web page. And while I was doing that, um, with this using the same framework, which I'll talk about in a minute, I may as well produce a progressive web app. So you can download it to your mobile device and be offline and still use that calculator, even though it's a web page. Why not? If you can do one, you may as well do the other. Oh, and uh, I thought, well, if I can do that, I may as well choose an Electron app. Written in Delphi, just because I'm mean. And yes, I targeted Electron as well. I know one of the competing frameworks was Electron, but I thought, well, let's write a Delphi app and target Electron at the same time using the same code, just to really, really um, dig people in the ribs, shall we say. Picking the frameworks. Well, VCL is dead easy, so we can just use the default controls. There's, there's absolutely no, no thought required there. All the controls we could possibly need would be available. Uh, FireMonkey is similarly powerful. And uh, again, any effects that I wanted to do, I could do in FireMonkey at the drop of a hat. It wasn't difficult. Um, for the Fluent UI version, that's a bit more complicated. If you've watched some of my webinars about the Fluent UI, then you'll know that there's a lot of additional stuff that goes on with the Fluent UI that isn't always obvious. And so I chose the style controls from our media dev. It's also the people behind the uh, Delphi um, themes and styles. Um, but if you go to there, you can see the controls I use. If you want to download the example app, and this is available on the, uh, the net, I'll talk about this later, then you will need to install the trial version of the Fluent UI if you're going to open the Fluent UI and see what I did there. And for all the web types, all the web app types, and that is a conventional web app, a PWA, and uh, also the Electron app, I use the TMS uh, WebCore framework, web.tmssoftware.com. Um, fairly easy, so a little bit of extra help from components, because that's what we do. Um, Delphi and Rad Studio is a component-based uh, development system, and that's what makes it low-code as well, so I don't have to write lots and lots of code. If I wanted to target the very different user interfaces, then it's vital that the UI, the user interface, the bit that people see and touch, um, is completely separated from the actual implementation of the actual calculator code behind the scenes. What that meant was that I don't want to have all the actual business logic. What happens when you press uh, the subtract button, for example, um, that shouldn't be bound into the user interface. So in, in the traditional sense, shouldn't double click on the button that says um, uh, multiply or, uh, or the asterisk actually, uh, and then put the code in there to do the, the multiplication. No, you should have some form of event or in my case, um, a controller that would do that. And the other thing to be careful of is that VCL, FireMonkey and web apps have very different properties and event models. So what would work for the VCL wouldn't necessarily work for, for the FireMonkey code unmodified. And the same with the web apps. When you trigger things to happen on the web apps, web apps are by uh, their nature asynchronous. So you click something, you haven't got a guaranteed, uh, you know, inline response. You sometimes have to wait for a response back from from the uh, the browser. So those are the kind of things that had to go into what I was going to do um, with coding. Yeah, simple calculator app, but there's a few little gotchas in there. The obvious choice was to enforce the separation of the UI and calculation code itself by creating an uh, using an I interface. And so that would mean that I would have a form, which would be the VCL form, the FMX form, the HTML form or whatever. And then uh, an I calculator interface that that VCL form would interact with through the type of a controller. So it's like a model view controller, but it's not. Uh, but there would be a controller that uh, only interacted with the interface. 
the I interface, the I calculator. And then uh, back behind there would be the implementation of the T calculator, the concrete class, shall we say. So what does the interface itself look like? Well, the interface allows us to write the URL code so we don't use a concrete implementation, as it's called. And I had a look at the different functions on a calculator, and uh, the Windows calculator in particular. So what can you do? Well, this is how we think about abstraction of the, uh, the real-world objects. There's some operators, and the operators do things to uh, the, the numbers that you see on the screen. And when those operators are pressed, then we need to know what type of operator it is. So are they pressing the percentage button? Are they presenting, uh, pressing the divide button, the multiply button, the subtract, or the add button? And then you've got the number buttons. So if I press the number one, then the number one should appear on the screen. And if I press it again, then it's 11. And if I press a zero, then it's 110. And so there was some logic behind there to say, people don't just type in the number like they do in an edit box and then hit calculate. No, you actually press those buttons and they build up the number. That was a little bit of a, a conceptual thing we had to think about. And a few other things as well, like I would need to actually set the calculator display and that would need me to have a callback um, because what we can't do is have the class directly updating the user interface uh, controls because if you remember I want to try and reuse the back end code for the front end uh, implementation to be different so I couldn't say for example that the display was an edit box or a label because on the fire monkey it could be a different control altogether and on the web apps then it could be once again a different uh, control altogether it could be a panel with the caption or it could be a region or something like that so i needed to have a callback and what would happen is that the actual user interface when um, it instantiated the object, the I calculator interface, it would pass over this callback and say, when something happens, tell me through this particular method. And I'll talk about that in a moment. And that would then say, oh, here's some information that you need to update, ping. When it was time for the calculator to update its display, it would trigger that event back on the user interface and we would get the display updating. Oh, and there was a history function you can do, you know, how you can do um, R for recall history and all this. Those functions needed to be in there as well. The I calculator interface defines the actions that the user can initiate. So addition, subtraction, display the total and maintain the history, as I just said. Implementing the I calculator interface is the T calculator class. Now, the T calculator class is, uh, in terms of jargon, is what we call a concrete class. So as you can see at the top there, where it says T calculator equals class, it is a T interfaced object, and it is implementing the I calculator interface. So what it means is that we agreed to the contract that we're laying out in that, that I calculator interface, and we're saying that we will implement all of the required methods and events that the I calculator interface uh, specifies in our concrete class. And on the left there, you can't see it very large at the moment, but if you download the um, example actually, you'll be able to see it. But you can see there a little bit of the implementation of the uh, T-Calculator class. So if I have the, someone press the equals button, then what I need to do is actually I perform the calculation. So uh, 10 plus 11 equals 21. And I need to work out that it's 21 when someone presses the equal button. So if you can see on the left-hand side uh, where it says equals press, that's that's where that comes up. So really, T calculator class is doing that implementation of that interface. Updating the display. Well, as I said earlier on, this is a little because um, web apps, they're asynchronous. And also it's good practice that you never have your um, business logic directly updating the UI because it means if I do it properly, which I did in this app, I can then implement the user interface um, separately and have it completely different for each of the apps. Uh, so the performance of that is controlled by a controller and the controller is the thing that sets everything up and says, hi, I'm going to have this callback and uh, whenever you need to update my display, just uh, call my callback and let me know. So it's, uh, it's triggered in a way that's um, friendly for the web, friendly for um, FireMonkey and it's friendly for VCL. You could implement that as something completely different. Um, it would still work as long as you could actually handle the callbacks um, 
what you do in that callback that update display is up to you so as you can see there on the bottom left history label dot caption is uh, just going to display the contents of the property of the F calculator control history um, easy peasy there were some subtleties actually in the implementation of the calculator if you look at the genuine calculator app it's actually very slightly transparent and I am you know, at the time I wrote this app I think it was Windows 10 was the common uh, operating system because it was a couple of years back and uh, this is carried through even more for Windows 11 and uh, so you could have this semi-transparency also if you clicked on the buttons um, the buttons actually flashed they were giving you what's known as affordance to show you that they were clickable and also giving you some feedback to say that you'd actually click them so that you didn't just blindly go did that work uh, when I click that button so it, it flashes um, so a couple of things I needed to implement there was what would happen if someone clicks away from the app and so the app loses focus that would then change the transparency and make it opaque so that you couldn't see through it that is Windows behavior for um, fluent UI actually and uh, UI 3 is carried on today and uh, and also needed to implement what would happen when people clicked on those buttons to make those buttons flash because how they flash on a VCL and how they flash on FireMonkey and how they flash on um, Fluent UI and how they flash on web is all completely different each one was different now all of that behavior really is entirely cosmetic it doesn't affect how the calculus to actually calculate in the background and so to handle that now if I was doing uh, model view view model um, I would actually have the the view model deal with all of the uh, behavior of the user interface and do an even more nicely separated abstract uh, but actually uh, that's not the case with this particular app we didn't um, do this this was done much more quickly than I would have liked and I should have gone and sat down and had to think about this and I'll do it that way but actually implementing that way I did separated the user interface quite nicely but didn't make it overly complicated so we allowed the form to do the things like updating the panels and doing all that that flashing and so as you can see there um, on the form deactivate um, option there's an alpha blend that says false and so I'm turning off the alpha blending on the app which is a property on the actual app itself and when the app gets the focus again uh, when the form is activated then the alpha blend is turned on so that controls the transparency that's how uh, that works um, every framework was diverse so web buttons would work very differently to native buttons this meant there was no obvious advantage in uh, creating this generic uh, visual control I probably would have had to have had a couple of different controllers uh, and double the work it was uh, it was not something I really want to do subtleties of the implementation um, well all I had to do was really create the main form for the project if you were to implement fully the main calculator in Windows 11 it's it's actually grown to be something a lot more I'm not sure if you know but the Windows 11 calculator is capable of doing date calculations for example um, so you know it's something that we you don't notice uh, until someone points it out and they think oh that's very useful so you can actually say um, what is 65 days from today and uh, the Windows calculator can do that but we were told to only very specifically focus on the functionality of the regular calculator I didn't do the scientific version neither did anybody else as far as I'm aware um, but that's another view that the Windows calculator and Windows 11 supports Windows 10 uh, not quite the same this was early on in the cycle for Windows 10 and still that calculator was almost unchanged from the days of XP a little bit more fancy but um, not that much difference so creating the main form was wasn't that difficult and the interface controlling the class would do all the other hard stuff in the background what would happen when those buttons are pressed now um, for the VCL weirdly enough I discovered that the best way to um, replicate the behavior of the Windows buttons was to use panel controls <laughs> now I know that sounds counterintuitive um, but the panel controls actually would then be able to do that flashing that you saw if I did it with a button the problem with the button is it's actually a proper Windows button uh, the T button is, is is designed to be a button has got lots of additional behavior that you didn't actually want for the calculator app I know it sounds crazy like well it's a button well yeah maybe a button but a button is just at the end of the day something that you click and so I use panel controls for the buttons weird but true 
Um, the timer that you see on that form there was to help with the uh, flashing. So it would flash and then the timer would kick in after I think a quarter of a second or something like that and unflash. Not that fancy, but it worked. Uh, subtleties of the implementation. Well, this uh, is the Fluent UI version, and the Fluent UI version uh, uses these our media uh, Fluent UI controls. And uh, when you look at it, uh, which you'll see shortly, it looks like the real thing. It's just an exact copy of the Windows uh, calculator. It's very, very good. And uh, also the the uh, web core version, same project. The code in the background was exactly the same. And uh, once I'd written that and laid it out as I had there, again with, I think these are regions I used or something like that, rather than panels. But once I'd laid out the user interface, um, I had a working pure HTML web app that worked in any web browser and would be served up by any web server. Um, so Apache or Nginx or whatever, you pick one and uh, you know your, your local hosting company can host it. And uh, because of the way their framework works, it meant I could also click the button and say, yes, I would like a progressive web app as well, a PWA. And, uh, and it also supported that um, out of the box. So that was a couple of clicks once I'd written the original app. I think the time to produce the PWA, including me reading the documentation to see how I'd do it, uh, make sure there weren't any catches, was about five minutes. It was literally re re compile and off you go. The Electron app, well, <laughs> bear in mind that we were pitted against, or shall I say, matched against um, WPF and Electron programmers. I thought, well, if I'm going to do all these apps, once I've done the original web page app and I've done the PWA, why not do an Electron app? Because an Electron app at the end of the day is basically a Node.js um, web browser I suppose uh, with um, some JavaScript in the background and some web pages and the good thing about that is that there's a little checkbox in the uh, TMS web core again and where you can pick the target and say I'd like to target an electron app so I thought just to be really really horrible um, let's take all our existing Delphi code and hit a button and produce an electron app the time to produce an electron app was again about two to five minutes um, it literally was recompile and boof up it came no difficulties, no playing around with any special settings. Uh, I'd never really tried it before. I think I tried doing an Electron app before um, with WebCore just to see what happened. But uh, no special skills. I just used my Delphi skills and off it went. Uh, it was a in interesting experience, but I just wanted to do it just to be mean to the Electron people. There's nothing wrong with the Electron guys. It's just, you know, if you're going to... Um, if you're going to uh, take revenge and uh, show off, why not? Um, and this was a competition, don't forget. So the way it worked was um, each developer was timed. We were given a certain proportion of time to do some research. And then we could pick, uh, and I didn't know this at the time, actually, but we could have picked a ready-made um, calculator back end um, to use because that was one of the options that I didn't notice. Um, I personally wrote my own. And uh, in fact... Um, there was a bug in it, and I can't remember what the bug was, but I think it was like square roots or something didn't work. Might have been factorials or something. There was some some weird function that didn't work. Um, but but the principle was, you know, could you create this app and could it work? Yes, it could. Uh, I know that um, one of the other MVPs had a, a calculator um, uh, module that he'd already um, used before, and he used that. <laughs> But there was nothing to stop anybody else doing that. The, the rules were quite clear. Um, but you were timed. And so there were two times. One was how long would it take you going slowly, doing a lot of research and all the rest of it. And once you'd done that research, um, could you do a speed run? And the speed run was, now that you've got all the notes laid out and all the rest of it, um, could you go as quickly as possible and produce the app? And it was really like having some um, ready-made notes from a... Um, a project manager or something like that saying here's how to lay out the screens here's the sections of codes that you need and, and off you go and do it um, the results of the work of the developers were objectively measured and in fact the white paper goes into quite a lot of detail about how it objectively measures it um, and what the criteria were they used um, agnostic criteria um, to uh, 
measure the app. Uh, they wanted to make sure that the criteria they chose were fair. So if there was a specific disadvantage or slowness in a particular area, they didn't want to make it um, artificially penalising people. Um, I don't know quite how they did it, but if you read through the, the white paper, it explains it. And the met metrics that they measured include the length of time to develop it, uh, the design approach that you used, the total lines of code that you wrote, and the lines of code that you used to implement the user interface. And the idea was to say, look, if we look at these and we measure these different work approaches and these different frameworks, where's the slow bit? You know, is it really, really slow to design the user interface of a Delphi app, but really, really quick to make the back end of it work? Or is it the other way around? Is actually doing the build, the final process to produce a, um, an artifact or an executable or, or a HTML or whatever it is, is that also the very, very slow part? So can you do everything else and design the, the actual user interface very quickly? Um, but there's a bottleneck when you actually come to um, output that, that, that thing as a real product. It was, it was very comprehensive. I forget how many pages the white paper's got, but it's a lot. And, you know, how do we do? Well, the Delphi developers absolutely crushed it. And there was more than one of us. And that helped to even out different people's skills. I've got a lot of skills in user interface design and things like that. And some of the others were much more um, technical, but the user interface uh, design was not their strong point. Um, and some people were all rounders and, you know, make me and anybody else look uh, awful. Uh, but that's a good thing. You know, we want a blend of people with different skills. I consider myself to be reasonably competent. That's why I'm, I'm an MVP. Um, but even so, I wouldn't say I was the absolute rocket scientist amongst the people that were there, and that's that's a good thing. Um, no good if our rocket scientist developers can do better than uh, average other programmers, and that's that's a good thing. They chose multiple WPF people and multiple Electron people. Um, but if you look at the grading there, Delphi was way ahead. I mean, streets ahead on almost every single metric. Not all of them. Um, you know, let's let's be clear on this. The um, Electron people on the speed run, which was where they had ready made stuff and bolted the thing together, they they whooped us uh, completely. Okay, but uh, the actual development time in the first place, we whooped them, and by a significant proportion of time, uh, Electron took ten hours, and um, uh, we took oh, an average of four point six hours to do the development so this wasn't a short project but it was a full calculator i don't know how long microsoft took to develop theirs um probably just as long i don't know if they used wpf i've never really checked but you know it uh, it was one of those things um electron did better uh than wpf but it still came second and second if you look at those numbers by a significant amount as well in some places the weirdest surprise for me, <clears throat> and that is that WPF lost on every single metric. And uh, that's very odd because WPF is extremely popular. It's been ruling the roost for many, many years. It's been out for uh, since 1990 something. And um, yeah, it's very widely used. And I, I would have thought that um, <clears throat> experienced WPF developers, of which there are many, many people, would be able to produce an app um you know more quickly and bolt things together but actually the proof of the pudding was in the eating when we analyzed all the things that went on um delphi and electron were both way quicker than uh, wpf for the development time the overall development time um, the wpf people took 30 hours which is quite remarkable um the final speed run um, again, we were significantly faster than WPF, and Electron was faster still. I don't know quite how they did it, but you know they bolted things together, ready-made, so that's good. And um, total lines of code, well, um, Electron actually was less, and that's the JavaScript code to make things happen. Um, but on um, the Delphi code, there, you know, we were half of what WPF needed to make things happen. The user interface code, well. <laughs> Uh, yeah, 72 lines of code to implement the whole user interface. And I don't think I varied that across the many projects that I did. Um, I think they only measured a couple of my projects. I think VCL1 might have been one of them and maybe the PWA app or something like that would be the other one. But even so, my, my lines of code didn't vary very much. And this was an average of all the different uh, developers. Um, Electron, again, um, more than us. 
to implement lines of code for the UI and then WPF well you know three times as much again as Electron so that's a significant uh, increase I don't really uh, I don't really understand why but what can you say and a percentage of code that was UI code uh, for Delphi was 18 percent which means we're doing less work to make things appear on screen which you could, would kind of expect um, from a framework where you literally draw the screens <laughs> on the form and off you go um, didn't take into account obviously the runtime library but then they didn't do that with Electron either with all of the uh, the uh, components that they pulled in but did you notice one particular thing Electron took 10 hours to develop uh, 10 hours and that was quite amazing because after I produced my TMS web core HTML version which probably took me about an hour of fiddling around and making um, you know uh, navigation work properly to the actual app in the first place making things click because I had to work it out and you know make those panels work correctly uh, once that was done it took me less than five minutes to create the Electron version I think it was two or three minutes um, hit a button and boom it worked uh, I didn't actually do anything I just compiled it and ran it uh, under five minutes to create an Electron version which is, is uh, uh, you know I think that if I was an Electron person, then I would be looking at uh, Delphi and saying, how come we are so quick um, to produce those Electron apps? It was, it was a creditable app. It worked. Anyway, to read more information, to read uh, more about the research for this uh, particular um, project, then download the white paper. If you go to the link that you see on the screen there, lp.embarcadero.com forward slash discovering the best framework. Um, or just go onto the Embargadero site and go to resources and the white papers section is in there. Um, you can read all about it and get the, uh, the the white paper for you. There's also a GitHub repository with the code from the various projects along with other useful materials. So you can see what we did and see how we did it. Pull it apart and say, oh, I would have done it better. If you, you maybe you would have done maybe there are Delphi people there who are going oh Ian you did it completely the wrong way I would have did I've done it this way it would have been much quicker good 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 I'm glad you can say that because and I genuinely mean that because I as I said before I, I never claim to be the world's best programmer I just be, claim to be a programmer I get up every day and write code um, but there are plenty of people out there that are going to be better in some areas and plenty of people that are in better in other areas if you can do better what does that prove that proves that Delphi would have been even quicker in the comparison research. So, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Show us how. And there's also a GitHub repository with all that code there, as I said. Um, so github.com forward slash embarcadero forward slash uh, comparison research. And what was the whole point of this? Well, you know, as I said about Churchill's uh, goose that laid the golden egg and never cackled, um, it's important to recognize that Delphi, with Rad Studio and Delphi, you, you can do almost anything. Go to a Raspberry Pi. You can do that today. There's a solution for it. In fact, it's from TMS, and they also target that with their um, their, their frameworks. Uh, if you want to put it on a cheap Amazon Fire tablet, then just target Android, and it worked just fine. I have a, a tablet behind me now, and it's running some uh, apps that I've written in Delphi. Um, you can target Windows, you can target Mac, uh, OS, Intel and ARM. I have an ARM uh, Mac Mini and it works absolutely fine and so do plenty of other people as well. Um, iOS, it's always been ARM for, for years and years and years but now it's their own Apple Silicon. Uh, and Android again targets uh, all sorts of types of Android devices. Uh, tablets and phablets I think they call them where they're big phones that got all sorts of weird screens and uh, and you're know, very ubiquitous Android phones even target the web as I showed you with the um, the web core things there um, but you could use intraweb you could use UniGUI there are many many options out there for um, targeting web apps and you can do this from a single code base and a project and that's really what this comparison research proved from my point of view that I could write that uh, calculator interface and it would be one set of code and it would work on all those projects that was the easy part of it it's absolutely a fact and of course as I said before it will run and keep on running even if the whole operating system has been upgraded it's the stoicism the reliability the rock-solid doesn't crash 
uh, nature of Delphi apps that they you can run it from a USB memory stick, a thumb drive or whatever you want to call it. You can plug it in and run that app. Nothing needs to be installed. You could just run that app uh, on uh, on the Windows machine. There's lots of security considerations now but um, no frameworks to download the dotnet app no that's not going to happen it will not happen that's the whole point about this and look at comparison research and uh, and you know see what we did some of the tricks and tips anyway my name is Ian Barker and I'm an Embarcadero Delphi MVP you can get me at ian.barker at gmail.com follow me on Twitter if it's still around uh, at punctuation or if you want to look at my various websites and things like that, then go to about.me forward slash Ian Barker. The replay will be on the main Embarcadero blog uh, on the same day that this webinar was originally broadcast. So it should be now as I speak. And you can see that on tinyurl.com forward slash Delphi VS competition. Delphi versus the competition. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Well, uh, everybody that was going to be on here has disappeared. So it's just me then, I guess. <laughs> uh, Martha, our producer, is... Uh, ah, there's Jim. I thought, oh, no, I'm on my own. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I was just dealing with messages and emails and stuff and got distracted. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I think some of them are from me as well. Um, I, I, we had a lot of questions. I, I, I want to try and cover a few points because I, I want to make a couple of things clear. Um, this is not an opportunity to bash uh wpf um and it's not here to say electrons awful look how cool we are because actually um the point of this was to try and demonstrate that to, to bring some truth into a conversation about um is delphi any good is delphi worthwhile does delphi compete up there with some of the more popular um frameworks because wpf has obviously got um you know microsoft's big bucks marketing behind it and things like that uh, and this was the whole point of this but it was also to try and demonstrate that uh, the reason I wanted to target multiple platforms and I was not asked to do that I chose to do that and the reason I chose to do that was because this is one of the strengths of Delphi that even if we had taken as long as the Electron people to produce the um, the initial uh, Delphi app I could then with only a few clicks and maybe with a little bit of alterations in the code, target absolutely everything else. Now, .NET can do some of that as well, but it couldn't do all of what it could do, and the, the technology behind that is is a little bit different. So that that was the point that we we were not um, we were not trying to be uh, cruel or or say, hey, look, we're much better than WPF. Throw it out the window. Now we're just trying to emphasize the fact that you know we're up there with those other um, frameworks. Well, and and you know. I will add my philosophy on the subject. A lot of times people are like, oh, uh, Delphi is great because everything else is terrible. I'm like, if the only way you can say you're good is by saying everybody else is terrible, then you're setting the bar really low. <laughs> so yeah. my philosophy is, honestly, there are times I've used WPF before, and there may be times I use WPF again. All right. I'm not saying WPF is terrible, never should be used. But is like Ian was saying before, right, is for most use cases, Delphi is the best choice. And so our goal was to show, hey, Electron's good. This is how you do Electron. This is how much time it's going to cost. These are the pros and cons. WPF's good. These are the pros and cons of WPF. Here's where Delphi fits in here. And look, you know, it's, it's overall better. It has some pros and some cons. But here are the advantages of using Delphi. Because... Um, it's one of those things that a lot of people just get some idea in their mind, you know, when you have, um, you know, electrons new and exciting and WPF has got a lot of marketing behind it and you people get an idea in their mind, like that's the only choice. It's like, no, there are other choices and here are the pros and cons of making those choices. Yeah, abs absolutely. And, and that was the thing that, you know, when we talk about these comparison research, it, it just... It, uh, too many people just think, oh, they're just trying to bash the opposition, and that's not the case. We're trying to emphasize that we picked frameworks we knew were capable. We knew that they're used by other people. So we wanted to be compared against a good framework, uh, you know, a good language that is in uh, use so that we can say, 
we're here with the others. We're, we're, we're not some kind of, you know, Cinderella language that is esoteric and hard to use. No, we're trying to emphasize that Delphi is the solution for lots of things. Um, I want to go through some of the questions because um, I know we're probably going to have quite a lot of time left over later, but I'd like to address some of the questions. Um, so uh, this one was uh, kind of amusing. Stop fight is already one. Microsoft deprecates too much. Well, you're, you're being nice there. But actually, our serious point about that is the fact that actually Delphi code from, um, you know, uh, even the days of Delphi 7 or even Delphi 4 or 5 um, will still run almost unchanged in Delphi 11. Now, actually, that is one of the things that M Marcadero goes out of its way to try and do is to preserve, um, as, well, as far as possible, uh, preserve the ability for old Delphi code to be upgraded and run in a later um, version of Delphi. And Microsoft have a different ethos when it comes to some of their um, technologies, and, um, and Google also do that. And that is that many of these people do go off and, and deprecate some of their frameworks. That's their decision. That's how they do things. Backward um, compatibility is not always possible, I think, in what they do, but also it's it's not how they think about things. Whereas Embarcadero with Rad Studio actually tries to um, think about um, bringing along all of that legacy code and not breaking it if at all possible. Sometimes you can't help it. It has to happen. But that, yeah, that 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 is one of the, the things that we can say there. Uh, fight is also one. Uh, it is a, it is a it is pros and cons to that, actually, backwards compatibility. And I've been involved in lots of conversations at a number of different projects and companies and stuff about, you know, how to deprecate things, how to move forward, you know, how much, how important is backwards compatibility? Yeah. I, I, I feel like Embarcadero really goes out of their way to make it as backwards compatible as possible, and, which I think is a good thing because it is, you know, um, you have, I guess you have an investment in your code and it's nice that they respect that. So, and some, some projects that people have in Delphi that are, are quite intricate, they're banking apps or something like that, and may have millions of lines of code. And, uh, you, you know, if you suddenly get an announcement from Microsoft that your, your whole framework is being pulled from underneath you. And oh, by the way, you've got to recode all these bits because we've changed something. And um, that's a significant decision um, point for you in terms of what are you going to do. And this is sometimes why some people abandon projects and move on and try and recode them. And uh, I see, sometimes see that with Delphi projects saying, oh, we're going to go and we should go and use some new, um, you know, .NET framework or some, you know, something like that. And I think, you know, I don't know why you're doing that because you, 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 you're, you're going down a path that might end up being a bit of a blind alley, I think. Um, so, yeah, so, uh, so actually also from uh, Sky Buck Flying, who actually is a, is a, does a lot of comments. <laughs> um, calculator is hard. Need compiler tech to be able to decode, interpret the formulas as an example. Well, actually, do you know what? Uh, one of the um, uh, Delphi MVPs did actually use the eval <laughs> function, which I completely forgot about. And uh, and I did everything the hard way. And actually, there were bugs in my program. And I was penalized um, on my scores for the bugs. But they were fairly minor. But it was to do with the um, calculating some square roots and things like that, I think, or something like that. Um, but I made up for it in every other direction. So there you go. Um, what else have we got? Um, yeah. Cledison Meyer, or Meyer Cledison, not sure, um, said they love it, IntraWeb. I didn't use IntraWeb um, for the uh, web part of it um, because I wanted to uh, be able to target more than just a set of web pages. I, I did a VCL project, did a FireMonkey project, and because I knew what the there was a nice, clearly defined task, I was able to design that back-end uh, interfaced object and then I could reuse that in VCL or FMX without having the user interface uh, get in the way, so passing objects and things like that. Um, but because of that, I could also do the same thing with the Timis web core project. Um, I could have done it with interweb, but it's actually slightly different. Interweb is just a little bit more uh, involved in what I would want to do. But by using Timis web core, I could then say, well, okay, here's a proper web app, a set of web pages, and now I'll click a a little checkbox in my compiler, and 
within two to five minutes, I was able to then target Electron because that's the strength of that. Now, the reason I did that and the reason I use the Fluent UI um, uh, components as well was as someone said, oh, well, you're just throwing money at it. And again, Sky Buck flying, who's uh, uh, dominating the comments, but I'm glad you're doing it. Uh, oh, so you were allowed to throw money at it. Actually, no, that's not what I tried to do. What I tried to demonstrate is that the power of Delphi is, first of all, that it can target lots of things straight out of the box. But secondly, that there's a rich ecosystem of components that if I just drop those on, it does 90% of the hard work for me in terms of the fluent UI. So I was trying to emphasize that we can um, make things look really good without writing lots of code. And yes, if I paid, you know, $100 or whatever the fluent UI pro, um, components cost, um, I would suddenly have a fluent UI app, UI app. Now, if you extend that out into a real world application that you want to make lots of money out of a commercial application rather than the test as this was the fluent ui pro, um, components or indeed any of our component vendors any of the tech partners can make your work a lot easier to do and, and a lot less difficult uh, so one thing well, also I, that we did it was uh it looked at like the cost and the hours both because the reality is Time is money. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah. Um, you know, if you use uh, some components, right, your cost goes up, but it possibly reduces your time. And so there's a trade off there in that. Yeah. And, and then, in fact, I only did those additional projects just to demonstrate uh, and make a point uh, about being able to target absolutely everything. Um, the ones that were judged, I think, were the VCL and FireMonkey. I'm not sure, I'm not quite sure. Um, but why did I do the web apps? No, it wasn't a requirement. I just wanted to do it because I wanted to make an absolute point that Delphi is incredibly powerful. And uh, and uh, an average programmer like myself can target absolutely everything with not a massive amount of skill sets um, required. Uh, I'm, I'm not, okay, I'm an MVP, so I know a thing or two, but even so, there are plenty of people out there much better programmers than me, and it, you could do it you know, very easily. Uh, and someone, this is a kind of off topic question, but related. So if a random person would want to present a project in the future, um, what would we need to do? Con contact Jim and or contact me. Um, and it, if you've got something to um, present, this goes back to the enterprise um, articles as well. If you've got a success story or you want to um, demonstrate a technique, particularly if it's a unique one or, or something that shows the power of Delphi, um, get in touch and uh, and we'll see what we can do because we always want to talk about the benefits of Delphi because that's really what we're here for is to try and illustrate that um, you know the power of the language and the power of Rad Studio and C++ Builder although this is DelphiCon C++ Builder is also very much um, part of that that uh, Rad Studio oeuvre as the word would be and uh, you know, if you've got something that's, that, that demonstrates the product, don't just rely on MVPs like me or or other people like that. Yes, regular people, just get in touch. You're just normal programmers and, hey, you know, you, I, I'm admirable. <laughs> but uh, uh, no, normal programmers, regular programmers, just get in touch. And if you've got something that you want to demonstrate, by all means, if, if it's a good idea, as I've said before, a good idea is a good idea and people are not going to necessarily tend to that. There are some complications about timing and things like that. So. Uh, you know, but get in touch. Um, I think that was all the questions I starred. Um, the others were really about, you know, why web apps and stuff like that, just because I could and because I knew Electron was part of it. So why not take all my Delphi code and hit a button and out comes an Electron app. I don't know anything about Electron apart from how it works. Uh, I didn't write one single line of code um, for, in Node.js or anything like that. I hit a button the Delphi compiler produced an Electron app for me. So uh, that was kind of nice. So that was pretty good. Um, what else? Have we got any other questions? I want to add a comment, actually. There was, I was talking to another MVP a while back, and he was hired to build an Android app for a project. And he, uh, the, the nature of it, it was because of connecting all these different services and stuff like that. But he was shipping them, he had these regular meetings with the team, and he was shipping them a Windows application that they were running to interact with and stuff like that. And they'd hired another team to build the Windows application, and he was just hired to build the Android application. And all of a sudden someone goes, wait a second, this is running on Windows, right? And he's like, yeah. 
It's because it's easier to demo for a meeting on Windows. Yeah. And like, we, we hired another team to build the Windows application and they're behind schedule. Can you do the Windows application? He's like, yeah, it's almost already done. <laughs> and, and that's the one of the beauties of it is that, you know, there is there are some nuances to each platform. Um, I You know, it, we like to say it's, you know, click, compile and run. There's always nuances, just different behaviors and stuff like that you mm -hmm. want to take into account. Which the, Delphi the problem, makes easy to do, but it, it is that easy to just add a new platform. The most difficult conversation I have with, with product owners is they've got a desktop app and they say, I understand with Delphi you can target FireMonkey and uh, and uh, so can you turn this into an iOS app? <laughs> uh, and I then try and explain that you've got you know maybe a 2K screen with lots of real estate and now you're going down to a device this large and yeah, you could do that, but um, no, it's not as simple as that. The the desktop metaphor, whether it's Linux, whether it's uh, um, uh, Mac OS or Windows, is not the same as a mobile device. And I think that um, most of the people watching the stream will get that and understand that. But uh, product owners or people who are looking to um, diversify and have some, some apps written just don't really um, always appreciate that. And, and I did uh, show that comment that good programmers are definitely not normal. No, I, I think that's important not to be normal. <laughs> We're all a bit crazy, really. A bit crazy? Yeah, definitely, for sure. I think also, uh, joking aside, you know, programming does, um, or software development, does actually um, attract a certain character of people. Um, it is odd to sit in a room all day and just uh, spill your brain onto the uh, computer I know writers do that as well, and I'm a writer as well, so I guess I'm doubly cursed. But, uh, yeah, it's odd. But, I mean, that's the same as saying, you know, a, a movie star is an odd kind of personality because they have to be in order to be able to do that job. They've got to be able to remember lots of lines and pretend to be other people all day long, and that's got to make you a bit weird, right? So, you know, yep. it's one of those things. Well, we're out of time here. It looks like yeah. it's time for the next session. So... Thank you, Ian, for your session and all you do. I've, you've been involved a lot here in DelphiCon helping out, especially yesterday I had some technical issues. So thank, no you, thank you for that. I'm going to go off and have lunch now. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Coming up next, we have Evolution of Fast VCL Cool Feature Highlights with Dennis Zubov. Um, we are we, they're, we're having some issues with video. You may have noticed with Ian's session. Um, Hopefully, we're going to get that resolved, but if things are a little spotty, we're working on it. And we've contacted the uh, streaming platform. They're working on it as well. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, get started. Today, we will talk about interesting features from the releases of Fast Report VCL that happened in recent years. You will learn about the new features of our report designer and preview, which will allow you to create reports even faster. There's a new dynamic table component and features for fast creation of reports from code. You'll see how to include ready-made documents into a report using the new HTML view and PDF view objects, how to use hyperlinks for uploading data to a report and connecting it to cloud services. What are the new interactive objects, a list, and drop-down list on the report page 4? You'll hear about new features of the report engine and much more. Fast Report VCL is a set of VCL components for generating reports and documents. It provides a visual template designer, ability to use the most popular data sources, a reporting engine, preview export filters to more than 30 formats, and deployment to cloud services web, email, and print. Let's begin with a look of the recent designer improvements. We've added filtration to the data tree tabs, variables, and functions, so, so you can find all the necessary data fields and expressions with ease. It's now possible to hide all panels in data tree. Also, it's possible to use filters in the report tree, which contains report objects, which results in an improved searching experience. We've also added 
an advanced search system for the designer itself. With the new enhancements of the report designer, the speed and convenience of report template development goes to the next level. The improved search and replace function in the report designer allows to affect text in string properties, object names, object's content, and in the script code. Your search results will be displayed as a tree, which is quite easy to navigate. The text replacement system in the designer has been improved. So, as you can see, the replacement by searched elements is simple and clear. In this demonstration, we are finding all occurrences of award sales and bulk replacing them with new sales, which gets us 16 results. Editing of dialog pages in the reports becomes easier with the addition of guideline support. In this demonstration, you can see the vertical guidelines being used in a dialog form. Support for automatic guides has been added. You can click on the button in the upper left corner of the sheet to display all auto guides, only horizontal or only vertical ones. This allows you to align objects faster and more efficiently. We have expanded the possibilities of editing reports and searching for errors in them. The new Object Intersection Highlight mode allows you to localize problematic errors in your report template and prepare the report for correct output in exports with tabular representation, RTF, XLS and others. Just enable the new mode to see all the intersecting objects. In a case when a property's value differs from its default value, the object inspector will display it in a highlighted manner. This allows for a better control of changes in the report. Potentially very important properties that were edited become easy to spot. There's a new tab in the object inspector. Favorites, in which you can add the most used properties for a quicker access. You can quickly add and remove comments using the hotkeys Ctrl and forward slash. Now you can quickly add variables to the watch list through context menu and hotkeys. There are new pop-up tips and step-by-step -step debugging modes, step over and run until return. A dynamic table is a set of objects that is filled in during the formation process based on the received data and then divided into pages in the report. Here you can see the dynamic table builder for the table object. It allows building tabular reports from code or from the report script. It automatically slices and paginates the table based on how much it grows down and to the right. Building dynamic reports with a variable amount of rows and columns is now simpler than before. Multiple build modes are supported for dynamic pages. For example, a cross and down works this way, as the demonstration shows. And with the down and across mode, uh, the table will look like that. The table builder supports fixed rows and columns, which get printed with every new part of the table. 
So here's the piece of the code that uh, fixes the header. And here's an example of a table with fixed headers, which we will, of course, reprint on break. We've added a new report object called HTML view. Here you can see it in action. It's already added into report and basically behaves like a regular uh, set of text objects. You can see all the HTML markup. And uh, this is how you include the fields from a data source into a HTML view component. There's a preview of it. And here's how a table built exclusively with this component works and looks. And it can be exported into all the regular formats that FastReport VCL supports. Next, let's look at the dynamic height support in HTML view. HTML view supports dynamic height with the can grow property and splitting of its content, moving parts of the content to new pages. For example, let's uh, take an HTML we already have. Here is all of its markup. Here is how it looks. Next, we open the object inspector, change all the properties that allow this object to grow and split properly. and then preview the report. It looks like this. So one object was uh, displayed this way on multiple pages. And of, course this and of course this report can also be exported. And all text is exported as actual text. So you can uh, copy it in the resulting PDF, for example. The object for displaying HTML in the report TFRX HTML view has the ability to cache and save images obtained from external links, file or web protocol. They will be sent directly to the constructed report via the embedded objects property. This increases the independence and speeds up the loading speed of such reports. We've also added a new report object called PDF view. Here's a visual instruction for its usage. Select PDF view in the toolbar, add the object to the template sheet, select the PDF document you want to be displayed, stretch it to the height of the sheet, select the stretching mode, and build the report. So, here we will center the object and stretch it to the entirety of the page. This requires changing several parameters of the object itself and also the band it's placed on. Let's choose the actual height stretching mode for the object. And also stretch and allow split modes for the band. Detail stretch mode should also be set as well. And here's how the preview looks. It consists of 45 pages. So basically the whole PDF document has been converted into a part of our report. 
a new data uploading mechanism has been added. Now you can load data into report objects by hyperlink for map, text, PDF and picture objects. Here you can see the hyperlinks and the data link property of several objects. In this report, basically all the elements were loaded directly from the Internet. It is also possible to use links to the OpenStreetMap API. Use hyperlinks to access the OpenStreetMap API and load data into report objects. So the content of this map was taken directly from the OpenStreetMap. And more than just links. You can do your own protocols and transports. Next feature. You can load data into report objects by hyperlink. Next feature. You can load data into report objects from cloud services using hyperlinks. Configure Box, Google Drive, Dropbox and OneDrive transports for private access to the cloud storage by hyperlinks. And after that, you can load data into report objects from those services. So, we've configured a Dropbox transport. We called it dbbox. And then we can use it as a protocol. Set our authorization data. After that, uh, let's open the designer, add a picture object. And in it we can use this protocol. So type dbox, colon, slash, slash, and then after that a path to some file that you want to use. This particular file was loaded from a private Dropbox storage. There is a new authorization system for Box, Google Drive, Dropbox and OneDrive transports. Now through the default browser. There are new transports for accessing MS Outlook and Gmail mailboxes via the Webmail API. Transports can send and receive reports, as well as receive the result in the form of an exported document. So now you can use MS Outlook and Gmail with FastReport VCL. The authorization dialog for transport was improved. You can save your authorization data in an encrypted form, show or hide authorization fields, and now you have quick access to the configuration page of here's a list of transports that we support at this moment. There are improvements in the way the images are being cached now. We've added an option to check for duplicate images in export filters. The new cache reduces the number of duplicate images and the resulting export size. You can enable this feature using the calculate picture hash property of the export filter. There are two new objects that can be interactive in the preview window, combo box and list box. You can also see on the GIF that everything that happens to these objects can be processed in the report script. There's a new optimizational tool. The new clear empty lines property allows to remove empty instances of text objects. Combined with the can shrink and shift all these properties, this makes it possible to collapse objects with empty values. In this case, the entire tree of objects at the bottom will move up. There's a new stretch mode for the text object. It's called SM Part Max Height. 
breaking objects in this mode uses the hide of each part after breaking with correction applied. This is unlike the SM max height mode, which uses the band's height before the breaking occurs. The digital signature support has been expanded. Multi signature for documents in PDF format. An exported PDF file can be signed with more than one digital certificate. One document, several signatures. Feel free to open as many tabs as you want, because now you can export them all. You can now include all the open preview tabs into one single report. The resulting file will have all the pages from every open tab in order, and the hyperlinks between these pages will be preserved. So as you can see in the demonstration, we are opening a few tabs, and uh, in the exported file, only the hyperlinks that basically led to pages that we've opened, are clickable. In this case, by the way, I would advise you to make them permanently uh, highlighted. So there's a clear visual indication which hyperlinks are clickable. And now to finish the presentation, here's the full list of exports that are currently available in FastReport VCL. There are formats like PDF, Excel and Word documents, an HTML export, several picture exports, TXT export and an export for dot matrix printers, PowerPoint, DBF, ZBL for Zebra printers, and a few more. Thank you for your attention. Feel free to ask any questions. Okay, so Dennis is on to answer questions. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the question panel. Uh, and we'll do our best to get them answered. Um, actually, here's one that's not related to this session. Is the Delphi and a session, AI session going to be rescheduled? Hopefully. At this point, I'm trying to find out if Olaf's been replaced by an AI or what's going on. Uh, I will hopefully get that rescheduled. There is an AI session tomorrow, though, with... Um, so tune in for that one in the meantime, but I will hopefully get that one rescheduled. Dennis, I don't know if you are, um, if you have video, you're welcome to turn it on and join us. If not, we can just have you as the disembodied voice. I'm looking, most of the questions are, oh wait, here's a question. Can fast report save reports in PowerPoint or Excel format? From Sandro. Dennis, are you there? I'm not hearing you, Dennis. If you can type the answer in the chat window, I can uh, relay it. All right, Dennis is working on the uh, his audio issues. Let me just skim the rest of the questions here while I'm waiting for Dennis to come back. Um, Fast Report is, a, I will say, it's one of those great reporting tools. If you're generating reports, uh, definitely take a look at it. <laughs> um, There's another question. Let's see if Dennis comes back here in a second. All right, I'm going to um, uh oh, 
All right. Well, Dennis, if you can um, hear me and see the, the text, if you could just type an answer in the chat box, I will read it off for everybody. And it's not ideal, but at least you'll give us a chance to offer answer questions. So do, can you save to PowerPoint or Excel from fast reports? Uh, he says, yes, you can export to PPTX and Excels and XLS and old XLS format as well. So there are uh, options there for exporting to, to those formats too. Uh, here's a question from Lars. Is FastReport fully thread safe now? Or what do people need to know about thread safety when working with fast reports? Let's see. Uh, yes, it's fully thread safe except dialog forms because we are using adapters to standard VCL forms. Okay, so it is fully thread safe. Uh, can you create multiple reports at the same time in multiple threads uh, to elaborate on that? Um, and someone asked Lars why you'd want to do that. <laughs> um, what about imports from Crystal Reports to Fast Reports? And actually, I saw another question about importing from um, Nirvana's and Rave Reports to Fast Reports. I believe you have some imports, but I can't remember exactly what imports you do have or don't have. So what kind of import options do you have available? Jim said that he believes it can import from Report Builder. Uh, so if, if you could verify that. It says we have reports from Rave, Report Builder, and Quick Report. Okay, great. All those report formats. I was pretty sure that it was, so... Um... Oh, they don't have a converter from Crystal Reports. Okay, so everything but Crystal Reports, it looks like. Let's see here, the comment from Francis. I used Fast Report from early 2000s until 2016. Uh, Multi-page financial reporting with bespoke code for balances and in bank investment accounts, PDS2. That's great. Are there any report types that fast reports cannot do? <laughs> um, in theory, I suppose. I don't know if, if, Dennis, if there's a specific report type that you are aware of that it can't do. I mean, any report types is infinite. <laughs> um, so there could be a new report type that someone just created just now that fast reports can't do yet, but um, hard to say for sure. And here's another question. If you have a city billing where there are thousands of clients each having their own bill, can fast reports create individual PDS for all of them? I believe so. I believe that's what someone else had just said. You should be able to do that where you would just, each one would be, it's, you'd have the same, you'd have the report and then you just run it for each client. Oh, and Lars clarified that the reason he wanted to have multi-threading was that he had printing reports on a server, multiple clients requesting prints at the same time. So Dennis says that you can uh, connect report to your data and click it with the report template. Yeah, so you'd have a report template that would run for multiple rows. 
does fast reports have a FMX version creating a report for Mac OS? So if you want to have fast reports on Mac OS, is there FireMonkey support and Mac OS support? So I went to the Fast Report website, and there is a Fast Report FMX. So it would look like, probably, if you go to, I'll put that up on the screen, Fast Report, Fast-Report.com, says yes, we have FireMonkey version. Currently, only supports Windows OS 10 Linux via FMX Linux. Yeah, so it doesn't doesn't work on mobile devices, but it works on your desktop platforms. I think that's it. So, oops, that's not what I wanted. This is what I wanted. Uh, Francis said. Um, PDF production was a godsend for mailing clients, secure email, awesome reporting software, TMS for more complex dashboards. I think that's it for the questions here, unless I missed something. Let me just skim here again. Looks like, hopefully I got through all the questions. The um, There's a question here. Are there any limitations to add some powered by Delphi by Embarcadero text on our presentation forms? I mean, the form which is shown while the application is loading. There is not a requirement to do that. It's awesome if you do. We appreciate it, but we don't require that you do that. Um, Does what about as far as working with HTML5 code? Can fast reports include HTML code and view HTML code um, in the application or in the reports? So if maybe if you have HTML in the database, something like that that you're pulling out when you're rendering your reports, is that an option? Go out here to the Fast Reports website and see if I see. It looks like there are is support for HTML in Fast Reports. Uh, oh, wait. Oh, only support HTML4 with CSS. Also, you can use HTTP and HTTPS links. Moreover, you can use uh, transports to cloud stores and use links to data on your cloud servers. Okay, so not HTML5, but there is support for HTML4. Okay, uh, Alan says, thank you, Fast Reports is a great product. Yep, it's a fantastic tool. Thank you, Dennis, sorry for the audio problems. I'm not sure what happened. Um, so it's like every year there's always one person that has audio trouble, it seems like. But uh, sorry that it was you this time. And uh, appreciate the, your uh, all you do in fast, for Fast Reports and putting a session together with the updates and more, all the great stuff going on, the new things with Fast Reports. All right, so coming up next, we have a demystifying domain-driven design with Gustavo. We have, it looks like, half an hour. Um, you're welcome, Dennis. He says, thank you. Um, until the next session at 2, 2 p.m. Central Time. Oh, we have an hour and a half. Oh, yes, because we had the AI session disappear on us. So, um, all right.
so I'm going to put, uh, I'll queue up some of our lightning sessions to have, we have right now to fill time in and other videos. Otherwise, we'll see you back in an hour and a half for demystifying domain driven design. So there'll be a gap here, although we have the lightning sessions as well in this time, uh, time slot. Uh, and then we will see you all in an hour and a half. So uh, possibly time to grab some lunch or whatever you need to do. And we'll see you all shortly. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And I hope you're enjoying DelphiCon 2023, celebrating 28 years of Delphi. It's amazing. My name is Ian Barker, and I'm an Embarcadero Delphi MVP. You can get me at ian.barker at gmail.com, follow me on Twitter at at punctuation, or go to about.me forward slash Ian Barker and you can see all my websites. This uh, very quick session is called Quick Look, the Benefits of Windows Services. The slides, the link and the replay will be at tinyurl.com forward slash Delphi QL services. Well, we're going to look at the benefits of Windows services. Windows services are great if you have a use for them. Not every app needs to be a service, but when you do need a service, they're very, very useful. They can run even when the user is logged out, not you know, unlike a normal Windows application. The services, they can run on a server or they can run on a normal regular PC and they can run in the background. You must have come across some things like antivirus uh, software works like that and all sorts of other important services. They're especially useful for activities where you need to run on a server where there are no direct user interactions like a web server um, application or something like that. You can get them to launch automatically when the computer starts. This is the default, or they can be made to launch manually. Um, by default, they can run as a fake user, which is called the service user, but you can override that. You can get it to run as any user on a network or your local system account. Usually when you install on a regular PC rather than a server, it, it will say the local system account, which is you, your login. Um, you can tick on whether you are going to allow the service to interact with the desktop. Most services do have some form of interaction with the desktop to show alerts or something like that, but it just depends. How can we create them with Rad Studio? It's really, really easy. All you need to do is go to File, New, select Windows because we can only create Windows services at the moment in Rad Studio, and then select Windows Service. So options one, two, and three there. There'll be a message that comes up that asks you if you want to use the VCL. The answer is yes, you do. You need to use the VCL for a Windows service. This wizard will create an empty window service. There's nothing in it apart from the bare bones to actually make the service work in the first place. And um, there's some basic functionality that window services need to have to, to allow them to start and stop and pause, which is the kind of functionality that uh, is uh, built into every single service. It's one of the things they need to support, but it doesn't really do much. The key you need to look at is um, the one with the T service class in it. In there, there's some, um, if you actually open up the form and then select the properties and events, you will see that there is an on start, an on stop and on execute, and an on pause event. These are all things that the services can do. The on start is fairly obvious. When it starts up, it executes. On stop, that's when someone stops the service. On execute, that's when it's actually doing something. It's actually running. And the on pause, because you can pause a Windows service. It doesn't have to stop. It can just go into a state where it's uh, not actually doing anything. One of the pro tips I would suggest is you make sure that you change the display name and the actual name of the service. 
And the reason you need to do that is you need to be able to identify those in your uh, um, task manager, in your Windows Service Manager, um, especially when you're debugging. <laughs> it's quite important. Add to the uh, the section where it says Service After Install. If you add the following, which is just a simple registry key entry, and put in a string that says description, and then put in a description of what your service does, this will mean that when you go into the service manager it will explain what your service does you can see a little description there otherwise it's completely blank and it's kind of uh, confusing for people especially if you choose a service name that might look a little bit like a virus someone might be tempted to uninstall your service thinking there's something wrong with it or it's a rogue uh, application so try if you can try and uh, make sure that you include that description on most Windows systems, you need to install the service as an administrator, the Windows administrator, or uh, using the admin prompt on your local PC. If you don't do that, by default on uh, Windows 11 and most most server versions of Windows, you'll get an error message saying that access is denied. It literally means you're, you're not allowed to uh, run the service as a normal user. To overcome that, run it in the administrator command prompt go to Windows, click on Task Manager, select Command Prompt, and then there'll be a thing that says Run as Administrator. Then when you install the service, and you can see the bottom line there, example, windowservice.exe, space, forward slash, install, that will allow you to install your service. If you've got your permissions correct, and you've got, you might have to type in your admin password, um, it'll say service installed successfully. The arguments to the service when you go to run it, which you run from the command line, usually, there's install, uninstall, and then you can add silent as well at the end of it. If you put slash install, space slash silent, then it won't show you lots of dialog boxes and things like that. To start it running manually, uh, once it's installed, because it will be installed but not actually running, you can go to the same command prompt and type in net space start space, and then whatever the name of your service is. You remember we put that in the uh, T service earlier on. Once you do it correctly, when you go into the service manager, you'll be able to see your example service and it should say running. And then at that point, everything's going good. If you do have problems, obviously you need to be able to do some logging. Because it's not a normal user app, you may find that uh, it's quite difficult to actually work out what's going on. So my advice is nearly all services, you need some form of logging. There's some very good logs out there. Logger Pro from um, da Daniel uh, Tetti is very good. Um, Gridy Cloud Logger, is, it's an open source project. Go there and you'll see, but it allows you to literally um, log out to the cloud to a chosen uh, um, target. Uh, very useful. Um, or you can just simply use log message and that will emit to the Windows event log. And there's some arguments there to decide which part of the log it comes out into uh, where how it's flagged whether it's an error or it's information if you're familiar with the windows event log then you'll understand what i'm talking about if you're not go in there and uh, take a look or you can just use output debug string and if you do that it just takes a parameter a string parameter like that and what that will do is print it to the debug console now a normal app that's running that will appear in your events tab in the rad studio ide if you close the ide and you've got some other debug console app, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, then output debug string will run. So on a customer's machine, um, you can have absolutely no logging set up, but you will be able to view the, um, the output debug string events. The tool I recommend to use that on a customer's machine or a server that you're not you've not got Rad Studio installed on is a product from Sys Internals. They're owned by Microsoft, and it's called Debug View. It's an excellent app. If you go into there, you will see all the debug console output from everything. And in fact, if you can see in that window there, there's a few mistakes. Somebody's program is uh, causing some errors. Uh, they've passed some uh, invalid parameter to a C runtime function. Uh, the joys of being a developer. Eh? But uh, if you look in the red box that's highlighted there, earlier on we did that output debug string, and there's the result of it appearing in there. It's just great using Rad Studio and particularly using Rad Studio with Delphi. You can do absolutely anything. Do you want it to run on a Raspberry Pi? There's a solution for that and you can use that today. It works today. Want to run it on a cheap Amazon Fire tablet? They're very, very uh, cost effective. Just target Android and it will run fine. I have one running right next to me now. You can target Windows, Mac OS, not for services. 
iOS, Android, and even the web from a single code base on a project. It's absolutely true. And do you want to keep running even after the whole operating system has been upgraded without needing any downloads or reconfiguration? Yes, that's very typical for a Delphi program, and it's unique among development systems out there. There are very few that can do that. Most of them need you to update some runtimes and supporting libraries, and it doesn't happen with Rad Studio and Delphi. And that's why I choose Delphi. Anyway, that was a little quick whisk through of the Windows services. My name is Ian Barker, and you can see my links on the screen there. Feel free to email me. I'll do my best to get back to you. But I am a working programmer. I get up every day and I write code. If you want to see the slides and links and replay, go to tinyurl.com forward slash Delphi QL services. Thanks. presentation we're celebrating the 28th anniversary of Delphi congratulations to all developers around the world I am Carlos Agnes and Embarcadero MVP but more than everything I am a Delphi lover for a long long time our presentation is about some experiences I lived across more than 10 years as a Delphi consultant and the short story here is that some little mistakes in Delphi code are more uh, common than we can imagine. I started to take notes about these mistakes and I started also to summarize them in several presentations like the one that we are going to show now. Uh, all of them were well received by the community, but it is necessary to point out, I know that I'm not the truth owner. Uh, if you consider that I'm wrong in some of the subject that I'm going to show here, it is okay. You can talk to me or if you want to. You can reach me through my email that is uh, carlos.agnes at tmrti.com.br. Uh, for this presentation, I brought a short list of these common mistakes. Uh, let's go with the first one. Uh, let's talk about the if then function now we can find in Delphi two of these uh, functions one is uh, let me remember on the math unit another one is uh, about strings uh, str utils uh, it is a very useful function I use it a lot but some developers forget that if then is not necessarily a ternary operator at least not a real one uh, it means that if then is not resolved at compiler level, but as a function, as a, a normal library. Uh, the result here is that regardless if the Boolean expression that will be used as first, or first parameter, if the, whether the, the parameter is true or not, uh, both the second and the third parameter needs to be evaluated before returning one of another. Uh, so the common mistake here is that some developers provide one or even worse two parameters that are uh, let's say complex to evaluate and let's let's make an example here uh, an extrapolated example uh, if the function one need uh, needs for example one second to be evaluated and the second function needs another two seconds this whole expression here will need three seconds at least of processing, regardless if the first or the second value will be used as the result of the function. So to use if then, uh, it is important that both and the third parameter, let's say they should be constants or maybe, just maybe, very, very low cost functions. Uh, for all the other cases, your solution relies on your good and old friend if expression. Okay? Let's talk about the short circuit evaluation. It is a subject that is very close to the first one. Uh, the premise here is that some developers believe that if you need to, to test some value, and uh, let's use this sample here, uh, you need to test this value. So after the then ex, uh, expression here or, or then clause, it is safe to continue using the object that uh, needs to be here. For example, uh, this is not necessarily true, let's say. Uh, for example, this code can be considered a bad practice in order, um, for example, it causes more 
complexity uh, regarding the number of indentation that it needs to cause. And this is a problem. Uh, I don't know if everyone is familiar with the short circuit evaluation, so let's remember, let's remember some basics uh, about Boolean logic. False and anything else will always be false. You don't need to check what, can, what comes after the end operator. False and anything will always be false. Okay. The same is true uh, when you evaluate, for example, true or anything else, the result will always be true. Okay, again, this is the basics, but the case here is that by default, the DeFi compiler also relies on this premise. If one Boolean value is enough to determine the whole expression result, the compiler didn't don't finish the, the, the evaluation. Uh, so you can, for example, uh, simplify the previous code with uh, this one. Uh, it is safe to test uh, the second uh, expression here this way because uh, if the first expression here fails, the second one will not be tested. That's happened because of the short circuit evaluation. The first expression here, if returning false, is enough to determine the whole expression of the whole if expression, of course. And remember that I told you that uh, this is the default behavior of the compiler, but it can be changed using this property on the options of compiling uh, the, of the, 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 the project itself. But please never, never turn on this property. It can cause lots of breaks in your code or in your uh, compilation, for example. Okay. Uh, let's say, let's go to the third case. It is a very, very common case. Uh, I will not go, for example, uh, into the merits of using or not typecasting. I will just assume that it, the cast is needed in this case. And considering uh, if you want to test if some object can be used as a, as a more specific type, it is common to use the is operator. And until now, everything is right, everything is okay. The problem is that after you enter the then clause, uh, you use another as operator. Uh, normally, it happens because the, developers is, the developer is not aware that both the is and as uh, are not simple, not just two simple operators, let's say that way. Uh, they demand uh, some, comp some processing. And we are repeating this processing when we call the is and the s. So the best solution here is you have to test if the object is uh, from a more specific type. Okay, this is the case where you need to use the is. But after passing this if condition, it is safe to use the hard type uh, casting like this one. Uh, this kind of typecasting just say to the compiler, okay, you can use this, ob this object this way and uh, the compiler doesn't call any testing solution like the S uh, uses this sample right here. Okay. Now we reach it, uh, let's say our repercussion champion from the previous presentation. Uh, that is the relationship between create an object with a try finally and then call the free inside of the finally block. Let's analyze the first scenario here. Uh, the object is being created inside the try finally block. Of course, it means that in any case, the finally block will always be executed. But what happens if the create process raises an exception? The program cursor will be redirected before assigning any value to the variable that was supposed to store uh, the new object. Uh, so in the final block, a free will be, call will be called on a var that we don't necessarily know what is inside of this var. One of the results of this scenario is that we can receive an access violation or an invalid pointer operation. Uh, the second case here is for example, wishing to reduce code, the developer decided to create two objects and then protect the resources with just one try finally block. This is wrong because if the second object creation raises an exception, 
the first one, the first object is still unprotected. And the reference to this first object will be lost by the end of the context and it will probably cause a memory leak. Remember, the right way to create uh, uh, an object and protect the resource with a try final is to create the object and immediately calls the try block, initiate the, the try block, okay? If you need to create two objects, the best solution is to protect them with two try finally blocks, one for each creation like this sample here. But remember that I told you about the complexity of the code regarding the indentation. If it is important to you to keep a low indentation level, you can always initiate the verse with new and then initiate the try finally block. Normally, this is the case where the developers uh, start to interact with me on the previous presentation, telling me that this code will raise an exception because of the possibility of a free being called by a new reference. This is not true. That free is by design programmed to test if the reference is different from new. And then, only then, in this case, the object destructor will be called. Finally, I will finish this presentation saying that lots of the common mistakes that I used to see around, there's a warning or a hint by the compiler showing to the developer uh, the point that could be better or even worse is causing a bug. And the developer didn't see it because it just one more warning among thousands of the, the warnings that the project has. This is not a good thing. So, I am a fan and always recommend the zero warnings and hints policy. Believe me, uh, soon then you can realize it will save you precious time to keep this policy in your projects. This is it about our today's presentation. If you already saw some mistakes like this and like to share them with me, please feel free to contact me. Uh, if you used to write code like the ones I've shown here, don't worry, some of them I was victim myself and I had to learn them in the worst possible way. I hope you enjoyed this presentation this and see you around. Again, happy anniversary Delphi. Bye bye everyone. Actually, I just wanted to chime in here on that one. That was really good. <laughs> I I, definitely, I think I'll be playing that one again later. Uh, if you didn't catch it, you can find it on YouTube. Actually, I'll put a link here on YouTube. I think I have it already up on YouTube for replay. But that was a really good session on um, just some common mistakes you're making. The I will comment the um, the one about setting multiple references to nil before the try finally when you're doing that that pattern there. The first time I saw that years ago was in production code, and I'm like. Well, that's wrong. And then I looked at it a little closer. I'm like, oh, I understand now. But yeah, that's the best way to do it. I really like that one as well. But there's a lot of a lot of good ones in there. And I'm also a big fan of the zero hints and warnings. I cannot tell you how many times I've had somebody um, come to me and like, hey, I've got this problem with my code. And they share their screen with me and I look and they got just tons and tons of hints and warnings. And I'm like, well, let's clear this up first. And I'm like, oh, I want to fix the bug first. And the bug was hidden in the hints and warnings. And it's happened to me too. There's been times I've not paid attention to my hints and warnings. I've been live coding and have something not work quite right. And like, hmm, what's not working here? And oh, sure enough, there's a hint and warning, hint or warning right there telling me what the what was going wrong. So yeah. That is a really important one as well. Um, I'll put the link here on YouTube in the chat for everybody. So you can, uh, if you want to watch that one again or share it with your friends, very, very good one. And we got one more, um, another lightning session for you here. Automatically translate your programs with DeepLAPI. In our era, a software or mobile application can be used worldwide in many languages. As a developer, we can't think users we will have neither translator programs for each spoken language in the world. 
It's the reason why we should deal with external solutions to translate for real languages used by our users and ask to human translators for only some of them we hope useful. And of course, check if automatic translations are good enough. In this session, I'll show you how to use DeepL API to translate a program into a new language directly when needed by one of your users. Of course, it's limited to the languages known by DeepL. Uh, and at this time, uh, DeepL knows 31 languages and native pairs. Hi, I'm Patrick Premartin. MVP Embarcadero, French, uh, freelance developer, teacher, and streamer. You'll find my projects on GitHub uh, and can contact me on LinkedIn or uh, Twitch if you want. Some of my websites around Delphi and uh, web programming are uh, my blog, uh, serial streamer for uh, video on demand of all uh, streams and presentations I do in French or English, uh, books uh, about uh, Delphi and Pascal programming on uh, delphibooks.com and Delphi learning resource. DeepL. DeepL translator benefits from the experience acquired with Lingui, an old uh, dictionary on the uh, internet. The machine translation tool was released in uh, 2016, Pro features uh, were added in 2018 with an API to translate text and then formatted documents uh, like uh, docx, pdf uh, or powerpoints. They offer free features from their website, a desktop or mobile application, but also a free monthly quota uh, for the use of the API. To use the API, we need a DeepL uh, user account. Uh, during subscription, you can choose to stay on a free account or a pro paid account. The two levels give access to the API. Subscribing generates a personal private API key. Uh, with the REST API, we can translate text, documents, and manage glossaries. DeepL website is available at uh, www.dipel.com and uh, you have the link to the REST API documentation. Delphi Client Library for DeepL API. Uh, my DeepL Deep Delphi Client Library is available in a public GitHub repository. Uh, you'll get a unit with procedures and functions to use DeepL Translate REST API in Delphi release since 10.2 Tokyo. I use native THTTP client class to call the API. Task and anonymous threads are used for asynchronous calls, but you can use synchronous blocking behavior if you prefer, except on Android, because Android refuses uh, any um, blocking call of Internet access. Call DeepL set API URL procedure to specify the API URL you want to use with a free uh, URL or pro URL depending on the, what uh, user account you have on DeepL. Uh, by default, the library calls the free API. Use the DeepL translate text sync function for a blocking te text translation or uh, DeepL translate te text async. A procedure for a non-blocking text translation. WebBroker is a simple HTTP server available in Delphi since many years. Uh, with it, we get a console application uh, we can adapt to our needs by adding action as URL endpoints. Each action is an event with the HTTPS request and a response as parameters. It's up to us to do what we want with it. Its documentation is available at docwiki.arbacardero.com Studio, English or other languages using WebBroker Index. WebBroker has a proxy server. In the case of paid APIs like translation, it's a good idea to cache requests and results. 
if the API data uh, license authorize this use. Another reason is to keep the API key secret by storing it only on controlled software and devices, and especially not in published programs that could be act. Web Broker is a good product for this use. As a console program, we can transform it into a Windows service or a Linux daemon. We can simulate an API by declaring the same endpoints and simply pass the received parameters to call uh, the real API after adding the API key. It's uh, what I did for the translation proxy, given as a sample use of my client library for DeepL API. You have the link to the proxy server sample. To call the proxy, I use the same client API library I use to call the real API. There is no reason to make it more complicated than that. I promise to show you how to automatically translate an application with a DeepL API. So here are my demo projects. Note, however, that this way of doing things is only a tinkering. In a real production project, uh, you must set up secure access to your proxy uh, and then make sure that the generated translations correspond to your needs by having them checked by native speakers or certified translators depending on the topic. Having your text translated by the professional for the five or more uh, most spoken languages in the world remains a good idea even if an automated system like DeepL will surely give good results. As for humans, no artificial intelligence is perfect. The source code of this demo are available on GitHub uh, and you have the link on the slide. The sample project contains uh, files from other code repositories. You have the links here. Of course, uh, use uh, original files from the original uh, repositories and not the copied here because uh, they won't be maintained. Let's see the code. The server is a web broker project and I have a web module unit with an action default because why not with no, no real action and an endpoint v2 translate the same as the Deeple API. When you go to the translate text you have a v2 translate endpoint. In my web broker, I did the same. The DeepL client library call web broker, web broker call DeepL. Same parameters for the two, totally transparent. In the code, we get the request and Fill the response. In my case, I test some parameters and uh, um, add default values. Set parameters for the call of web broker endpoint. Passed to DPL directly with a good API key. And after that, I answer to, uh, to the programs with what DPL answers to me. Execute. It opens uh, by default on localhost uh, 8080. I just have to open one of uh, the other programs, like this one for uh, FireMonkey. And use the library uh, for uh, DeepL API in Delphi to call it. If I execute the FireMonkey program, I have some text in English. The language is uh, at the bottom. If I change, 
It calls web broker, which calls DPL, and update the text. I go back to English and French. Of course, uh, first time is a uh, has a little delay uh, to translate text. You can have other uh, forms. I go to Italian. Texts are all translated. Even on the other uh, windows. If I go to uh, my page, French, by default, uh, I have the same uh, behavior. In the program, I only have uh, English text and specify it's an English by default program. Here. I specify also the uh, proxy server URL. It's web broker by default. If I want to call the DeepL API directly, I have to uh, specify there uh, the endpoint. Uh, this one for the uh, free API. In the VCL project, I did the same. Same interface with a window and a show message. If I change the language, French, I have the text translated everywhere. To do that, uh, I've added uh, some, um, some libraries here. Uh, the DPL API client. Uh, null fertile language to get uh, current language of the system for this option. Up là. When I go to uh, language menu, my language, click, uh, I get the current language. So um, if you are a, a Spanish user, you'll have uh, the, the Spanish translation with this option. Changing the current language in the library change the value and start uh, an event. This event is uh, in VCL translate or FMX translate depending on the uh, project type. The VCL translate manage tra uh, translation for uh, VCL forms and frames. In the initialization section, it uh, points the event to this procedure, which lists uh, all uh, components of the application and checked if uh, they have the e olf translate interface or not. If they have, it calls the translate text on them. Every form of the project must have this one in its declaration. And of course, the translate text procedure. In the procedure, in this case, I use uh, loops on components of the form and uh, check uh, their class to uh, change the text with getText function. The getText function has uh, some signatures here with procedure or events for a callback uh, when the text 
is already known by the program as the answer uh, is given by the function and if uh, it's not it calls the web broker server and after that the callback when the program works here you have a delay first time and the update is done by the callback the second time text are, are already known by the program so uh, it's the cache I have in a dictionary collection default text to have the, um, the English text uh, for each uh, component of the screens or the forms and the list of uh, text translated because we have components or uh, text in the code like for the show message here when you click help about you have the famous hello world sentence translated here of course this one is blocking because we don't have any callback for a show message Uh, I'm not available live to answer questions, but uh, if you have any, I'll make my best to answer them. If it's about a GitHub repository, open a new issue or discussion on them directly. Uh, if it's about this session, you can contact me on LinkedIn or with the contact form of my blog. You have the link at the bottom of the page. You also can leave a message on frenchdeveloppé.com forum or English Delphi Praxis forum. Thanks for watching and enjoy this DelphiCon. We are excited to announce to you that now the Deleaker supports the Rad Studio 10.4 Sydney. The new release of Rad Studio adds significant new and enhanced Windows capabilities throughout the product in addition to the major productivity and performance enhancements across supported platforms. The Deleaker works as a plugin in Rad Studio in order to help find leaks and optimize usage resources efficiently. In this video, you'll see how the Deleaker integrates with a new Rad Studio 10.4 Sydney and assists developers to find and fix leaks. Launch the Deleaker installer. The installer shows available Rad Studio versions. Rad Studio 10.4 Sydney is supported. Let the installer add the leaker to the Rad Studio. Ready. Start the Rad Studio. A developer can open the Deleaker window at any moment by clicking to the Deleaker menu. Let's create a new Windows VCL application.
build and run the project. Return to the Rad Studio, open the Deleaker window, and take a snapshot. Let's look at the live objects. They are grouped by the class name. Here is the main form and a lot of other objects. For each object, you can view its size, a source file, and explore its call stack. OK, let's close the application. The process quits and the deleaker starts taking a snapshot. No leaks found, and that's expected. Let's introduce a leak. Add a button to the form. Name it. Double click the button to add a handler. Let's allocate some memory and instantiate one object of tstring list. You will see the way the deleaker finds these leaks. Build and run. Click the button several times. Close the application. The deleaker is preparing a snapshot. The deleaker has found some leaks. For each leak, you can view its hit count, size, source file name, and call stack. To explore leaked objects, switch to Delphi objects. The deleaker has found the tstring list object. Here is the call stack. To navigate to the source code, right click the call stack and choose Show Source Code. The leaker opens the source file and moves the cursor to the line where the object was allocated. Let's return to the allocations. Navigate to the line where the memory allocated by the getmem function. The final snapshot contains all information about leaked memory and objects, size, hit count, value, and module. It's easy to proceed to the source code to find the location of the allocated resources. Let's close the deleaker, 
the project, and create a new similar application in C++ Builder. The project is ready. Build it and run. Without closing the application, switch to the IDE and open the Deleker window. Take a snapshot. Here you see a lot of allocations and some live objects as well. Objects are grouped by the class name. For each object, you can explore the call stack. Close the deleker and the application. The deleker has found two global objects. Good job! Well, let's add some leaks. Drop a button to the form. Name it. Double click to open the handler. Let's introduce two leaks. Start the debugging. Click the button a few times. Close the form. The deleker is taking a snapshot. The snapshot is ready. The deleker has found the leaked object. Here it's call stack. Right click to the call stack and choose show source code to navigate to the source of the leak. The deleker opens the editor in the correct line. Great! Switch to the allocations and you'll see that the leak made by the operator new has been detected as well. Right click to the allocation, choose show source code to go to the source code. Great, here is the correct line. The deleker is a memory profile for both Delphi and C++ Builder that helps fix memory loss as well as leaks of handles and other resources. It is tightly integrated with Rad Studio to allow developers to locate the source of leaks without leaving the IDE. Happy coding! Creating a simple web server with web broker. For fun or real projects, it's useful to know how to serve files like does a web server. During this session, I'll show you how to create a web server from a web broker Delphi project to display a simple website in a browser. Hi, I'm Patrick Prematin, Embarcadero MVP, French freelance developer, teacher, and streamer. Uh, you have my GitHub, LinkedIn, and Twitch accounts if you want to uh, see what I uh, create. Some of my uh, website around DeFi and web programming are on the screen. WebBroker is a simple HTTPS server available in Delphi since many years. With it, we get a console application we can adapt to our needs by adding actions as URL endpoints. 
Each action is an event with the HTTP request and a response as parameters. It's up to us to do what we want with it. This documentation is available at docwikiembarcadero.com website. What is web server? A web server is a program listening on a port, 80 by default, for one or more IP. This program knows the hypertext transfer protocol HTTP to speak with a browser or any other HTTPS client. The most used commands of hypertext transfer protocol are GET and POST. GET is what browsers use in their address bar and for forms. All parameters are shown in the URL. POST is used for forms or to add data to users and log files. HTTP has a secure version, HTTPS. This version encrypts the content of data exchanged between the web server and its client. If you want to know more about HTTPS, go to this Wikipedia page. You have the link on the screen. When we surf on the web, browsers ask pages to servers with GET commands. Server answers has two parts, a header and a body. In the header, we find two important things, the HTTP status code, the content type. Depending on them, the browser displays an error or the body of the answer. In this case, when I go to developer tools, we have a network part and we can check the header. with the status code 200 and see and the uh, text html as content type it's the web page the browser display here about status code you probably know one of these uh, these values 404 for a file not found or an url corresponding to the thing 500 for internal server error, 403 for a forbidden access. Uh, when all is good, the code must be 200. If not, you have the choice in a list. You have the link for a Wikipedia list of uh, HTTP status code. Here, you can see five parts. Information, success, redirection, client error or server errors and uh, the list of code you can use to answer uh, if, you, um, if you create a web server. Or a list of code you can uh, receive from a web server and check in your uh, programs, browsers or uh, client of API. On a classic file system, it is a file extension that indicates what the data contain correspond to and how or by which software to display them. The content type has the same behavior for a web browser. It tells the browser what the server sent in the body part of its answer. Content type are also known as a MIME type for emails. Many lists are available on the net, my preferred one is in Mozilla Developer Documentation. You have the file extension on the server and uh, the MIME type or content type uh, the browser expects to, um, to show the file with an extension. For CSS, you have text CSS. For HTML, You have text HTML content type. And for, for pictures, .jpg or jpg, you have image jpeg and so on. If the content type is wrong, the browser uh, display things, <coughs> not what you expect. Web broker uh, can be used as a simple web server. It's not complicated. We only have to know where are the files of the website on our server storage 
and map URLs to the local file system after some security controls. If the files are available, we send them with a good content type. If they don't exist, or if we don't want to send them, we generate an error with a good HTTP status code. It's really easy to do. Why WebWalker? Because it's simple, uh, it's included in all editions of Delphi since a lot of uh, years, uh, and we all can use it. But there are uh, many other solutions to do web server in Delphi and C++ uh, Builder. Rad server from Embarcadero, Delphi MVC framework available on GitHub from Daniel Tetti and a big team of volunteers and supporters and other frameworks or components I uh, listed uh, at the bottom of the page. The demo. Uh, this sample contains two parts. The web broker project source as a simple window console program and a website created for the 28th uh, birthday of Delphi uh, and the Delphicon with uh, pictures generated by Dal E2. I wrote uh, wonderful pictures. Uh, <laughs> it's um, it's an opinion. Uh, never underestimate the power of the beauty. According to to who announces it, uh, sensitive souls abstain. I apologize in advance for all these colors. <laughs> the sample project is available on GitHub. Creating a simple web server uh, with web broker with uh, two folders and demo sites. For the website I created for uh, this uh, sample and the web broker source in the SRC folder. In Delphi, we have a web broker project uh, with its uh, web module unit. The website has uh, three folders the root, demo sites, the images. IMG and buttons to change pages in the BTN folder. I declared the same thing in uh, action of a web broker, the root, IMG folder and BTN folder with an asterisk uh, to um, intercept the URL starting by slash IMG or slash BTN. If not, it's the root activated by default, which uh, receives the, the get command. For the root, I log the request on the console to show what uh, web broker receives. And uh, I uh, answer with file a procedure I've created just above. Uh, I pass the pass info of the request. The pass info contains the um, relative URL uh, without localhost and the port. File name. The pass of the website on the disk. The response variable to get the answer and the handled variable. If it's uh, false, the request is uh, managed by the default uh, handler or uh, nothing. If it's true, the dispatcher stop the dispatch. Um, I remove the, the first slash um, character. In the img folder, I remove slash img slash of the pass info and for the BTN, I do the same with slash BTN slash. So, answer with file will receive only the file name uh, asked by the browser. And here, we filter the file name uh, by uh, removing all characters we don't want like uh, slash and uh, backslash for security reasons and uh, I check if the file name is empty if it's uh, empty 
I, uh, I'll show the index.html by default. I get the local pass of the file name. If the file not exists, I send a 404 error, file not found. If the file exists on the hard drive, I checked is, uh, its extension to fill the content type with the good uh, code. You have a list here. Of course, I don't have, uh, I don't need all huh, in my case. Uh, if the content, uh, if the file extension is not managed by the program, I uh, send an exception. If the extension is okay, I have a content type. I fill the status code and I send the answer as a content stream. And it's uh, over. I start the program. I change the default port. Uh, it's uh, 80 by default. So I have localhost uh, access on my uh, browser. On the localhost URL, and I have the index on the screen. The web broker server has received some uh, some gets. First one pass info slash default one. Uh, one for the btn gauche gif. So uh, with this. Uh, the index.html is sent to the browser. The browser needs the pictures and asks them to the server, depending on its cache. Of course, uh, I uh, already have uh, displayed the, the page, so it doesn't ask all pictures, uh, but it asks the favicon. Uh, .co, uh, we I don't have on the folder, so uh, it will ask uh, this file uh, for each page. Oh, here is the website and the beautiful pictures generated by Dali of Delphi developers uh, with uh, Delph and uh, an ancient uh, Greek uh, helmet. You have all um, all files on the log. Hein. It asks for the page uh, and uh, and the images. The big boss. I'm not available live to answer questions, but uh, if you have any, I'll make my best to answer them. If it's about a GitHub repository, open an issue or discussion on them. Uh, if it's about this session, you can contact me on LinkedIn or with the contact form of my blog. You also can leave a message on frenchdeveloppe.com or English Delphi Praxis forums. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the DelphiCon. See you later. I just loved how readable the object Pascal programming language is. I decided it would be cool to make a program where the code was the codified lyrics to a song. And then the output was the actual lyrics to the song. So much like Walt Disney created Fantasia based on classical music, I've created a special musical number based on the music of Jonathan Colton. Code monkey, get up, get coffee. Code monkey, go to job. Code monkey, have boring meeting with boring manager Rob. Rob say code monkey, very diligent, but his output stinks. 
his code not functional or elegant? What do code monkey think? Code monkey think maybe manager wanna write login page himself. Code monkey not say it out loud. Code monkey not crazy, just proud. Code monkey likes Fritos. Code monkey likes to have a Mountain Dew. Code monkey very simple man with big warm fuzzy secret heart. Code monkey like you. Like you. Code monkey hang around at front desk Till your sweater look nice Code monkey offer buy you soda Bring you cup, bring you ice You say no thank you for the soda Cause soda make you fat Anyway you busy with the telephone No time for chat Code Monkey have long walk back to cubicle He sit down, pretend to work Code Monkey not thinking so straight Code Monkey not feeling so great Code Monkey like Fritos Code Monkey like Tab and Mountain Dew Code Monkey very simple man Big warm fuzzy secret heart Code Monkey like you Take bath, take nap This job fulfilling in creative way Such a load of crap Code Monkey thinks someday he have everything Even pretty girl like you Code Monkey just waiting for now Code Monkey says someday, somehow Code Monkey like Fritos Code Monkey like Tab and Mountain Dew Code Monkey very simple man Big, warm, fuzzy, secret heart Code monkey like you Code monkey like you Code monkey get up, get coffee this is actual object pass Cal code and was recorded in real time. You can compile it with Delphi or App Method and run it on Windows, OS X, Android, and iOS. The output is the original lyrics to the song. The code will actually work as a console application as well, and so in theory could work on other platforms like Linux, etc. Uh, just in order to make it shared code, I made it a GUI application. I hope you've enjoyed this special musical number, and my thanks to Jonathan Colton for making and sharing this great song. You can download all my source code for this song on my website at delphi.org slash codemonkey. From there you'll find links to download Jonathan Colton's song as well. time has a huge impact on developer productivity. I made this project here with Delphi, a million lines of object Pascal code in one project, and we're going to see how fast it compiles. So a million lines would be 18,000 pages of printed text, which would be 14 copies of War in Peace. When it comes to code, everything you see here above that line is less than a million lines of code. So 
to launch the Space Shuttle 400,000 lines of code. Now the code you see here, these projects are multiple millions of lines of code. So Windows 3.1 was about two and a half million lines of code. And of course with time, software complexity, projects get bigger, larger, more lines of code. So we here see five, five million lines of code, 10 million lines of code, 25 million lines of code, 50 million lines of code, 100 million lines of code. And then each of those little squares there is a two billion lines of code. And I don't know how much total that is for Google. A lot of code for Google. Compiling is part of the programming culture. I mean, this is the number one legitimate excuse for slacking off as a software developer is we're waiting for our code to compile. But it slows down our productivity because we're always waiting for our code to compile. A few things we can do as Delphi developers to improve our compile time is take advantage of library packages, similarly, uh, pre-compiled units. So if we do a compile, it only compiles the units that have changed since the last compile. You can also divide var project into multiple smaller packages. And then again, you're taking advantage of the pre-compiled package nature. Then there's a number of other compiler options you can use as far as inlining, uh, runtime packages, etc. Now, Berlin also took a huge step forward in fixing a number of compiler speed up issues and it made compiling code much faster. So let's take a look at compiling a million lines of code in 10.1 Berlin. Go here, project options. I have optimization turned off. We're doing a full debug build here. And I will point out that I am doing runtime packages, which speeds up the linking process, but the compiling process is the same. So let's go ahead, we're gonna start with a clean. And I have a timer here that's going to time how long the process takes. And I've put a button right here for the build. And so the build started. And there we go. One million lines of code compiled in five seconds. And it's actually faster if I'm not video recording it because I'm running it inside a virtual machine and with the video recording, it gets down to about three seconds. This is a project that I wrote. You may have seen it before if you've come to ask here for Delphi webinars because I think I did it on the desktop first or some, some other conference. One of the many things that I uh, do webinars for. And this is all done with uh, Skier for Delphi as well. And any Star Trek fan will be able to tell you what this is. This is a imitation, shall we say, of a space computer, the LCARS interface. If you're a Star Trek original series fan, then you'll know immediately what that is. And what we've got here are some um, skier for Delphi controls. And if I hit LF11, you can see it's a skier animated image. And this one is an SVG. And uh, there's some more animated images here. These are LOTI animations. So they're basically a bit of XML and, and it draws the animations. These are just simple shapes, as you can see, T-shape and a few other things as well. In the background, there's some source to make things render. But let me just run that for a second so you can see what it looks like when it's running. Oops, oh dear, what did I do? Oh, I broke it, oh no. It was working the other day, no, what did I do? Ha, there you go. It, it, when I opened the project, it automatically added skier in there. So it's playing sounds in the background, which I'm just gonna turn off because we don't want those on but as you can see key things here are the font handling that skier does this is a klingon uh, custom font it doesn't say anything meaningful it's all random uh, text and uh, here's some colored fonts and then there's some nice uh, column fonts and uh, justified and all the rest of it here's some text there's your svg here's a nice custom star trek -y type font and the animations and all of this is done using open source stuff. I, I didn't create any of this myself. I just draw them all together, put them in the same place. But it's a simple little demo, but it gives you some idea of some of the things that just straight out of the box you can do. You can get much better animations than these. I just pick ones that look vaguely Star Trek-y, but it's very cool. And all of it's enabled by um, Skier for Delphi. You can download this from their website and uh, go to the repository. It's all open source. And uh, most of the code that you see there actually is really to do with generating like random lines of text. So actually it's nothing to do with the skier stuff. It's just because I wanted to show some plausible text on there. And there this, is a, this is a VCL yeah. sample too, right? 
yes, this is a VCR sample. There is someone cleverly has raised an issue against my sample and said, do an FMX version. The difference between the FMX and VCL samples is that in the VCL, these animations here are not transparent. Okay, let me just turn the sound off. On the FMX, this planet background here would be transparent. You probably can't see it very well on the webinar, but this planet image has got a black background, which by default is transparent on FMX. And therefore the radar sweep actually seems to go around and hover over the top of the planet because I put the Z order so that the radar sweep was on top and it looked like the radar had detected the planet. But that's the only real difference um, between the FMX and the VCL versions. But yes, this is a VCL project and it's good to go you can use this out of the box and see some of the nonsense i did to uh, make it work but it gives you some indication of how to load custom fonts and lay out put colors in and the play animations there's nothing difficult with the animations load the animation in and uh, get it to play same with the font their font handling is fairly easy there's a bit of uh, font handling here it loads in a open source font which i do reference in my notes i put an attribution in there from where i got it loads the font in uh, creates the font and then uh, chooses a yellow color and that's it that's your custom font loaded so it could be any font you like i and love yeah, the fact that you can load the font in your application it doesn't have to be installed on the computer that's that's a really <laughs> big thing correct yes and and actually in my notes i actually put attributions where i got these from and that font library.org has got thousands of fonts i didn't find just one klingon font i found about 15. so if there's 15 klingon fonts you can bet there's all sorts of other types of uh, font that you could ever want i just go to my uh, github and get it there but actually it's a lot easier if you go to the skier for delphi.org um, site and then go to the uh, repository and they credit me there very nicely i didn't do any of the hard work i just wrote a simple little program they did all the hard work So we're getting back on schedule here with demystifying domain-driven design in Delphi. That's uh, five Ds. And I'll be starting here in just a few minutes.
Creating a simple web server with web broker. Hi everyone, welcome to the Ofaicon 2023. My name is Gustavo, and yes, we are celebrating 28 years of the Ofai. Almost my age, I'm a little bit older than that. <laughs> and happy birthday to the Ofai, and congratulations because he pays my bills. So keep going, the Ofai. The name of this session is Dismissifying Domain Driven Design DDD in the Ofai. Before we started, let's go through the agenda of the session. So first of all, I want to talk about what is DDD and also what is not DDD because there's a lot of misconception about what is and what is not. So I'm going to try to clarify that. I'm going to show you the main benefits to use DDD in your own projects. The main concepts, in fact, there, there is a lot of concepts uh, in, in domain-driven design, but we, we don't have all the time to, to go through all these concepts, all, all many concepts that DDD has. So here I'm going to show you the main concepts, which, we, which will be enough to, to have a... a a forceful understanding about what is domain-driven design. A Delphi example using the main concepts. Some final tips about all the things that I'm going to show you here. And a Q&A session to finish. A little about myself, my name is Gustavo Mena Barreto, I'm a senior developer at Aquasoft. Aquasoft is a partner of Embarcadero, and Aquasoft works with outsourcing. I have more than 10 years of experience in Delphi, and also I'm a, I'm a content creator on Instagram. The name of the page is Force Coding, and the meaning of that is because... I like to code and I like Star Wars, so for school. Feel free to, to follow me there and, and check it out. Uh, every day I, I post tips of, of Delphi. Okay, let's start. Domain Driven Design, DDD. What is that? Let's go break down uh, every, every, every word of Domain Driven Design, these three words. The first one, the domain. Uh, it's all about the domain and what is that? What is do the domain? The domain is the heart of the software, is the business area of the software. So it's the heart of the software that we are gonna model that we are gonna model. So driven design, uh, what, what, what is that means? Driven design is that means that we are gonna model the software focusing, focusing on solving the requirements on the business area of expertise. So, when you think in DDD, you got you gonna think you you got thinking domain in domain and driven and driven design. Domain is the heart of the software, the business area, and driven design is the modeling of the software to solve the the requirements of the business area. It's not a technology. It's not a technology, guys. In fact, you can use you can use DDD in any technology that you want, any program language that you want. Here I'm gonna I'm gonna show you in Delphi because we love Delphi, but you can use in, in any any program language that you want, and it's not a MVC architecture. 
structure and there's a, 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 a misconception in that part because if you if you search on the web you you will find uh, you find several articles talking about creating a project using DDD and EVC and that's okay you can use it in that way but DDD is one thing and MVC is another thing here in the image you can see a domain layer here representing the DDD lay the DDD and we have application layer kind of MVC who has who has the controller form view helper and a infrastructure layer these two groups of layers depends on the on the domain layer about about the DDD, the, the DDD. but it's not the same what does that mean? It's, it's me, it means that you can use DDD with MVC or don't because there are two different things you can use only DDD in your project or if you want to use uh, a MVC architecture or another ar architecture you can use but I just want to clarify that DDD is one thing and MVC is another different thing and then there is this book, Domain Driven Design Tackling Complexity in the Heart of Software, written by Eric Evans. If you want to go, if you really to go, want to go deeper in, in DDD and all, all, all the concepts, you must read this book. It's written by Eric Evans. Uh, Eric Evans, it's a uh, reference in Domain Driven Design. He is, in the 80s, he's already using the, the concepts and in 2003 he launched this book and quickly became a Bible, a Bible of, of DDD. So if you want to go, if you want to know everything about DDD, go in that book. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, it's, it, it's a hard reading and also it's not a technical book. You will find all the concepts here to implement in any technology that you want. Okay, now I'm going to show you the, the main benefits to use DDD in your own projects. The first one, the domain logic is totally independent of any technology for implementation. And what, what does that mean? The domain logic is the requirements of business area, which is equal, which is our domain, domain and is totally independent of any technology. Uh, today is very very common to use uh, a software that uses many technologies, and DDD works fine with that, preserving the, the the logic of the of the business area of our of the domain. So DDD works fine with that. And yes, we're gonna have a, a clean code. Um, when I show you the the Delphi example gonna make more clear for you guys about the clean code because we have layers and it make much much more easy to to see the code and and alter the code so we have clean code as well and we have a alignment between business and the development they were acquired in business development these two walks together Okay, now it's time for the main concepts. In an organization that are you that are using DDD, we have two groups of teams. We have the development team and we have the domain experts. The development team talks about technical terms, technical stuff so like program language, databases, database, whatever. You know what I'm talking about. And the domain expert, experts uh, talk about business area terms. The domain experts are the one who, who knows about the business of the software that we are going to model. But, but how can these two, how these two can, can understand each other? Because the domain experts don't, don't know nothing about technical stuff and the development team don't know about the business area terms or at least don't know about everything. So how these two can, 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 can understand each other? They can understand each other with the ubiquitous language. 
And what is that? The ubiquitous language uses the terminologies of the business reality. She is defined between developers and the domain experts and has the object of clarify communication between developers and domain experts. So the main goal of the ubiquitous language it is to guarantee that everyone is on the same page. Everyone knows the all the all the, ter the terminologies of, of the software and everyone can can understand each other because it's defined between developers and the, and the domain experts. So ubiquitous language is very important in, in, in domain-driven design. The domain and model. Let's go talk about the domain again. So the domain, heart of business area, heart of the software, and is the reason of software development to exist. Without the domain, we don't have any project, we don't have DDD, we don't have software. So, as I talked a few slides before, it's all about the domain. Then we have the model abstracts the complexity of the business area, and in DDD is, it is, is very important. We, we don't want things much complex, we, we want to simplify things. Here, here's why we we are using the model and the model is evolutive as long as we are modeling the software the model is going to be evolutive and the software requirements specification works together with the code implementation the guarantee that the code implementation is implements all the the requirements of, of the software also we have the bounded context and the context map the bounded context is used for multiple subdomains and models, and that is the first time I'm talking about subdomains. And why? Because the main goal of DDD is abstracts the complexity, taking the complexity, make make the things much more simple. So it makes sense to to take in the domains and break in, and, and break into subdomains. To, to to make this, the things more 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 easily to understand and to to develop to the de, um, to develop them. so the bounded context the context and the applicability of subdomains models and how it relates to other subdomains and models to see all that we're gonna need the context map which is a map of all the models by context Mapping of all mapping of all bounded contexts and the relationships between them to guarantee that everyone have no question about the models and the subdomains and the bounded contexts. Just take a look of the context map to to guarantee your your understanding about all the project and all the mod, the modeling of the software. Okay. Uh, um, Let's go clarify more of, of what I explained earlier with a visual example because there's a lot of uh, a lot of, of concepts and I don't judge if, 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 if it's hard to, to understand. So I'm bring here I'm gonna bring here a, a visual example. Okay, we have this domain a e-commerce domain. And easily to think in a few subdomains of e-commerce, like a, a subdomain of product catalog, with your, with 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 the bounded contents, with the product application. The next step we will be it will be modeling the the product catalog, but we can think in another subdomains in a e-commerce situation, like a subdomain of stock inventory, and a subdomain of sales. And here is another benefit in, uh, about using DDD is that in that image it makes more clear uh, the relationship between the, 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 the subdomains. Right here you can see that stock inventory has a relationship.
relationship with the product ca catalog, which has a relationship with sales, and vice versa. So here is another benefit uh, of, of DDD that visual part of DDD has to guarantee that everyone has fully understanding of the domains, the models, and the bounded context. And my Delphi example is, uh, is representing the model of the, the product catalog. So, if, so to make more simple, I'm, I'm just modeling the, the product catalog. But it, it, it goes the same if, if, if of the subdomain stock inventory or subdomain sales. Okay, now it's time to represent in the model. How we, with these five little guys here, these five layers here, the entity, the value objects, the repositories, the services, and the factory. The first one, the entity. The entity, it's not defined by their attributes. Have a unique identifier. The entity that's the, that's the entity in the project is unique. It's potentially mutable as long as we, we develop and, and modeling the software identity can be mutable. And we can have all the transi transitory history of the entity. And then there is the value objects, which is related to, 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 to entities. A value object is an, is an object that adds value to entities has no identity and is immutable. Immutable. Have the attributes of the entity. And it's defined by the value of attributes. We have the, the layer of repositories. The repositories have data, data layer access, persists entity data, and we have all the queries of, of the entity right here. I'm talking uh, just a comment here. I'm talk. I'm talking about uh, a, a specific repository of one entity. In my in my example, in the file is going to be is going to be of the on the prod on the products catalog. So if you have all uh, another subdomains, another another entities, there will be a specific repositories of that entity making the, the 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 data access only to that table that represents that that entity just to just to, to clarify that and we have here uh, the layer of services who is implement the business logic and works with several entities and performs persistence through repositories here you will find the methods that do the magic implement business logic so here you will find the procedures and functions calling the uh, the layer of rep repositories and and on and on. And we have the factory, which is responsible for properly constructing an object and, and an entity. Okay, time for Delphi. Let's go through to what our Delphi example. But first of all, I want to show you show you to you guys the the project structure using the main concepts so here i have a folder with the source the source code and i have a folder with the representing the the product the product catalog with the layers here entity forms repositories services and value objects and that's the first time i'm talking about forms you won't find forms a layer of forms in in the in a book of ddd because, because that is my solution to representing the visual part of my of my of my project. I create a, a layer about about forms. So what does that mean? If you won't find uh, this uh, this layer representing in the book, uh, what does that means is. DDD is not a cake recipe. It's going to be different from project to project. 
forms is my solution, but maybe another developer in another project in DDD is going to find another solution to represent the, the visual part of the, of, of the software. So just to clarify that, that it's going to be different from project to project that are using DDD. Okay, let's let's go to Delphi to see to see the Delphi example. So here is is my example. It's a very simple example. Here in here in the main form of the product, we have two edits here. One for the the code, the product code, and the description of my product. And we have the a button who has the function to, to load from my access database uh, a specific product. Before we 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 get we before we see the the code of the of the, the clip of the event the click event of the button let's let's go watch the the layers here. So the first layer is entity. You have a unit product here, and here is a very simple class here representing my entity product. And we have three fields: one is FID, F product code, and this, the, the F the description code. FID is an internal code only makes only for my database, and the the, the product code and the description code is is going to be on that form in the end so here you can see that it's not the, the types of this this fields is not integer or 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 a string is uh, a, a specific type and this is a specific type here is makes reference to the to the value objects remember the value objects contains the the value of the attribute of the of the entity the attributes of the entity so let's go watch um, the layer of value objects so here we have all the all the value of the type value of my attributes of the of the product entity so we have the the product code is the type of string the description code type string Product ID is TID, which is integer. And here is another is another benefit to use to to use. If you want to to, to later on alter some type here, you know where the code is here. It's on the value objects, and you only you only have to do is alter the the type ref, uh, who who is referred to referring to. To the attribute of the entity. So here is another another great benefit here. Okay. Let's go to the to the layer of the repositories. Here we have two units here. One is the connection DB and the other is the product repository. Connection DB is is the connection of, 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 of the database. Here, um, this unit here is on the repositories of the, of the product catalog, but if the project is, if this project here has more than one, on one domain and multiple domains, Probably this this unit here is gonna be another layer, um, 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 another layer. But it's a simple example, and I and I put in on that on that layer here, and it's it's a very simple simple unit uh, action here, and we have a constructor who initialize and create the connection the connection for of my dat database access for the whole project and when I start projects let's see right here 
after the application initialize here, I, I create the connection right here. Again, it, it's a, a very simple way just to, to show you the main concepts here, but you can use in another, in different ways as you want. Okay, let's go to the, um, to the product repository. And the product repository persists the, 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 the data of the, of, of the entity. Né? And we have uh, methods here, get, add, remove, date. The only that, that, I'm, that I'm using here is, is, the, met, is the method get. Um, the, he has a parameter here like the ID of the type product ID, which refers to my product value objects right here, you can see. And let's go back here. And it's a, it's a simple method here who, who, reads, who makes a, a select on, on, the pro, on the table products and using the parameter ID right here. And this method here returns a, a, a T product, a, a entity, a entity. So in the end here, the result is gonna be a fully loaded, uh, fully loaded entity with all of the attributes that comes from the fields of, of my table products here. Okay, the next step is is the services. Let's go, let's go to the services product service. The product services, as I told you before, con implements the business logic, contains the methods. Here, I create a class function. This, this, class, this, this class function here is going to load my, my product, so the parameter is the, the product ID. The type refers to the product value objects. And this function here creates creates a, an instance of repository and calls the the function of repository the function get using the using the the product id and the result and the result is is, is the same because the the class, this class function here is results also results a a, a t product a entity so one line we we resolve that okay now it's time to to go back to to the form here and and see the the code of of my button here first of all before we we see the the code of the code of of the events of the, of the button i create two functions here one it's get product form and who it's return a t product my entity and a procedure set product form has a parameter of t product here the the entity itself and i have a property here product prop of the type of t product read get product form and set product form here so the button here calls the procedure set, set product form and in, uh, in, in the parameter we are using the, prod, the product prop here. The next step, get product form, it calls the, it call the, the class method of, of, of the services, load product. Here I'm using the number two, fix it, but if you, if you want to to make an interaction with the with the user, you can pass the parameter here in an edit or, or whatever. Just 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 to show you here in this simple project, I I decide to use a, a number to fix it here. So the result of get product form is gonna be is gonna be the result of load pro product load product from the services and set product form. It's gonna it's gonna set the edits here with the with the value of, of here of my of my entity here. So 
so the order of that is going to be set product form calls load product and later on is going to be on the edit here the the entity load in the edits so let's go watch here I'm run, the, I run the, the project and I'm gonna click on load product and yes load the the, the product of code A002 and the description product test here very simple as you can see the the name of the of the entities is very clear as well so you know what's going on and when you later on you, you if you if you need to, to alter something it's very clear for all the project here okay let's go let's go back to today's slides okay now it's the time for the the final tips read books and content before venturing professionally and why is that uh, if you are working in an organization in a company and want to to apply in, in the projects of the company ddd okay but if you don't know what you're doing if you're not fully prepared of ddd it may cost some something to the to the company so you're gonna suggest to your boss and your boss is gonna is gonna be okay do it and suddenly the things are not going too well you you think you know it you think you know all about the D, but when you when you when you are working the things are a little bit different so make sure that you are fully prepared make make online courses read books and content before venture professionally to to know that you know everything about ddd about working with ddd it will be challenge i'm not gonna lie it, it it was challenge to do this research in ddd so working with ddd is is a quite a challenge try a lot and expect to make a lot of mistakes and this is go for the for the beginners for the seniors whatever uh, mistakes it, it's part mistakes is a part of, of our job and beginners and, and and seniors and experienced developers make make mistakes as well but don't be discouraged model modeling is a is a creative process and domain driven design is best suited to to implement only in projects of complex systems and it makes sense because we we want to make things simple we want to to take the complexity of things so so if you want to to use in a simple project that doesn't have much or any requirements of of business area does make sense to doesn't make sense to use ddd only in in bigger project with many many requirements of business area so ddd works fine in that and if you are ready the journey will be worth it in the end because there's a lot of a lot of benefits in in, in ddd and that's it guys uh, thanks for for having me here thanks for the opportunity to to talk to to you in delphi con 2023 here is my links to get in touch with me my my instagram for my instagram page for scolding my my email and my linkedin profile this this example here you can find on my on my link in in, in the bio of my my instagram so you, you will find on my github on, on there on my on the page of instagram it's very easy to find to find so now we're gonna we go on to the q a session live and thank you for having me here thanks okay sorry about the uh, video issues the streaming platform we're using is having some technical difficulties and i thought we'd worked around it but apparently we're still having some so we're gonna try something different next time around 
but I do have Gustavo on here for Q and A. So if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and put them in the question panel now. And hopefully, the um, the replay the replay will definitely have better video quality. Uh oh, we lost Gustavo. Are you there, Gustavo? It looks like we lost you. He was there literally just a second ago, and then boop, he is gone. Hmm. All right. Well, hopefully Gustavo was able to rejoin. Let's see here. There's a lot of good conversation going on here on, on the YouTube chat as well. So that's great to see. Thanks to Patrick and everyone else out there answering questions. Um, Lars, I've actually, that's something I've talked about before too, is having the compiler as a service, for example. Um, maybe a soon, I don't know. Something I'd like to see happen. It would be a serverless, right? So it would be, if we had the, we had the Delphi in the cloud session yesterday, talk about serverless, the idea of serverless is that it, the server's only running when you need it and then it goes away. Right, so you wouldn't have an ongoing compiler. You just the compiler would spin up as you needed it. Ah, it's like Gustavo's back. Hey, yeah. it's working. All right. Yes. So anyway, sorry about the video quality. I will have a um, the full quality available for the replay. That was a, an issue with the uh, stream platform right now, unfortunately. Yes, yes, for sure. But but uh, but I I think the the audio is good. It's, it's I think the guy. Yeah, the audio is good. Yeah. So if anybody has questions about uh, domain-driven design, what you heard, <laughs> go ahead and put them in there. Uh, Dion did say, great session. Um, I, the, yeah, there was a lot of good stuff in there, but I just couldn't see the screen for the most part. Let's see. Um, yeah, Roland said, thanks a lot as well. <laughs> okay, here's a comment here. Uh, very interesting. It sounds like an enormous work if the domain is very large. Is there a code generator to use someplace? I've got a lot. Uh, I've got a, a generator working in my own information modeling tool built in Delphi. No, in, in fact, there's 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 not a, a code generator. I, I do it b b with myself, but it's a, it's a good idea to do a, um, I don't know, make uh, or ORM like, like that. And, mm -hmm. uh, yes, and because yes, it's a, uh, uh, imagine if, if we are dealing with a very complex system, a, a huge system and a lot of entities, a lot of layers, so, a generator like that will be uh will, will be will be fantastic mm -hmm. but no there's uh, i don't know if if there if, if exists or in in the ofi i i can i can for sure that doesn't exist because it is 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 quite uh new in in the delphi community i've I've built code generators in the past for Delphi, not specifically to domain-driven de design, though. But there, you know, there it's should be possible. There's the uh, Delphi AST out there as well that is useful. Could be useful in that. I'm trying to think, that's a parser. 
Oh, I think we just lost Gustavo again. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um well at least my mine is working despite its uh poor, poor performance yesterday all right well sorry about that um there's a comment here samuel said i found it interesting you mentioned that there's a big difference between domain during design and mvc yes um Oh gosh, I'm not sure why. Gustavo said, I wonder if the issues Gustavo was having are related to the um, same issues we had with the video playback. Because we had issues with Ian's video earlier, but then I switched it to the local. Yeah. Gustavo's back again. That's him. I, I got internet, internet issues as well. Oh, everyone, okay. has, everyone has. Everyone has. But yeah, we 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 are we are talking about code generator. You see, you use gens, but not in DDD. Yeah, I I made a code generator long long ago for. Um, it was what what I had is a system where I had two databases that I was trying to move yeah. data between, and I had to customize it, and so it would generate some of the code that I could then customize uh, to to do the data the. the import export processes so it generate parts of it and then parts of it i was modify um I mean, so it's if you can write code you could generate code <laughs> you know it's yes a, yes yeah. yes uh, we, we want we want the we want the easy part yep there was a comment about the um i thought it was interesting that you pointed out the differences between mvc and domain driven design Yes, yes. Uh, there, if, if, if there's a several articles in other languages uh, talking about DDE and MVC, and the way that the who wrote the the article, you may think that it's the same thing, but it 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 it, it don't. Uh, you can use with 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 MVC, uh, uh, adding the layers of MVC as well, but. You 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 you're not. It's not a, a rule that you that you must must follow. Mm -hmm. uh, personally, myself, I with uh, with the DDD, I, I think the DDD works fine without MVC, but there's no problem at all. But there's a lot of misunderstanding in that part. The uh, the people 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 read all oh, layers in DDD. Oh, it's the same layers of MVC, and they are different. Yeah, you have. Uh... MVVM and MVC also are similar. It's one of those things that's like people have a certain way of doing things. And then when there's a new way, it's like, oh, well, that's different than what I'm doing. It must be the same as the other one's different than what I'm doing. But there is yes, yes. Uh, Patrick's right. asking, is a DDD like ORM or ORM like DDD? Are there, what are the, you mentioned ORM earlier, but are there similarities between ORM and DDD or are they different or are they complementary? Uh, good question. I never, I never thought in that way. Uh, I believe there are some similarities, but um, I'm not quite quite sure the the right answer for for that. But but it certainly has the similarities both. I don't I know if you if if you, if you think a, a different gens. I I'm not sure. I'm not, not sure honestly. I'd have to think about it and see. I find a lot of times with these new paradigms, like functional programming, for example, is at first I may be like, I actually, I, okay, I, I have the gray in my beard. I can say this. Uh, I remember back when object-oriented programming was new. <laughs> and I remember thinking, what do you need all those objects for? Pff, I don't need those. I can do it all with my uh, procedural programming. And it took a while. For me to wrap my head around it and then i was like oh okay object oriented program is pretty cool now that's predominantly what i do but i still sometimes do procedural programming mix it up mix it up there right same thing with functional programming right functional programming mm -hmm. is a new paradigm you might be like i don't need that functional programming i can do it just fine with my object oriented programming but what i found is that even if you don't wholesale adopt functional programming or ddd i think that learning about these new paradigms is useful in that sometimes it's like oh 
that's a that one piece of it right there could be really useful here and i could use that so uh yeah it's great even if you don't adopt it completely uh yes. there's definitely a lot to a benefit and learn from that and the guys is talking here about R RRM and it makes sense to you to use DDD. I, I never I, I, I could I could think in, into you in use DDD with RRM in the future. It mm -hmm. make my life much more easier. <laughs> There's a number of RRM frameworks out there for Delphi. Um, let's see, Roland says, uh, how would you solve the issue that the shared kernel shall only be modified if all consumers agree to such a change? I'm not sure if I really understand the the contest. Shared shared kernel shall only be modified at, if consumers yeah. agree to such a change. I'm not sure actually either, to be honest. Um, let's see here. What's the best pattern to tackle the issue of requirements different to what the shared kernel provides? An, another shared kernel. Uh -huh. Roland, if you have some more cl clarification, what shared kernel you mean by shared kernel? Uh, case talk says object relation mapping is not the same. They could align, but it's really not. ORM, in that sense, is an object to a database persistency approach, right? Yes, but so, I think, in, but I think in, in the in the layer of of DDD that works with the with with the with the database, you can. Uh oh, internet went out again. So um, Roland says ORM allows you to efficiently develop in DDD mode. I, I think that, yeah, there is, if I understand correctly, again, Gustavo is more of an expert on this, but that ORM is a, gives you that ability to have another layer below, like as, as Patrick said, that DDD is the higher abstraction layer. DDD is to ease OO programming using this business entities. The dilemma is that one need to really understand the domain first. For that information modeling is a requirement, yes. And that, that's a really big deal in, so I used to work at a company that did industrial engineering, like big power plants and uh, stuff like that. And we were building software for estimating those projects. and. As a, I came in as a developer, I knew how to develop software, but then I had to wrap my head around what the domain of uh, estimating software looked like. And that was, oh, wow, interesting stuff, really cool. Xdata, for example, allows you to create a repository without a load of hassle based on Aurelius. Big fan of Aurelius and Xdata, great tools. Um, Case talk says object relation mapping ORM is not the same as object role modeling, which is also ORM. We have too many acronyms. <laughs> um, shared kernel is a DDD concept. Yes, 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 yes. I, I remember. I did not mention this this concept because I have to. I I I have to choose. I have to choose what concept I I gonna bring in 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 the yeah. in the. Um, in the session or, or don't and some uh i i right now i, I can't remember uh, the right point of chair kernel because there's a lot of concepts and and that book that i mentioned earlier i i read al almost the 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 whole book but i may i i i this is my first research about about the I, I got i gotta to go really deep in in the other concepts but but yeah share the Share, share the kernel is a the, the concept that I choose not to 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 talk in the in the session because I really I really want to 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 make more much more simple to, for a full understanding of the first first uh, first uh, first meeting in in uh, first meet in DDD but I I, I need to to research more about shared kernel. Uh, in, in the in the beginning of my research, I I, I, I was reading a lot about all the concepts, but this concept it, it escapes me in that right now. I find, it, especially for technical books, I I rarely read them like cover to cover because I start reading them and then I'm like, oh, I want to try this, and then I go work on and, something and I never get back. To it. And the and the and the DDD book that I mentioned, it's not a technical book. There's no 
any language at all. It's only the concepts you can you can. So it's really it's really hard reading. So much concepts you you need to study that book a lot. But it's a Bible. It's it's definitely a, a Bible and a reference if you want to really go deeper. Okay, Jeff, I'll definitely check it out. Um, finding a good way to take the business domain knowledge for the challenging you are developing for into your code is about having good entity naming structure workflows, etc. Yes, yes. One one of one one of the benefits if you if you if you know how how are using DDD, it's it's that. That's simple names. Names there are you. You read. You know what 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 is about. So, and yes, and I and I and I read some when I when I when my when my when my having international uh, internet issues here. I I, I read a, a other comment that. Let me see if I can find here. I. I... So no pain no gain. Asked about uh, templates for VCL for. MVVM or MVC. Um, there are a few of them out there. The only one I could think of right now is Columbus Egg, but I don't think it's been updated in a while. Um, but there are others. Um, oh, gosh. I'm not remembering. There are some templates out there for for uh, MVVM, MVC for Delphi. Did you find the comment you're looking for? Uh, yes, yes, I found a uh, case talk. Uh, DDD is to it's it's too easy all, all programming using business entities the the dilemma mm -hmm. is is that one needs to really understand the domain first for that information modeling is a requirement yes if you don't know the 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 domain the the requirements business of the domain the the heart of the software don't start the nothing you really you because you you have the domain experts who, who which can be the client which can be uh, analysis of of, of requirements. Uh, someone who knows the business, and and are the we are developers. We don't know all all the all the terminologies <laughs> of the business. We know we know we know how to code, but so yeah. it's, it's very it's, it's very important uh, have someone who who really knows the the, the business and if, and it's be very supportive in the team. When when. Uh... I was working on that estimation software for the engineering company. We had this, these huge diagrams. They were literally like this big, just huge pieces of paper and just stacks and stacks of them. And there were times that we would implement things and then we'd send it off to the users. And they're like, what about this? And we're like, what do you mean? And it's like, oh, we have to add more. There wasn't in the specification. It's like, oh my goodness. It's just, it, <laughs> it, it is yeah. it, it, understanding that and getting it in there, capturing those requirements is such a big, big deal. Such a huge undertaking. Um, if we were to apply DDD in a simple project, what are the first classes or modules to develop? Well, I think you, you, you first of all, well, uh, ju just to clarify, you want, you want, uh, it's not necessary to use DDD if, if it's a simple project. I, I do not recommend because it's, it's more, it's, it complicates much that you don't need. So, but uh, answered your question, I think you, before that, you need to, to take the, 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 the principal, the the main domain of, of your so like a, a product catalog, for mm -hmm. example, you you gonna be a, a catalog which be with, with you you have a form and code of product this description. Start with that. Start with the very simple idea that 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 you that, that you want. Uh, so in the in in the classes that you that you must uh, start with the the entity I think the entity is the, the the first layer because you you it will you will be representing the 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 product itself in in that example so start with the entity so in in that order that I that, that I mentioned in the in the in the session entity value objects and uh, the next was service, uh, services and, and repro repo repositories, which he, which he communicates with the with the with database. So in that in the in that order that I that I show you in the in the session makes sense. I read an interesting book a while back, and I cannot remember what it was called, but it about um, 
iterative development and it talked about when you're building your minimum viable product, right? Yes. It's not, you don't just implement one feature, right? You have to think about what is the, you know, what are the, the few features? How do these few features that are implemented, you know, just bits of these features that make it, yes. make it into yes. something that works, right? And so you can't just say, I just want to do this completely and then I'll do this completely. Instead, you have to say, okay, I'm going to do the part of this and the part of this that need it in order for it to all work together and be something. And so that, yes. again, goes back to that idea of how do you have to really kind of wrap your brain around what the product project yes, is. Yes, and, and, and did you have the, the context map to, 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 so you can see. The... Uh, we lost Gustavo again. Ah. All right. Well, it's about time for the next session. Uh, I do want to, oops, click the wrong thing. I do want to just make a comment here. Uh, Case Talk was saying, uh, DD is great, but T data set is so much better to use in development environment. How to combine classes, uh, objects and classes to D T data set. So this is a really good question. Um, this is one of the things, uh, T data set is great for just that quick, rapid development process. But then when you want to take it and move it into a, um, uh, a more sustainable, easier to maintain, loosely coupled system. DDD DD is a great solution for that. Um, I'm trying to remember, I remember looking at this a while back, but you can have a T data set inside of your, um, right? So your domain driven design can be using a data set internally. Uh, that's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not understanding the question, but there are there are solutions for that. Let's see. Roland said, oh, let's see. Let's start with this one here. A realist intra entity model. Okay. And then I would create repositories of X data, which would shape the ISO domain layer. Yeah. So that's another great solution out there as well. Um, anyway, thank you, Gustavo. Sorry for your own internet issues. It's just the nature of it sometimes. Um, Shate, you're putting the session together though, and I will definitely be checking out that book that you recommended as well, and we'll get the replay up with better quality and, and such. Um, coming up next though, we have integrating your apps with Alexa devices with Kivian and I'm not, Imerium. I'm not very good at names. I mispronounced my own name. Uh, and uh, coming up next in three minutes. So we will see you all then. Kivian is our newest MVP from Brazil. I, when I was down in Brazil at the um, the big conference down there, I saw Kivian there giving her session. It looked really good. And uh, excited to see it in Portuguese now since, uh, or I'm sorry, see it in English now since my Portuguese. I, I'm doing Duolingo. I know just a little bit. Port Duolingo doesn't have a lot of technical terms in it yet, though.
Hi guys, this is Adelphicon 2023 where we can celebrate 28 years of Delphi and the old man, of course not. In Brazil, we say old pot makes good food. With this, a typical expression in mind, let's go. I am Kivian, I will speak about how to integrate your apps with Alexa devices? This talk was present at the Embarcadero Conference last year in São Paulo, Brazil, and I had an incredible success. Today, I have the opportunity to present this subject worldwide. I don't have my English fluently, but I felt it so much important to, to bring this subject to you myself. So I tried hard. It's a very sad. I had to read it at a certain times. Be patient, friends, please. Okay. Voice is the most natural form of human interaction. Through we can transmit and collect information in a very natural, easy and fast way. Because speech is a close link with your thoughts, and this makes it a very pleasant and pleasant to be able to speak and be understood and also be able to learn new things. In this presentation, we be able to realize that we can go far beyond screens, buttons, and grids, as we Delphi developers are used to. You will be able to bring a totally innovative experience to customers, greatly enriching the interaction of these users with their data. When I was a little girl, I was impressed with how fast technology advanced and with the perspective it gives of achieving the impossible. Today, as a developer, I feel very happy in per in to participate in this incredible moment that we are living. When technology is a reaching, surprising level of naturalness and excellent interaction with humans, and everything is a summary of a very important word, and that I will say here many times, and I want you keeping I, I want you to keep in mind that is called innovation. The goal is to talk about virtual assistants, at our Alexa skills, the way to learn about building Alexa skills, and the main point, how to, how to integrate in your application with Alexa devices. I created a response form where I could capture indirect responses from developers of any language. I want to discuss some interesting points from this research with you. This research was carried out with 100 Brazilian developers and uh, was shown at the Embarcadero Conference 2022. I read this research to reach developers from all over the planet, but unfortunately, I did get enough answers to share with you. Sad, I know. Uh, this for me consisted of three questions. Uh, are you a Dove developer? Do you know about Alexa devices? Do you have knowledge on how to build skills? I asked the fan if they were knowledgeable about Alexa devices, not to mention build the ten, and uh, the result was this. Ten had doubts, and uh, ninety said they knew it well. Well, I'm sure we we'll, we think that Brazilians don't know about the devices. Well, it's true, but. That also applies to developers from other countries as well, according to in this research that was done. But the most interesting point is that I asked them 
if they have knowledge about the building and like his skills and the numbers about developers of tech any technology were this seven said they have experience fifty one said they have no experience and uh thirty seven said they have no have knows uh, how to build this indirect thing because it means that those who have notions just like the opportunity or time to do something more complex. When I ask the Delphi the developers, I think we might be a little concerned that uh, 70% of them say they have no idea how to build Alexei's skills. 30% said they have some idea and uh, one said they know how to build. That is, we come to conclusion that Delphi developers are more afraid, perhaps, of starting or studying technology different from those they experience in their, in their day at work. Uh, but starting today, we are going to change that way of thinking and we will see here how to it it is possible not only to create skills but also to integrate them with your Delphi, Delphi applications. Before this lecture, it works something like this. Developers in general happy and content and feeling safe and exploring new worlds new lives, new, civiliza new civilizations, where, what about said, 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 <laughs> they'll find developers no longer. But let's talk a little about myself. I am Kiviana Cristal de Merim. My name is Abita Nujual. So we have this kiwi fruit in the corner of the slide. This fruit is a very common here in Brazil and as incredible as it may seem, it is a very similar to my name. After all, here in Brazil, we call it kiwi or kiwi, but whatever, right? I put it so you don't forget my name, okay? I am content creator on Instagram on the, the Kildel5 page where I talk about Embarcadero products, about events, interesting things for the developer community, and with a certain amount of good humor to work on the difficulties that we developers face on a daily basis. Follow me. I am MVP Embarcadero, the youngest, I believe. I be being your working with Delphi for over 12 years. I started with Delphi 5 and had the opportunity to work with all versions that came after and, and after and, and beyond. I am studying systems analysis and development here in Brazil. I have worked with several databases like Firebird, Oracle, SCAD Server and everything else. I am a senior developer at Equisoft and I've been working at this company for over three years. I have infinite love for technology and innovation. Go talk about virtual assistants. One important point, important point is that I know that in English we refer to things like it. But you will see me referring to virtual assistants as she or he, so d don't be mad at me, but I just like to treat them like my friends. This little guy here was the e IBM shoebox. He got that name because he as was as small as a shoebox. There are words our no shows inside okay whatever it was able to perform math functions and speech speech recognition it i was uh, he was built in 1961 and had the uncanny ability 
at the time he recognized 16 spoken words, including digits, digits, digits from 0 to 9. Apple Siri was built in Objective C in 2011. It is a unique Apple product and it uses fascinating natural language processing to answer, to answer questions, make recommendations and perform reactions with a certain amount of complexity. She is essential. Her answers and the way she speaks adapts to the user best on her searches and preferences. This guy is okay, Google. I don't know about you, but you, I have had this guy but, but into conversations with my friends, but that's okay. Interestingly, it does not lose our features when I you run out of internet and is designed for you to little things like turning of the flashlight, opening the music, among others. About Cortana, since it did not go as well as we happened. Today, Amazon has an excellent variety of devices that work with Alexa, like the Echo Dot, Echo Studio, various size buds, Echo Auto, and uh, you talk about the built-in leader. And um, we have the Astro, which was announced last year on the Amazon event. This guy walks around the, your house, has faction, fa facial recognition, expression of emotions like happiness, sadness, anxiety, you can ask him to take something so to someone since he has a back compartment. And uh, yes, we can integrate him with Delphi applications. We also have Alexa built into smart TVs, smart watches, headphones, and smartphones just to be downloading the Alexa app on those devices. Okay. Well, just like we have apps on a smartphone, a certain purpose. Alexa also needs apps or radar skills. Just like we need an app to listen to music on our smartphone, we also need a skill to listen to music on Alexa. Or do order food or do shopping at your favorite supermarket and more. Basically, skills are like apps that make voice communication experience with Alexa more practical in your daily lives. That's great, Kevin, but I hope you can, how can I be useful and venture in the world of Alexa skills? Okay, well, you must create as an Amazon developer developer account, okay? Secondly, to learn and un understand how skills creation works, you should take a simple course made by Amazon Khaled Cake Time. Amazon has been making intense efforts to get documents and developer support materials translated into multi-language. Uh, and uh, I could not help but mention this course at Embarcadero Conference in Brazil as it has a no available in Portuguese. Portuguese. But anyway, I invite you to browse the Alexa documents as there are very rich in simple and very didactic information on, on how to start in creating skills. This course is a very interesting because we cover it from the beginning as a hello world, though a little more complex and like though more complex like things, like collection of Corvette, Corvette 
slots by automa automatic delegation, adding memory to your skills, using Alexa settings a API, skills tests, skills tests, availability, availability certification, and skills skills re re releases. Okay. <laughs> About the two tools that we can use to create the code in the backend, we have two options in Node.js uh, and in Python. Lately, a plugin for VS Code has been made available to help with skills development. But when I say this to help developers, they are like, sad and, and lonely but developers of the of other languages feel happy and secure but after reading the comment the documents but available by amazon you will see that it's a very very well explained and having someone who is the new to programming can learn it easily Correct. How does uh, Alexa skills work? Well, this is a Chloe. She eats as home and wants to turn it on the lights. Then she says, Alexa, turn on the light. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My Alexa say hello sorry and uh, then the amazon code appears just kidding <laughs> that when it all happens the amazon voice service turns audio into, into text basically a string turn turn on on the light at mo at that moment an installed skill will be searched that activates an intent in the back end with the, the phrase uh, turn on the light you will see later in the in the video that that intent you would be like functions or procedures that are activated through a specific voice command that we are going to assign it to them so whenever I say turn on the light, a block of code developed by us will, hap will happen. In the most cases, there is communication with the manufacturer's IPA, API that connects your smart lamp via Wi-Fi. But we got to the main point of the lecture how to integrate your applications with Alexa skills? Oh, so excited. We have Ronaldo here. He is at, at his company where he is excellent developer who saw this lecture and the build and, and integrating skills with Delphi. He wants uh, to know how much the company provides this month in, in an easy, quick, and intu intuitive way, so he asks, Alexa, send me this month's profile report. As I explained in the previous example, the Alexa voice service transforms the voice into text as a string, as you know, you know it and uh, communicates with your skills where it has an intent that I imagine has a name, profit relatory, uh, whatever, uh, that will call on I API, but it's not just any API. Pay close attention, uh, we have a service. It will fight on a horse listening to open port on Windows. Sample? Well, 
do you know the horse framework? It is a really very inter interesting thing. Uh, because we can create servers in a very easy and fast way. I will uh, take a little more about him later, but he is a very uh, characterized by this horse in, th in this picture. Uh, listening for a open port in Windows. It uh, could be open port on some other platform, okay? But the intention is to make it clear how this API communication with the Alexa server works. Through this service, we can include a unity or consume procedure of your application and uh, do something you want, like uh, registering a customer, customer, requesting the price of a product or whatever your gravity sense. Let's see my video now that we'll take a little more about the project created. Hello, I'm going to show you my, how my Pronto Marcadinho project turned out, which in Portuguese means read market. I have a group of projects with the server on Horsey and uh, my Delphi application. My server listens on port 9000, which has multiple endpoints. The part of a location a client, location a professional, making appointment, looking for available appointments, which is a query like a, a report. I use the procedures that are be, being used in application because I made very interesting the, uh, use of code. I made some changes like this procedure that I created a very similar to another one that is used in the application. Uh, I show you my project in the file Windows application, where there is a registration of uh, professionals and uh, clients in agenda and appointment scheduling. I go start in horsey. This is a scheduling screen where you can see that uh, it's free, so so let's schedule it this time through Alexa at 3 p.m. This is a Alexa console developer. There is the vocation name where this is the part that we configure as we call your uh, skills. Let's take a look at our intents. We have the scheduled times intent. When we say to Alexa, uh, Dr. Anna, tomorrow on the afternoon shift, she will fill these slots that are like variables, nothing you don't already know. When we say this sentence, uh, we it will activate your code in Node.js, it will load times, it will fill the variables that we uh, talk about, it will call the endpoint on the server, receive the response and handle it. Every time I say something, it will activate that block of code and return to us. Let's go to text section, session, and uh, let's talk to Alexa and see how to make this appointment available. I am going to write here in our invocation name, Pronto Marcadinho. Uh, I say open Pronto Marcadinho. She welcomes me and uh, says that we are going to play and uh, make an appointment and uh, then we will be able to see in the, uh, your application and uh, asks my name and going to pretend that, that I am going to arrange of a doctor for my husband and uh, say my name is Rafael. She asks uh, me which professional's name then the shift I want. I tell her I want to make an appointment with Dr. Uh, Dr. Anna. Uh, she, she says that 
that on that day at uh, this at uh, these times i say i want 3 pm e and uh, she uh, going to application delphi let's go the eat as really market at 50 pm uh, at 3 pm you can go to github to see the code and uh, i hope uh, like it okay talking again about my project it is composed of three, of three layers uh, your application uh, in the file a server in horse listening to open a port in windows and uh, an alexa skill we also have plan B, which are made up of the, the Amazon storage service component that has the ability to upload these files to Amazon S3, uh, where Alexa has, has access, but unfortunately, unfortunately I have not, uh, have not uh, had the opportunity to test this option yet. If you do, send me an email telling me how the experience was, please. Okay. Um, okay, Alexa, send me Kivianzinhas. <laughs> send me a little Kivian useful links. Uh, we have the cake time link from Amazon. The link to the uh, the link to Adventure of, on the Horse. Uh, my GitHub with the example shown in the video. Please uh, feel free uh, to contact me. My, my spoken English is not fluent, but I manage well in writing. And uh, thanks means thank, thank you. Uh, I hope you like it. And uh, let's go to the questions. I but I intend to return here at Delf Delficon next year uh, with my English a little better. <laughs> they cover me. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, go to questions. All right, great, fantastic. Thank you, Kivian. And we can bring you on here, answer some questions. A lot of great comments here that your English is fantastic. Hello, it's good to see you. <laughs> Hello, Jim. Hello. Hi, it's a pleasure uh, um, uh, for me to uh, talk to you again. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> and Gustavo, you're back as well. Yes, with no now it's it's not my session and I don't have any any, any problem <laughs> with, with, with the internet. That's the way it goes, right? Uh, Gustavo, uh, help me uh, translate for for us uh, because my English yes. is I uh, I learn and uh, Gustavo mm -hmm. is is better. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. It's, it's too nice with my English. <laughs> um, apparently, you pronounce Delphi correctly, so um... it's Delphi or Delphi. I never know. <laughs> Uh, I don't think anybody knows. <laughs> but both, both are good. The, because um, I, I saw I saw Ian talk Delphi and I saw you Delphi. Which, well, um, both are used interchangeably. It depends on who's talking, and I'll use both. I I vary sometimes too. So there's a comment here. Um, Marco said, I'm curious about this presentation since I've done some Alexa skill building myself for a presentation here in Italy. Um, and then he uh, shared an example that a uh, developer is using Alexa plus Delphi to call the next patient in a medical lab. So he didn't have to wash his hands when he interacted with the uh, computer. So if you have that, that's a really good use case is anytime you're going to have a situation where your hands are you don't have contamination, you know, maybe you're cooking or working in medical or whatever, where you interacting with something would be a, an issue. Yes, uh, I talked uh, with Marco um, uh, in, in last year. Uh, 
uh, when I built in the project uh, Pronto Marcadinho, mm -hmm. uh, I I think uh, about the big project about Alexa and uh, Delphi, and uh, uh, he helped me uh, uh, for ideas uh, about uh, build about con construction about build uh, this project, and um, I I. I can. <laughs> yeah, uh, I love. There was a few comments here about you mentioned that you switched your Alexa to English to, for learning English, and someone else was saying that his was in Norwegian, but he didn't know how it was going to respond. It was it would go either way. Uh, okay. And then uh, Patrick said that as long as Alexa understands stand your English, then that's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> I changed my Alexa for talking uh, with me English. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, she helped me. Uh, ah, uh, I talk in my my uh, presentation. Uh, I say uh, he or she for uh, virtual assistants uh, because uh, uh, with my friends. And uh, <laughs> I know in English uh, say it for thanks, thanks. Mm. Um, but uh, the, um, no said with me, okay? <laughs> All right. Let's see. Someone is working with pizzas with with in the last comment. Yeah. Build a yeah. Pizzas. I think that um, recipes like cooking would be a good one. I think there probably are skills for that already. That's one of the things I think really the, the, the skill to the, the, uh, the secret for an Alexa skill is that you're not writing an Alexa skill just to write a skill, but you have to have some sort of problem that you need to solve, right? And then you make the Alexa skill to solve that problem. And so if, Yes. You know, you might not have a use case or scenario that you need it, but when you do need it, then it's a great, a great solution to go with. So, uh, Sergio said it's Delphi in ancient Greek, and that's usually usually it's, in the it's US. A shame it's, we don't know. It's a shame we don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, usually, if it's from Europe, people from Europe will say Delphi, and people from the U.S. will say Delphi. Usually, but ah, uh, uh. okay. Will your code of your project be shared, or do you have a GitHub link? Yes, um, uh, I get it's on the link. On, it's on the link of the on the presentation, Kevin. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and, and uh, also, uh, Kivian has a, a a page on Instagram who has the link on 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 bio. That there's a link on GitHub as well, right, Kivian? Yes. Mm -hmm. Follow me uh, on Instagram and um, Kidelfi. Uh, in in bio on Instagram, uh, I I have links. Uh, about uh, my GitHub and uh, other projects in in future. Uh, okay. Patrick has uh, has posted the link here on the comments. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Thanks. And I've been following you on Instagram, and you are probably one of the most prolific Instagram people I know. <laughs> you post a lot, and it's very entertaining Delphi content. So. Thank you. <laughs> so David's asking, how much JavaScript skill? Do you need to know JavaScript in order to write an Alexa skill, or can you do it without JavaScript? Good question. Um, so you choice in the Python or uh, uh, JavaScript, OK? And uh, uh, Help me, Gustavo. Uh, you like it in the Python or JavaScript? Both, both, uh, both work, work, works as well. It's no different at all. Just 
just just the language. Okay. And um, uh, work a little uh, from JavaScript, but I I station uh, uh, is very very easy for uh, uh, about JavaScript or, or Python is is very easy. I recommend. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think so we Patrick we points out create. that if you use on, Python, on, for, Python for Delphi, you could do uh, Alexa and UI on devices. Interesting. Yep. Oh, I I think about this on on this build in in this project. But I I don't uh, try um, use the uh, Python for for the file, and uh, if you uh, build a project uh, in Python for the file, send me an email. I <laughs> I uh, I like to see this project. Yeah, that would be very cool. Maybe Patrick will do that. He's pretty prolific. Gets a lot of stuff. Does a lot of stuff. Not that I need to give him anything more to do. Um, are there any other examples you're aware of use cases people have used uh, Alexa skills, custom Alexa skills for? I don't understand. The, there's another example, Skivian, uh, about other developers using using Alexa skills with, with, with Delphi? Uh, not yet, uh, but I... I know uh, other developers in Brazil uh, bef uh, before uh, Embarcadero Conference at uh, 2022. Uh, uh, we build, uh, I, I think I built our project and uh, I'm waiting. Uh, <laughs> I, I think, waiting I think we even, we even started, start this. I, maybe next year we have much more applications with, with, with Alexa because, uh, frankly, uh, uh, I before the this presentation of of Kivian, I never I never think uh, in Delphi and Alexa. I thought your when you opened up talking about the uh, how natural it is to talk to for some use cases to use voice to interface with things, um, and I think that's really true. Is that there there are certain use cases when voice makes a lot of sense. Right. Now, other use cases, yeah. it doesn't. And so finding that right use case. And I would suggest if you're, you know, if you saw the session, you're like, oh, I'd love to do this. Go look at the Alexa skills that are already out there and available and see what people are doing. And then that maybe might give you some ideas about what you can do with it and, you know, help help get your creativity going. Yes. Did you have a specific use case you wanted to do this for, or did you just excited about the technology and wanted to learn about it? Um, sorry. Was was there a reason you wanted to build this, or was it just exciting? Did you have a use case for it? Why Why did you want to 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 research uh, to, to to do a research about Delphi and Alexa? Why no. do you choose? <laughs> why Why do you choose? Do you choose uh, make a session about Alexa and Delphi? Ah, uh, um, because I I um, why I construct I build uh, this project in Alexa, Gustavo? No, uh, porque tu porque tu escolheu fazer a fazer a apresentação? Por que tu escolheu Alexa e Delphi? Que te motivou? Okay, okay. Um, I I love uh, technology and uh, innovation, and um, I I uh, I going in uh, I, I started in the shopping, and uh, I I I see you always uh, you, you always think that that it, there's a possibility with Alexa here. Uh, 
in the, in the, in the, <laughs> exactly. in the exactly. supermarket, in, in, a, in, a, in a store, in a yeah. mall, something like yeah. that. Uh, uh, technology is a, um, a, a fast and a grow, it's growing growth. so fast. It's growing so fast. <laughs> yes. The technology. Mm -hmm. it, yes, and um, I I see uh, cases in my life in uh, my 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 day uh, is a, a very inter interesting uh, use of voice for uh, for many things. And um, I I feel I feel happy uh, and see projects in Delphi uh, uh, using in Alexa Alexa skills. E I I think. Certo. Uh, oh. Quer experimentar galinha com <laughs> Alexa. <laughs> Alexa. Alexa. <laughs> Alexa. <laughs> so that's the uh, and, uh, next question here. Uh, and, does okay. Alexa sometimes start when you didn't mean for it to? <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah. But but please do, do not create a, a, a Skynet. We don't want that. <laughs> we don't want Skynet controlling our lives. <laughs> yeah. Patrick suggested that he doesn't imagine himself talking to computers except for insulting them. <laughs> but this has inspired him to give us some ideas. Mm. So this is a good comment here that said Alexa can send the commands to your, your server, your Delphi server, which has access to everything Delphi application does. So really that's what you're doing is you're sending the commands from Alexa to your server to do things. Yep. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, you think uh, uh, you call uh, whatever and the classes and the uh, procedures and functions, whatever uh, you have in your application uh, is 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 amazing. <laughs> you call uh, and uh, you receive in in this voice uh, from Alexa. So in the future, I'm gonna say Alexa. Make my project. Give me the code. Yep. Alexa, destroy chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Alexa, write a program in Delphi to do yes, yes. da 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 da. And tell it to compile and it runs and yep, there we go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much. I appreciate um you putting this together and happy to have you as part of the MVP family. Um, and Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. Thanks. Thanks, Embarcadero. And yeah. um, uh, uh, follow me in, on Instagram, please. And um, uh, I I write in English, okay? Uh, my, my talk is so... <laughs> and um, uh, okay, uh, send what me a mail. Too. What is your Instagram? Actually, I have it right here. I'll put it in the chat so that we have it. Um, here it is. Key Delphi. Oh, Kai Delphi. Oh, Key Delphi. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, you are. You oh, are. Uh, I love. I love following you on Instagram because every day something new and exciting with Delphi that you're doing, and it's just it's. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Jean. Yeah. Oh, apparently, um, let's see. Sergio says that you're really the Bally Madison from the Goodwood franchise undercover. That must see how you get so much done. <laughs> <laughs> and here's your Instagram for everybody. All right. Fantastic. Thank you so Thanks. much. And um, we'll see you around. Okay. okay. All right. Bye. All right, we have our last session for the day coming up next, QR code case study, Gate Systems Arab Diploma. Um, let me get the video queued up for that so we can get going. So we'll have that going here in just a moment. I will put on uh, Code Monkey for a minute while I get the rest of this going here.
just loved how readable the object Pascal programming language is. I decided it would be cool to make a program where the code was the codified lyrics to a song, and then the output was the actual lyrics to the song. So much like Walt Disney created Fantasia based on classical music, I've created a special musical number based on the music of Jonathan Colton. Code monkey, get up, get coffee. Code monkey, go to job. Code monkey, have boring meeting with boring manager Rob. Rob say, Code monkey, very diligent, but his output stinks. His code not functional or elegant. What do Code Monkey think? Code Monkey think maybe manager wanna write login page himself. Code Monkey not say it out loud. Code Monkey not crazy, just proud. Code Monkey likes Fritos. Code Monkey likes to have a Mountain Dew. Code Monkey very simple man with big warm fuzzy secret heart. Code Monkey like you. Code monkey like you Code monkey hang around at front desk Till your sweater look nice Code monkey offer buy you soda Bring you cup, bring you ice You say no thank you for the soda Cause soda make you fat Anyway you busy with the telephone No time for chat Could Monkey have long walk back to cubicle? He sit down, pretend to work. Could Monkey not thinking so straight? Could Monkey not feeling so free? Could Monkey like Fritos? Could Monkey like Tab and Mountain Dew? Could Monkey very simple man? Big, warm, fuzzy, secret heart. Could Monkey like you? Monkey thinks someday he have everything, even pretty girl like you. Code monkey just waiting for now. Code monkey says someday, somehow. Code monkey like Fritos. Code monkey like Tab and Mountain Dew. Code monkey very simple man. Big warm fuzzy secret heart. Code monkey like you. Code monkey like you. Code monkey, get up, get coffee. This is Code actual monkey, object pass Cal code and was recorded in real time. Code you can compile it with Delphi or App Method and run it on Windows, OS X, Android, and iOS. The output is the original lyrics to the song. The code will actually work as a console application as well, and so in theory could work on other platforms like Linux, etc. Uh, just in order to make it shared code, I made it a GUI application. I hope you've enjoyed this special musical number, and my thanks to Jonathan Colton for making and sharing this great song. You can download all my source code for this song on my website at delphi.org slash codemonkey. From there, you'll find links to download Jonathan Colton's song as well. All time has a huge impact on developer productivity. I made this project here with Delphi, a million lines of object Pascal code in one project and we're gonna see how fast it compiles. So a million lines would be 18,000 pages of printed text, which would be 14 copies of War and Peace. When it comes to code, everything you see here above that line is less than a million lines of code. So to launch the space shuttle, 400,000 lines of code. 
Now the code you see here, these projects are multiple millions of lines of code. So Windows 3.1 was about two and a half million lines of code. And of course with time, software complexity, projects get bigger, larger, more lines of code. So we here see five, five million lines of code, 10 million lines of code, 25 million lines of code, 50 million lines of code, 100 million lines of code. And then each of those little squares there is a two billion lines of code. And I don't know how much total that is for Google. A lot of code for Google. Compiling is part of the programming culture. I mean, this is the number one legitimate excuse for slacking off as a software developer is we're waiting for our code to compile. But it slows down our productivity because we're always waiting for our code to compile. A few things we can do as Delphi developers to improve our compile time is take advantage of library packages. Similarly, uh, pre-compiled units. So if we do a compile, it only compiles the units that have changed since the last compile. You can also divide LARB project into multiple smaller packages. And then again, you're taking advantage of the pre-compiled package nature. Then there's a number of other compiler options you can use as far as inlining, uh, runtime packages, etc. Now, Berlin also took a huge step forward in fixing a number of compiler speed up issues and it made compiling code much faster. So let's take a look at compiling a million lines of code in 10.1 Berlin. Go here, project options. I have optimization turned off. We're doing a full debug build here. And I will point out that I am doing runtime packages, which speeds up the linking process, but the compiling process is the same. So let's go ahead. We're gonna start with a clean. And I have a timer here that's going to time how long the process takes. And I've put a button right here for the build. And so the build started. And there we go. One million lines of code compiled in five seconds. And it's actually faster if I'm not video recording it because I'm running it inside a virtual machine and with the video recording, it gets down to about three seconds.
so this next video here, the a, a QR code codes taste study, it's uh, this is Ziad's not available for Q and A, but it is split into two parts. So there's going to be a short gap here. We're going to play the first part and then the second part. So uh, apologies for that, but that's what's going on there. It's not crashed. We're just have to change. Remember back in the day when they had records that had to flip over <laughs> or laser discs? I don't know if you remember laser disc players. You put the laser disc in, you have to flip it over halfway through the movie. Anyway, we'll go ahead and get started. Hello and welcome, Delphi Akon 2023, celebrating 28 years of Delphi. Today I will show you how to create QR code and, uh, for, and management for a student diploma, okay, like the school, education, okay, how to create and uh, this QR code, how to create QR code and inside QR code many information or a few information for student the gate system Arab diploma like this interface simply and easy and officiality okay create office schedule and uh, and student registration and so on record result for student and table of teacher okay this is for uh, why 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 academic Arab diploma choice Delphi language development because it's flexibility and reliable and easy and coding for Pascal it's coding for Pascal it's uh, it's modern and uh, and uh, explain for any development for programs the same uh, the same coding okay this is interface for for Arab language term academy uh, for Arab Africa for uh, the for uh, development why Delphi is programming and why and which you found the possibility of successful okay Okay, uh, file new VCL. Okay, uh, then edit and edit to uh, some information for this student. Create QR code inside this all information. Okay. Reduce for time and official of output software and application for any user. User interface simple. Okay. Now we change the caption of any label here. The first caption label to uh, number of student. And the last table caption. Type of diploma. Okay. Select all this. 
edit or check set and then button and then the la uh, choice com another the component image and for the style or uh, or designer for interface maybe uh, image collection and virtual list okay first you add okay and add for this is the demo icons select all this image okay apply okay and then select you For images and then index Maybe student you can choose any icons for uh, for any uh, images for you uh, just index or image index choice maybe uh, edit and then save close Then db db grid and if the demo if the memo uh, new still number auto oh so sorry did it here new st number for student or st in o just in o auto and then new st name string And then new type of the loma string. Okay. Then uh, insert you data source search you We use bind, binding VCL. You do so. uh, 
you see name edit 2 and type of diploma edit 3 okay here I've been all and saved and here edit from the caption save and then from the caption cancel and the last caption close okay Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. Okay. Sorry for activations because I want to add graphic field. J. Okay. And then open when you on show on show if the Nemo dot open. We want to add add you for the student. We use this uh, the first test, okay, and then combine that, and then you same add. For student, for student, what you want to QR code data source, yes, and then combine with the project. Okay, this here, this is library for uh, ZXING. Okay, we use here on key. Okay, I think that was it. Um, let me uh, look in the chat here and see if there's any comments. Um,
All right, I think that's it. Um, we will have, um, I'll put the link up here for, oh, let me share my screen and show the schedule for tomorrow. Real quick, we had one change for tomorrow. Um, So we do have, oops, ignore that little thing there. Trying to fix something. I'll just do it like this. All right. So there is a change for tomorrow. Um, I guess it's this way, if this is right. Anyway, the we have a new session added at 3 p.m. Central Standard Time, fair critical section. And my session, the... Um, my session for the uh, recognition and closing session will be at 4 p.m. So we start at 9 a.m. with using NTFY to send and receive push notifications with Samuel Rosa de Oliveira. So we'll see you all tomorrow for the last session of DelphiCon. Thanks for uh, joining and thanks for being part of this. This We've, uh, It's always a lot of fun to see all the comments and questions and conversations going on. So we'll see you all tomorrow. Take care.